Temple of the Winds by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 350. Kaylin had told him that in her life there had never been a wizard with enough power to pass these shields. Wizards had tried but failed. The wizards living and working in the keep as Kaylin was growing up simply didn't have the magic required to enter this part of it. Zed was the first wizard. No one had been in the first wizard's enclave since before Kaylin and Richard were born, when Zed had left the Midlands. Kaylin had said that these shields exerted more magic as you got closer, that they made your hair stand on end and made it difficult to breathe. She had also said that if a person didn't have enough magic of their own, just getting too close to the shields could be deadly. Richard didn't discount in the slightest what she had said, but he had need to go in there. Kaylin had also said that to enter required placing your hand on the cold metal plate beside the door, something no wizard she knew had ever been able to do. Richard had encountered shields like this one at the Palace of the Prophet, ones passed by touching a metal plate, but as far as he knew, none of those were potentially deadly. He had been able to pass those shields, and he had been able to pass others in the keep that required magic only he possessed, so he reasoned that he might be able to pass this one. He needed to get in there. Berdine rubbed her arms, distressed by the tingle of the magic. Are you sure you aren't tired? You rode all that way. It wasn't that hard a ride, Richard said. I'm not tired. He was too worried to rest. He had thought Kaylin would be back by now. He had been sure he would find her back home when he returned from Mount Kymromos. She should have been back by now. But she wasn't. He would wait only until morning. I still don't think we should be doing this, Berdine muttered. How is your foot? I don't think you should be on it. Richard finally looked down at her. He was pressed up against his left side. Raina was pressed to his right. Each held her aegeal in her fist. My foot is just fine, thank you. He shifted his body to force them away a bit to give himself breathing room. I only need one of you. No loss of face if you wish to remain here. Raina can go if you don't want to. Berdeen scowled up at him. I didn't say I wasn't going. I said you shouldn't be doing it. I have to. It wasn't anywhere else. It has to be here. I was told that important things, things not meant to be seen by just anyone, were kept in the first wizard's enclave. Berdeen rolled her shoulders, easing the tension in her muscles. If you insist on going, then I'm going too. I'll not let you walk in there without me. Raina, he asked. I don't need both of you. Do you want to wait here? Raina gave him a dark, moored Sith glare in answer. All right, then. Now listen to me. I know that the shields here are dangerous, but that's all I know about them. They may not be like the others I've taken you through. I have to touch that metal plate down there on the wall. I want you two to wait here while I go see if I have the proper magic to open the door. If it opens, then you both can come the rest of the way. This isn't a trick, is it? Raina asked. You tricked us one other time to keep us out, to keep us from going where there was danger. Mord Sith are not afraid of danger. The wind lifted his gold cloak. No, Raina, it's not a trick. This is important, but I don't want either of you risking your lives needlessly. If I can open the door, then I promise to take you both with me. Satisfied? Both women nodded. Richard gave them each an appreciative squeeze on the shoulder. He absently adjusted the metal bands on his wrists as he gazed at the towering bastion waiting at the end of the rampart. A cold wind buffeted him as he started across. He could feel the pressure of the shield, like the weight of water when you swam toward the bottom of a pond. The fine hairs at the back of his neck stiffened as he progressed. The pressure made it difficult but not impossible to draw a breath, as Kalen had said she had experienced. Six immense columns of variegated red stone stood to each side of the gold-clad door, holding up a protruding entablature of dark stone. The architrave was decorated with brass plaques. As Richard approached it, he recognized some of their symbols as the same ones on his wristbands, belt, and boot pin. The frieze held round metal discs with other of the more circular symbols. The more linear of symbols he wore were also carved into the stone of the cornice. Seeing the symbols he recognized reassured him, even though he didn't know their meaning. He wore these things by obligation, duty, and right. He was born to them, that much he knew. Why, he didn't know. Even if he wished, it could be otherwise. It wasn't. He was a war wizard. 
Distracted by the uncomfortable pressure and tingling of the shields, he reached the door almost before he realized it. The door was at least twelve feet tall and a good four feet wide, gold-clad and embellished in the same symbolic motifs. Embossed in the center was the more prominent of the symbols he wore, two rough triangles with a sinuous double line running around and through them. Richard rested his left hand on the hilt of his sword as he fingered the symbol with his other hand, tracing its oval, undulating outer margin. With the act of touching it, tracing it, following its pattern, he understood. The spirits who had used the sword of truth before him passed their knowledge on to him as he used the sword, but they didn't always convey that knowledge in words. In the heat of combat, there wasn't always time. Sometimes it came to him in images, symbols, these symbols. This one on the door, like the ones on his wristbands, was a kind of dance used for fighting when outnumbered. It conveyed a sense of the movements of the dance, movements without form, the dance with death. It made sense. He wore the outfit of a war wizard. Richard had learned from Colo's journal that in Colo's time, the first wizard, named Baracus, had also been a war wizard, as was Richard. These symbols had meaning to a war wizard. Much as a tailor painted shears on his window, or a tavern sign had a mug on it, or a blacksmith nailed up horseshoes, or a weapons maker displayed knives, these symbols were signs of his craft, bringing death. Richard realized that his fear had vanished. He stood in the wizard's keep, which had always before set his nerves on edge and worse, stood now before the most restricted and protected place in the keep, yet he felt calm. He touched a starburst symbol on the door. This symbol was an admonition. Keep your vision all-inclusive, never allowing it to lock on any one thing. That was the meaning of the starburst symbol. Look everywhere at once. See nothing to the exclusion of all else. Don't allow the enemy to direct your vision or you will see what he wishes you to see. He will then come at you as you become bewildered looking for his attack and you will lose. Instead, your vision must open to all there is, never settling, even when cutting. Know your enemy's moves by instinct, not by waiting to see them. To dance with death meant to know the enemy's sword and its speed without waiting to see it. Dancing with death meant being one with the enemy without looking fixedly so that you could kill him. Dancing with death meant being committed to killing, committed with your heart and soul. Dancing with death meant that you were the incarnation of death come to reap the living. Berdine's voice drifted across the rampart. Lord Rall? Richard looked over his shoulder. What? What's wrong? Berdine shifted her weight to her other foot. Well, are you all right? You've been standing there for a long time, staring at the door. Are you all right? Richard wiped a hand across his face. Yes, I'm fine. I was just... just looking at the things written on the door, that's all. He turned and, without thinking, slapped his hand to the cold metal plate in the polished gray granite wall. Kalin had told him it was said that to touch that metal plate was like touching the cold, dead heart of the keeper himself. The metal plate warmed. The gold door silently swung inward. Dim light came from beyond. Richard took a careful step into the doorway. Like a wick on a lamp being slowly turned up, the dim light coming from inside brightened. He took another step and the light brightened more. He scanned the inside as he motioned the two waiting moored Sith forward. Whatever magic prevented people from approaching apparently was now withdrawn. Berdine and Raina walked to him without any difficulty. That wasn't so bad, Raina said. I didn't feel anything. So far, so good, Richard said. Inside, there were glass spheres about a hand width in diameter set atop green marble pedestals against the wall to his left and right. Richard had seen glass spheres similar to these before down in the lower reaches of the keep. Like those, these too provided light. The inside of the first wizard's enclave was an immense cavern of ornate stonework. Four columns of polished black marble at least ten feet in diameter formed a square that supported arches just beyond the outer edges of a central dome dotted by a high ring of windows. Between each pair of columns, a wing ran off from the vast central chamber. He noticed that much of the stonework repeated the palm leaf pattern that adorned the gold capitals atop the black marble column. The polish of the marble was so high that it reflected images like glass. 
finely worked wrought iron sconces decorated with the same palm leaf pattern held candles. Fluidly worked iron formed railings at the edge of the expansive sunken central floor. This was not the sinister lair Richard expected. This was a place of grand splendor to match any he had seen. The place was so beautiful that it left him awestruck. The wing in which the three of them stood, the entry hall, appeared to be by far the smallest of the four wings. Six-foot-tall white marble pedestals marched in a long double row beside the walkway laid with a long red carpet over a gold-flecked dark brown marble floor. Richard wouldn't have been able to touch fingers were he to put his arms around one of the pedestals. The ribbed barrel ceiling, thirty feet overhead, made the fat pedestals look minuscule. Sitting atop some of the pedestals were objects Richard recognized, ornate knives, gems set in brooches or at the ends of gold-worked chains a silver chalice, filigree bowls, and delicately worked boxes. Some sat on squares of cloth trimmed with gold or silver embroidery, others on stands carved from burled wood. Other pedestals held contorted objects that made no sense to him. He would have sworn that they changed shape when he looked at them. He decided it would be best not to look directly at such things of magic and warned the other two. The distant wing opposite them, across the central area under the huge dome, ended at a round-topped window that had to be thirty feet tall. Before the window was a huge table, piled with a clutter of objects, glass jars, bowls, and coiled tubes, a massive but simple iron candelabrum covered with ages of wax, stacks of scrolls, several human skulls, and a chaos of smaller items Richard couldn't make out from such a distance. The floor all around the table was similarly cluttered, along with things stacked up and leaning against the table. The wing to the right was dark. Richard felt uncomfortable even looking in that direction. He heeded the warning and looked to the left. In that wing, he saw books, thousands of them. There, Richard said as he gestured to the left. That's what we're here for. Remember what I told you, don't touch anything. He glanced at them both as they looked about with wide eyes. I mean it. I don't know how to save you if you get in trouble touching something in here. Both pairs of eyes looked back at him. We remember, Verdine said. We know better than to tempt magic, Raina said. We're just looking around, that's all. We wouldn't touch anything. Good. But I suggest that you don't even look at anything either, except what we need to look at. For all I know, simply looking at something in here could trigger its magic. Do you think? Raina asked in astonishment. What I think is that I'd rather not find out after it's too late. Come on, let's get this over with so we can get out of here. Oddly, even though he had said the words and knew they made sense, he didn't really feel like leaving. As potentially dangerous as he knew the place to be, he found that he liked the first wizard's enclave. Verdine smirked. Lord Rall fears magic as much as we do. You're wrong, Verdine. I know a little about magic. He started down the red carpet. I fear it more. Ten broad steps at the end led down into the central area. An expanse of cream-colored marble covered the floor. A border of darker brown marble ran around the floor near the edge. When Richard reached the bottom step and his foot touched the floor, it hummed and began to glow. He quickly retreated back up onto the red carpet. The glow extinguished. What now? Raina asked. He pried her fingers from his arm. Did either of you put your foot to the floor? They both shook their heads. Try. As Richard waited on the step, Verdine gingerly tried to test the marble. She withdrew her foot. I can't. Something stops my foot before I can get it on the floor. Richard stepped out onto the marble again. Again, it glowed and hummed. It must be a shield then. Here, take my hand and try again. Holding Richard's hand, Verdine was able to step onto the marble with him. Raina took his other hand and followed. All right, he said. Since it's some kind of shield, don't let go of my hand while we're on this part. We don't know what would happen. For all I know, if you let go of my hand, you could fry like bacon on a griddle. Their grips on his hands tightened. As they stepped onto the steps, up to the wing with the books, the floor went silent. Without Richard to hold their hands on the way out, they would be trapped inside this place, unable to return across the central floor. The wing with the books wasn't the kind of library he had expected. 
There were rows of shelves, but they were in disarray, with books stacked every which way. Chunks of rock served as bookends for the few standing upright among the disorder. Here and there, books were in piles, as if someone had pulled them from the shelves and simply tossed them in a heap. Most were closed, but a significant number lay open, some face up, some face down. But that wasn't the biggest surprise. Everywhere, it seemed, there were books stacked up on the floor. A few stacks were short, maybe three or four feet tall, but many more were tall pillars of books. Some of the irregular stacks towered twelve or fourteen feet. They looked as if the mere act of breathing could make them topple. The columns of books were everywhere, creating a maze. Richard couldn't fathom the reason for the books being stacked in such disarray, but the mystery of it made him sweat. Richard took an arm of each woman. My grandfather told me that there were books in the keep that were extremely dangerous. Kalen told me that the most dangerous things were kept in here, where no one could get to them, not even the wizard she knew. Verdine shot him a look. You mean you think that the books themselves could be dangerous? Not just the information in them, but the actual books? Richard thought of the description of a book that Sister Amelia had used to start the plague. I'm not sure, but we had better treat them as such. Look, but don't touch. Verdine's brow drew down with a dubious frown. Lord Thrall, there must be thousands of books I can see just standing here. There are bound to be more down the aisle. It will take us weeks to find the one we want, if it's even here. Richard took a deep breath. Verdine was right. He hadn't expected to find so many books in here. He thought the libraries held most of the books, and there would only be a few in here. If you want to be out of here before dark, we don't have long, Raina said. We might as well come back tomorrow and get an early start. Richard was beginning to feel intimidated by the task ahead. We'll just have to stay after dark. We'll stay all night if we have to. Raina rolled her aegeal in her fingers. If you say so, Lord Rall. Richard's heart sank as he stood staring at the forest of books. He needed information, not a search for one leaf in a forest. Only he could use magic to find that one leaf. He idly adjusted the bands at his wrist. Under his fingers, he felt the starburst pattern on one of them. Look without fixing your sight. I have an idea, he said. Wait here, I'll be right back. Richard returned to the pillars. He went to one that held a crackled glass bowl upon a large square of black cloth. What good is that going to do, Raina asked when he came back holding the cloth out for them. There's too much to see. I'm going to use this as a blindfold so I won't see all the things I don't want to see. Verdine's face twisted with incredulity. If you're blindfolded, then how are you going to see the thing we're looking for? With magic. I'm going to try to let my gift guide me. Sometimes it works that way, through need. All these books are too confusing. If I'm blindfolded, I won't see them, and I'll be able to feel the one I'm looking for. At least, that's what I hope. Raina gazed out over all the books. Well, you are the Lord Rall. You have magic. If it has a chance of getting us out of spending the night in here, then I say do it. Richard placed the black cloth over his eyes and began tying its tails behind his head. Just guide me and keep me from touching anything. Don't forget what I said about you two not touching anything either. Don't worry about us, Lord Rall, Raina said. We're not about to touch anything. When he finished tying the blindfold over his eyes, Richard turned his head this way and that, testing to make sure that he couldn't see. He rubbed a finger over the starburst on his wristband. His world was pitch black. He sought the inner peace, the inner calm, where dwelled his gift. If the plague was started by magic from the Temple of the Winds, then maybe they had a chance to halt it. If he did nothing, then untold thousands of people were going to die. He needed that book. He thought about the boy he had watched die. About the little girl, Lily, who told him about the Sister of the Dark showing her the book. That was how the plague started. He knew it was. That precious child had the tokens on her. Richard hadn't inquired, but he knew that she, at least, would be dead by now. He couldn't bear to inquire. He needed that book. He put a foot out. Nudge me with your fingers if I'm about to run into anything. Try not to talk, but if you must, don't be afraid to speak up. He felt their fingers lightly touch his arm as he stepped forward. 
They guided him with that touch, keeping him from colliding with the towering stacks of books as he waded deeper into the maze. Richard didn't know what it was he should feel. He didn't know if it was magic, a hunch, or his imagination guiding him. By the way he seemed to be winding up and down aisles and snaking through the stacks, he feared it was no more than his imagination. He tried to ignore the things that kept his thoughts skipping about and running in every direction. He tried to concentrate on the book and his need to find it. Thinking of the sick children, he was able to focus better. They needed him. They were helpless. Richard felt himself jerked to a halt. He wondered why. He turned left when he expected that he was going to turn right. It had to be the gift. With that thought, his thoughts scattered in every direction again. He focused once more. The two moored Sith forcibly snatched his arm to halt him. He understood. Another step and he would have collided with a stack. Wondering which way he would be turned, he found himself squatting instead. His arm lifted and he reached out. Careful, Verdeen whispered. It's a big irregular stack. Be careful or you'll knock it over. Richard nodded, not wanting to distract himself by answering with words. He was concentrating on feeling the object of his need. He felt it near. His fingers lightly brushed the books, running down the stack, touching the bindings of some and the pages of others because they were turned around the other way. His fingers stopped on a binding. This one. He tapped the leather binding. This one. What does it say? Verdine propped a hand on his thigh to support herself as she leaned in. It's Hyde de Haran. Something about the Temple of the Winds. Tagen Richt, Ost, Wermos, Velashendrich, Nicht Greschlechten. Temple of the Winds, Inquisition, and Trial, Richard translated in a whisper. We found it. Chapter 47 Breathe, the Sliff said. Kalin let go the silken essence and pulled a deep breath of the alien air. The dim world of the Sliff's well down in the keep whirled around her. Stone of the walls and floor finally settled in her vision. The dome overhead seemed to slow its spinning. Something unexpected waited in the Sliff's room. Tilted back in the chair with her feet propped up on the table sat a figure in red leather. Kalin sat down, dangling her feet over the edge of the stone wall to gather her senses. The front legs of the chair thunked down. Well, well, the wandering mother confessor returns at last. Kalin hopped down onto the floor. She almost lost her footing with the way it seemed to twist and tilt. Kara, what are you doing down here? Kara gripped Kalin under her arm. You better sit down until you regain your feet. I'm all right. Kalin glanced over her shoulder to the silver face behind her. Thank you, Sliff. Do you wish to travel? The Sliff's haunting voice echoed off the walls and dome overhead for a long moment. No, I've had enough traveling for the time being. I'm going to stay here. When you wish to travel, call me and we will travel. You will be pleased. I don't know about that, Kalen muttered, as the Sliff seemed to melt back into her well. He's a spooky companion to have down here, Kara said. She invited me to travel with her too and then told me I didn't have the magic required. He comes and stares at me with that eerie smile. Kara, what are you doing down here? Kara leaned Kalin back against the Sliff's well. She gave Kalin the strangest look as she shook her head to herself. When Lord Rall read your letter, it didn't take him long to figure out what you had done. Berdine told him how you had brought us here to look for that book on the trial record. He came down here, but the Sliff wouldn't tell him where she had taken you. Lord Rall said that now that he knew the Sliff was not sleeping, as he had thought, it wasn't safe to leave her alone. He said that others, like the sister and Marlin, could come through. Kalin hadn't thought about that, about another one of Jagang's minions coming to Aidendril through the Sliff. The Sliff seemed to have no loyalty. She would travel with anyone who had the required price of magic. So Richard left you here? He said he couldn't remain down here all the time to guard the Sliff. Kara's chin lifted with pride. He said that the moored Sith must guard the well at all times, since we have the power to stop someone with magic. The Lord Rall has always used the moored Sith to protect him against magic. 
The wizards of old obviously had this same problem with the slip and had left wizards like Kolo down here to guard her. Kolo said that the enemy sometimes arrived suddenly by way of the slip and that only the quick reactions of the one on guard had prevented disaster. You mean he brought you down here and just left you? No, he searched for hours until he found a way without magic so we could get down here on our own. He didn't want to have to bring each of us down here for our turn, and he didn't want us trapped down here either. We have to take shift. I don't like it, because we should be close to Lord Rawl in order to guard him, not this silver thing. But I guess that we are guarding Lord Rawl by doing this, so I agreed to it. Kaelin found her feet steady at last. If we had known the Slyph was awake and had been guarding her before, then Marlin wouldn't have been able to come to try to assassinate Richard, and the sister wouldn't have been able to start the plague. Kalen's chest constricted with a hot, cutting pang of regret. They could have prevented the whole thing. All the awful things she had learned would not be threatening her people, her world, and her love. The realization of the chance lost left her nauseous. Lord Rall also wanted us to wait until your return from the witch woman, in case you needed help. Richard knew where I went? The Slyph wouldn't tell him, but he said he knew anyway. He said you went to the witch woman. He knew and he didn't chase after me? Kara pulled her long blonde braid over her shoulder. I was surprised, too. I asked him why he wouldn't go after you. He said that he loved you. He did not own you. Really? Richard said that? Yes. A smirk tightened Kara's lips. You are training him well, Mother Confessor. I approve. And then he kicked the chair. I think he hurt his foot, but he denies it. So Richard is angry with me? Kara rolled her eyes. Mother Confessor, this is Richard we are talking about. The man is full in love with you. He wouldn't be angry with you if you told him to marry Nadine instead of you. Kalen swallowed at the renewed twist of pain. Why would you say that? Kara frowned. I only meant he could never be angry with you no matter what. You were supposed to laugh, not jump like I had poked you with my Aegeal. Mother Confessor, he loves you. He is worried sick, but he is not angry with you. What about kicking the chair? Kara stroked her long blonde braid and smirked again. He claimed the chair gave him just cause. I see. Kalen couldn't seem to find pleasure in Kara's sense of humor. How long have I been gone? Not quite two days. And I expect you to tell me how you managed to slip past those Daharan guards out there by the bridge. It was snowing. They didn't see me. Kara didn't look to believe it. She was giving Kaelin that odd look again. And did you kill the witch woman? No. Kaelin changed the subject. What has Richard been doing while I was gone? Well, first they asked the Slyph to take him to the Temple of the Wind. But she said she didn't know that place and couldn't take him there, so he rode to Mount Kaimermost. He went there? Kaelin snatched Kara's arm. What did he find? Nothing. He said that there was nothing to find. He said that if the Temple of the Winds was once there, it is now gone. Kalen released Kara's arm. He went to Mount Kymramost and he's back already? You know Lord Rall. When he gets something in his head, he charges after it. The men who went with him said they rode hard. They slept little and rode much of the night. Lord Rall expected you to return last night and wanted to be back for you. When you did not return as expected, he paced and fretted. But still he did not go after you. Whenever he looked like he was about to change his mind, he read your letter again and went back to pacing instead. I guess my letter was a little strong, Kalen said, as she glanced down at the floor. Lord Rawl showed it to me. Kara's face was unreadable. Sometimes it is necessary to threaten men, or they get to thinking that they are the ones who say what will be. You dissuaded him of that idea with your threat. I didn't threaten him. Kalen thought that her tone sounded too much like a plea. Kara watched Kalen's eyes for a moment. You are probably right. The chair must have given Lord Rall cause, as he said. I did what I had to do. Richard would understand that. I guess I'd better go explain it to him. Kara gestured behind to the door. You just missed him. He was here not long ago. He came to see if I was back? He must be worried sick. Berdine told him about the book you were searching for. He came here and found it. Kalen blinked in astonishment. He found it? But we looked. It wasn't there. How did he find it? 
He went to a place he called the First Wizard's Enclave and found it there. Kalen's jaw dropped. He went in there? He went into the First Wizard's Enclave? Alone, without me? He shouldn't have gone there. That's a dangerous place. Really? Tara folded her arms. And of course you would never do anything so foolish as to get it in your head to go run off alone to a dangerous place. Maybe you should reprimand Lord Rawl for his impulsive behavior, since you are so prudent and above such reckless conduct yourself. The echo of Kara's voice lingered uncomfortably before it died out. Kalin understood. Even though Richard did as she had asked by not coming after her, Kara had tried. Even though she didn't like magic, Kara had tried to go to protect Kalin. Kara, she said in a meek voice, I'm sorry I tricked you too. Kara shrugged, but still showed no emotion. I am just a guard. You have no obligation to me. Yes, I do. You are not just a guard. You may be our protector, but you are more. I consider you my friend. You are a sister of the Aegeal. I should have told you what I was doing, but I feared that if I did, Richard would be angry with you for not stopping me. I didn't want that. Kara said nothing. Still, she showed no emotion. Kalin breached the uncomfortable silence. Kara, I'm sorry. I guess I was afraid you would try to stop me. I tricked you. You're a sister of the Aegeal. I should have trusted you and taken you into my confidence. Please, Kara, I was wrong. I beg you forgive me. A smile finally spread on Kara's face. We are sisters of the Aegeal. I forgive you. Kalin managed a small smile. Do you think Richard will be as understanding as you? Kara let out an amused grunt. Well, you have better ways to persuade him to forgive you. It is not so difficult to melt a man's frown. I only wish I had good news so I could bring a smile to his face, but I don't. She paused at the doorway. What has Nadine been up to while I've been gone? Well, I've been down here guarding this lift much of the time. But from what I've seen, she has been giving the staff herbs to try to protect him and to use in smoking the palace. It's a good thing the place is made mostly of stone or it would have been burned down by now. She has been conferring with Drefen and helping him in talking to the staff and others who come for advice. Lord Rawl asked her to go out to visit herb sellers and such, to make sure they are not hucksters out to swindle people who are in fear for their lives. The city seems to be sprouting shameless mountebanks the way the sudden warmth seems to be bringing green grass. Nadine also gives reports to Lord Rawl, but he has been gone much of the time, and as busy as she seems to be trying to help people, the visits since he returned are short. Kalin tapped the side of her fist against the doorway. Thanks, Kara. She looked into the other's blue eyes. There are rats down here. Are you all right? There are worse things than rats. Indeed there are, Kalin whispered. Chapter 48 it was late, and with the dark, people on the streets didn't recognize her. Without her usual escort of guards, they had no reason to give her a second look, no reason to suspect she was the mother confessor out among them, just as well. There were some people who wished the mother confessor harm. Mostly people kept their distance from her, as they did with everyone else, hoping to keep the plague from themselves. As Kara had said, there were hucksters everywhere, hawking potions to ward off the plague, or to cure your loved ones already stricken. Others strolled the streets with trays, held up on straps over their shoulders, neatly laid out with amulets possessing magic to protect against the plague. Kalin remembered seeing some of these same people not long ago selling the same amulets as magic to find a husband or wife, or to enthrall an unfaithful spouse. Old women with small carts or simple wooden stands sold carved, spell-invested plaques made to hang over the door to a home as a sure way to keep the plague from entering the house. As late as it was, business seemed brisk. Even the vendors selling meats and produce extolled the healthful virtues of their goods and their value in promoting continued health, if eaten regularly, of course. Kalin would send the soldiers out to put a stop to some of these swindlers, but she knew that such intervention would likely be viewed with hostility on the part of the buyer. If she tried to use the army to stop such foolish practices, desperate people would concoct theories about those in power wanting to stop the cures so that the decent working folk would get the plague. Despite common sense or evidence to the contrary, many people believed that those in power were always scheming to harm them. 
if they only knew the truth. If Kalin were to order the sale of these items stopped, the cures would be sold in secret and for a higher price. No matter how insupportable the claims of these cures, their benefits would be vehemently supported as self-evident truth. Wizard's first rule, people would believe any lie either because they wanted to believe it was true or because they feared it was. These people were desperate and would become more so yet. Many wanted to believe. Kaylin tried to imagine what she would do if Richard had the plague. Would she be despairing enough to put her faith in such trickery, hoping against hope that it would save him? Sometimes hope was all people had. Groundless as it was, she couldn't take that hope away from them. It was all they had and all they could do. It was up to Kalen and Richard to do that which would help these people. As she made her way through the familiar splendor of the confessor's palace on her way to find Richard, Kalen paused at the open double doors to a large room used for formal reception. The room was a calming blue color, with dark blue drapes over the tall, narrow windows. The granite floor had a starburst pattern of darker and lighter stone radiating out from the center. Lamps on cherry wood stands around the edge of the room lent a mellow light to the gathering hall. The table where small foods were sometimes set out for guests now held only an array of candles. Kalen's attention had been drawn by the sound of Dreton's voice. He stood to the right before the table with the candles, speaking to perhaps fifty or sixty people. They sat cross-legged on the floor before him, listening with rapt attention as he spoke of the way of health of keeping the body sound by being in touch with the inner self. Most of the people nodded absently as they listened to Drefin explaining how, by defiling their bodies with unhealthy thoughts and actions, people opened the pathway for sickness to enter. He told them that the Creator had endowed them with the ability to fight off things such as the plague, if only they would do as nature provided, by eating the right foods that would strengthen the auras that defended the body and by using inner reflection to direct the vigor of various energy fields to their proper function in harmony with the whole. Many of the things he said made sense. Not eating foods that you knew gave you headaches because it interfered with the mind's ability to regulate the body. Not eating foods that you knew caused pains and cramps in the gut because it interfered with the body's ability to digest the good foods you needed. Not eating heavy meals right before sleeping because it interfered with your body getting the rest it needed to remain strong, and how all of these things disrupt the auras that give us strength and protect health. People marveled openly that Dreffen could make it all so simple for them to understand. They spoke as if they had been blind, and now for the first time had vision. They watched with unblinking eyes as he went on, telling them that we had within us the power to control our own bodies and that disease could only afflict us if we allowed it to. He spoke of herbs and foods that purged poisons from the body and left people truly healthy for perhaps the first time since their birth. These people weren't listening to Lord Rall's brother. They were listening to Drefen Rall, high priest of the Rogmos. As one, they followed the high priest's instructions when he told them to close their eyes and draw the breath of life and healthy steams through their noses and down into their inner core by using the muscles low in their bellies. He explained how to let it reach deep into the source of the power of each person's unique aura, to draw out the poisons from the furthest, darkest corners of their beings and expel it out through the mouth, to be replaced with a renewing breath of life drawn in again through the nose. Better, Kalen guessed that these people would come to Drefen for advice that might help them, and at least sounded like it could do no harm, then spend their savings on false hope from the hucksters in the street. Paying attention to their body's needs with things like proper food and rest seemed sound advice. As they all drew the slow, deep breaths in through their noses, Dreffen turned his head and locked his dark and raw eyes on Kalin, as if he had known all along that she had been standing there outside the doorway. He gave her a kind-hearted smile that sparkled benevolently in his blue eyes. She could see why these people put their trust in him. She made herself return a little smile. Kaylin remembered the talk she had had with Shota about how difficult it was to banish unpleasant memories. Kaylin wished she could forget Drefen's hand between Kara's legs. Drefen was trying to help people. He was doing everything he could to halt the plague. He was a great healer, the high priest of the Rogmos. 
She tried to put the image of him comforting those sick children in place of the memory of his forcing his big hand down between Kara's legs. Dreffen had explained at the time why he had done that to Kara. He had saved Kara's life. A moored Sith, screaming in pain, then unconscious, and Dreffen had brought her back. Richard found comfort in Dreffen, as did everyone else. Kalen broke eye contact with him and continued on her way to find Richard. Tristan Bashkar, the Jarian ambassador staying at the Confessor's palace while he waited for further signs from the stars, further word from above, before surrendering, paused at a balcony as she passed below. As was his habit, he drew back his coat and rested his hand on his hip. It displayed the wicked dagger he wore at his belt. Oftentimes, in conversation, he would also put a boot up on a chair or stool and casually rest his forearm on his knee. It provided those in conversation with him the opportunity to see also the knife he kept in his boot. The more she saw Tristan in the palace, watching her with his cunning eyes, the more she disliked his presence. If there was a man who acted more childish, Kaelin didn't know him. Tristan watched silently as she hurried on her way. Kaelin was glad he was up on a balcony, so that she wouldn't have to waste time playing word games with him. Ulick and Egan gave Kaelin an odd look as she greeted them before whisking through the door to the small room Richard liked to use to study Colo's journal. He was sitting with his head in his hand, his fingers buried in his hair, as he read from another book that lay open on the table. Two candles and a lamp on the table beside him provided light, and a small, fragrant fire of birch logs added warmth to the cozy room. His cloak lay over a nearby chair, but he wore his sword. Richard looked up. When he saw her, he shot to his feet. Without the gold cloak, he was like a big black shadow gliding across the room. Before he could speak, Kalin rushed into his arms. Kalin pressed the side of her face to his chest as she hugged him. Please, Richard, don't yell at me. Please just hold me. Tears choked her voice. Please don't say anything, just hold me. It was ecstasy being with him again. It never failed to astound her whenever she saw him, just how much she needed and loved him. Richard's arms enclosed her in comforting shelter. She listened to the fire crackle and the sound of his heart under her ear. She could almost imagine in the safety of his strong arms that everything was fine and that they had a future. She remembered her mother's words. Confessors don't have love, Kalen. They have duty. Kalen clutched his black shirt as she fought a losing battle to hold back tears. He held her and stroked her hair. She had asked him to hold her and not speak, and he was doing just that. That only made her feel worse. He must have questions. He must want to say something to her, to tell her how relieved he was to see her safe, to tell her how worried he had been, to ask her where she had been and what she had found out to tell her what he had found, to yell at her, but he didn't. Instead, without protest, he did as she had asked, relegating his own desires to secondary after hers. How would she go on without his love? How would she draw a breath? How would she manage to make herself go on until she was old and to finally finish her duty and at last die? Richard, I'm so sorry I made that letter sound threatening. I didn't mean to threaten you, I swear. I just wanted you to be safe. I'm so sorry if I hurt you. He squeezed her a little tighter and kissed the top of her head. Kalen wished she could just die in his arms now and not have to face her duty, not have to face the finality of the future, the finality of losing him. How's your foot? she asked. My foot? Kara said you hurt it on a chair. Oh, my foot is fine. The chair died, but I don't think it suffered. Against all odds, Kalen laughed. She looked up through her tears into his gentle smile. All right, I think your hug has revived me. You can yell at me now. He kissed her instead. The feeling of being pulled up in his arms was rapture. Being in the sliff didn't even come close. So, he finally said, What did our ancestors' spirits have to say? Our ancestors? How did you know that I went to the mud people? Richard's brow curved into a bewildered cast. Kaelin, your face is all painted so the ancestors' spirits could see you in a gathering. Did you think I wouldn't notice? Kaelin touched her fingers to her forehead, to her cheek. I was in such a hurry, I never even gave it any thought. No wonder people have been giving me such odd looks. As she had raced through the palace looking for him, three different women on the staff had offered to draw her a bath. 
Everyone must have thought she had gone mad. Richard's expression turned serious as he settled his arms around her waist. So what did the ancestor spirits have to say? Kaylin steeled herself. She tilted her head, indicating the bone knife on her arm. Grandfather's spirit called me through his bone knife. He had to speak with me. He told me that the plague isn't confined to Aidendrill. It's spread all over the Midlands. Richard tensed. Do you think it's true? Elder Bregandaren had the tokens on his legs. He's probably dead by now. Some children reported that they saw a woman near the mud people's village. She showed them something with colored light, just like what Lily told us she saw. One of those children has already died. Sister Amelia was there. Dear spirit, Richard whispered. It gets worse. The spirit showed me other places I know in the Midlands. He said that the plague has spread to all these places too. The spirit showed me what will be if the plague isn't stopped. Death will sweep the land. Few will survive. The spirit told me that magic stolen from the Temple of the Wind started the plague, but that the plague itself isn't magic. Jagang has used magic more powerful than he understands. If allowed to rage unchecked, the plague could eventually sweep into the old world, too. Small consolation. Did the spirit say how Jagang stole this magic from the Temple of the Winds? Kaelin nodded as she looked away from his eyes. You were right about the Red Moons. It was a warning that the Temple of the Winds had been violated. Kaelin told him about the Hall of the Betrayer and how Sister Amelia had been able to tread that path. Kaelin recounted the rest of her meeting with the spirit of Chandelin's grandfather as best as she could remember it, including the part about the temple being at least partially sentient, as Richard had suspected. Richard leaned an arm against the mantel as he stared into the fire. He pinched his lower lip as he listened patiently. Kaelin told him how the spirit had told her that to stop the plague they must get into the Temple of the Winds, how it existed in both worlds at the same time and how both the good and the evil spirits were involved and had a say in this. And the ancestor spirit could give you no indication how we were to get to the Temple of the Winds? No, Kalin said. In fact, he wasn't interested in that part of it. He said that the temple would reveal what must be done. Shota said the same thing. Engrossed in thought, Richard nodded while he considered her words. Kalin twisted her fingers together while she waited. What about Shota? he asked at last. What happened with her? Kalin hesitated. She knew she had to tell him at least some of it, but she was reluctant to tell him all of what Shota had said. Richard, I don't believe Shota was trying to cause trouble. He looked back over his shoulder. She sends Nadine to marry me, and you don't think that kind of interference trouble? Kalin cleared her throat into her fist. Shota didn't send Nadine exactly. Richard's hawk-like gaze continued to fix on her, so she went on. The message about the winds hunting you was not her idea. The Temple of the Winds was sending you a message through her, just as it was sending you a message through that boy who died. Shota wasn't trying to harm us. Richard's brow lowered. What else did the witch woman tell you? Kalin interlocked her fingers behind her back. She looked away from his penetrating glare. Richard, I went there to put an end to Shota's interference. I was prepared to kill her if she threatened you or tried to harm me. I thought the worst of her. I did. I was convinced she was trying to harm us. I talked with her. Really talked. Shota isn't as malicious as I thought. She admitted she doesn't want us to have a child, but this isn't about trying to keep us apart. She has a talent for seeing the future, and she is only telling us what she sees to try to help you. She's just the messenger in this. She's not directing these events. She said the same thing as the ancestor's spirit, that the plague was started by magic and not of its own accord. With three strides, Richard closed the distance between them. He seized her by the upper arm. She sent Nadine to marry me. She sent Nadine to keep us apart. She's trying to put a wedge between us, and you are taken in by her tricks? Kalen backed away from him. No, Richard. You have it wrong, as did I. The spirits sent you a bride. Shota was only able to influence who it would be. She used that influence so that the bride sent would be Nadine. Shota says she sees that you will marry this bride sent by the spirits, and so she wanted it to be someone you knew. She was only trying to ease your pain in this. And you believe her? Have you lost your mind? Richard, you're hurting my arm. 
He released her. Sorry, he muttered, as he withdrew to the hearth. Kalen could see the muscles in his jaw flexing as he ground his teeth. You said she told you the same as the ancestor spirit. Do you remember her words? Kalen tried frantically to separate what she knew she had to tell him from what she didn't want him to know. She realized how unwise it was to try to hide information from Richard, but she reasoned that if she had to, she could always tell him everything. If she could get away with withholding some of it, though. Shota said, We have not heard the last message from the winds. She said we will receive one more involving the moon. Involving the moon? How? I don't know. Just like the spirit, the how didn't seem to be important to her. What she did say was that this message from the moon will be the consequential communion, as she called it. She said we must not ignore or dismiss it. Did she now? And did she say why exactly? She said our future and the future of all those innocent people will hinge on this event. She said it would be our only chance to carry out our duty to save the innocent lives of all those who depend upon us to do what they cannot. Richard turned to her. It was like death itself rounding on her. His eyes had that look like Dreffen's, like Dark and Rawls. She told you something else that you're holding back. What is it? He growled. It wasn't Richard speaking. It was the Seeker. She knew in that instant why a seeker was so feared. He was a law unto himself. Those gray eyes were looking right into her. Richard, she whispered, please leave it at that. His glare cut to her soul. What did she tell you? Kaylin swallowed as she panted with dread. She could feel hot tears coursing down her face. Shota saw the future, Kaylin heard herself speaking, even though she had intended to remain silent. She saw that you will wed another. She used her influence to make it someone you knew. Under his glare, she found remaining silent impossible. She could not influence who I am to wed. I will be married, too. It will not be you who becomes my husband. Richard stood frozen for a moment, a boiling thunderhead gathering. He yanked the baldric off over his head and tossed it and the scabbard holding the sword on a chair. Richard, what are you doing? And then he was moving. He went for the door. Kaylin put herself in front of him. It was like stepping in front of an enraged mountain. Richard, what are you going to do? He grasped her by the waist, picked her up, and set her aside, as if she were no more than a child in his way. I'm going to kill her. Kaylin threw her arms around his waist from behind, trying to drag him to a halt. It slowed him no more than if she had been a gnat. He was leaving his sword because he couldn't travel in the sliff with the magic of the Sword of Truth. Richard! Richard, please stop! If you love me, stop. He halted and turned his wrathful glare on her. His voice came like a crack of thunder. What? Richard, do you think I'm stupid? Of course not. Then do you believe I want to marry someone else? No. Richard, you have to listen to me. Shota said she saw the future. She isn't making the future, she just saw it. She told me these things so that what she saw might help us. I've had all of the help from Shota I intend to have. I'll have no more of it. She has taken one liberty too many. It will be her last. Richard, we have to figure out what to do. We have to do what we can to stop this plague. You saw those sick dying children. The spirit of Chandelin's grandfather showed me countless other dead children, dead people of all sorts. That will be the future if you do this. Do you want those children and their parents to die because you refuse to use your head? His fist was gripping some sort of ornament on an elaborate necklace. She realized she had never seen it before. Even though he wasn't wearing his sword, its magic drove him. He was a cauldron of lethal rage. Death was dancing in his eyes. I don't care what Shota says, I'll not marry Nadine. Nor will I stand by while you... I know, she whispered. Richard, I know how you feel. How do you think this makes me feel? But use your head. This is not the way to change what Shota said. You always said before that the future is not yet decided and that we couldn't act on what Shota says. You always said that we couldn't allow ourselves to put our faith in what she says and let it direct our actions. His eyes shone with deadly wrath. You believe her. Kalen took a calming breath, trying to regain her composure. I believe she saw the future. Richard, don't you remember how she also said that I would touch you with my power? Look at how that turned out. She was right, but it wasn't the calamitous event I feared. 
It was what brought us together and allowed us to have our love. How can your marrying someone else turn out good? Kalin abruptly realized what this was really about. He was jealous. She had never seen him this jealous before. But that's what it was, a jealous rage. I would be lying if I told you I knew. Kalin gripped his broad shoulders. Richard, I love you, and that's the truth. I could never love anyone else. You believe me, don't you? I trust in your love for me, and I know that you don't love Nadine. Don't you believe in me? Don't you trust me? He visibly cooled. Of course I do. I do trust you. Frustration replaced the rage in his eyes. He released the amulet in his fist. But, but nothing. We love each other, and that's all there is to it. Whatever happens, we have to believe in each other. If we don't believe in each other, then we are lost in this. At last, he pulled her into his arms. She knew his anguish. She felt it, too. Hers, though, was worse, because she didn't believe there was a way out of Shota's prediction. Kalin lifted the strange amulet at his neck. In the center, surrounded by a complex of gold and silver lines, was a teardrop-shaped ruby as big as her thumbnail. Richard, what is this? Where did you get it? He lifted the gold and silver object from her fingers to peer down at it. It's a symbol like the others I wear. I found it in the keep. In the first wizard's enclave? Yes. It was part of this outfit, but unlike the rest of it, this was left in the first wizard's enclave. The man who wore it was the first wizard in Kolo's time. His name was Barakas. Kara told me that you found the record of the trial. What did it look like in there? Richard stared off. It was beautiful. I didn't want to leave. Have you found out anything from the book yet? No. It's in Haida Haran. Berdine is working on Kolo's journal. I'll work on this one. I've only had an hour or so to start translating it. I haven't really done much yet. I was too worried about you to be able to think about anything else. Kalin touched the amulet hanging around his neck. Do you know what this symbol represents? Yes. The ruby is meant to represent a drop of blood. It is the symbolic representation of the way of the primary edict. The primary edict? His voice turned distant, as if speaking to himself more than to her. It means only one thing and everything. Cut. Once committed to fight, cut. Everything else is secondary. Cut. That is your duty, your purpose, your hunger. There is no rule more important, no commitment that overrides that one. Cut. His words chilled her to the bone as he went on. The lines are a portrayal of the dance. Cut from the void, not from bewilderment. Cut the enemy as quickly and directly as possible. Cut with certainty. Cut decisively, resolutely. Cut into his strength. Flow through the gaps in his guard. Cut him. Cut him down utterly. Don't allow him a breath. Crush him. Cut him without mercy to the depths of his spirit. It is the balance to life, death. It is the dance with death. It is the law a war wizard lives by, or he dies. Chapter 49 Clarissa sat curled up in a chair, sewing the hem of a new dress Nathan had bought for her. He had wanted to let the seamstress do the work, but she had insisted on doing it herself, mostly to have something to do. Nathan had smiled and told her that if it would please her, then it was all right with him. She didn't know what she would do with all the dresses he kept buying for her. She had told him to stop, but he just kept doing it. Nathan returned from the door, having had a long discussion with a soldier named Bolsden about the movements of Jagang's expeditionary force. They were the men who had attacked her home of Renwald, Clarissa had learned. She tried not to listen to Nathan's talks with his soldier friends who showed up from time to time. She didn't like to think about the nightmare of Renwald. Nathan told her that he wanted to end the killing, so there would be no more Renwald. He called it a waste of life. Clarissa touched Nathan's leg when he came close. Is there anything I can do to help? His blue eyes turned toward her, watching her for a long moment. No, not yet. I must write a letter. I'm expecting someone soon. Don't go into the bedroom to answer the door when they come. Stay in here. I don't want them to get a look at you. You don't have magic, so they won't know you're in here. Clarissa caught the tone of disquiet in his voice. Do you think they will cause trouble? They won't try to hurt you, will they? 
A sly smile took his face. That would be the last mistake they ever made. I've laid so many traps around this place that the keeper himself wouldn't dare to try to take me here. He winked at her, as if to reassure her. Watch through the keyhole if you wish. It may be good for you to remember the faces of these people. They're dangerous. Her stomach churning with anxiety, Clarissa began embroidering little vines and leaves along the hem of the dress because she thought they would be pretty and to pass the time while Nathan wrote his letter. When he finished, he clasped his hands behind his back and paced. When the knock finally came, he looked toward the bedroom where stood the door to the hall. He turned to her and crossed his lips with a finger. Clarissa nodded. He shut the door to the sitting room as he went to answer the knock. She set aside her needlework and knelt at the door through the keyhole. She had a good view of the hall door as Nathan pulled it open. Two attractive women about Clarissa's age stood in the hall. Two young men waited behind them. The scowls on the women could have cut stone. Clarissa was astonished to see that each woman had a small gold ring through her lower lip, as did Clarissa. Well, well, one of the women said contemptuously, if it isn't the prophet himself. We thought it was probably you, Nathan, messing about in things that aren't your business. Nathan grinned as he bowed dramatically from the waist. Sister Jodell, Sister Wilhelmina, how nice to see you again. And that's Lord Rall, even to you, Sister Jodell. Lord Rall, Sister Jodell said in a flat, mocking voice. So we've heard. Nathan waggled his fingers in greeting to the two young men standing out on the hall behind the two women. Vincent, Pierce, how good to see you two boy wizards again. Still trying to master prophecy, are you? Come for some advice? Maybe a lesson? In a little over your head, aren't you, old man? One of the young men asked. Nathan's amusement vanished. He flicked his finger. The young man cried out and dropped to the floor. I told you, Pierce. It's Lord Rall. Nathan's voice turned as deadly as Clarissa had ever heard it. Don't test me again. Sister Wilhelmina scowled back at Pierce, whispering a harsh admonishment as he staggered to his feet. Nathan held his arm out in invitation. Won't you ladies please come in? Bring your boys, too. Clarissa didn't think they really looked like boys, as Nathan called them. She thought they looked to be in their late twenties at least. The four warily stepped inside and stood in a bunch, hands clasped before them, while Nathan shut the door. Pretty risky, Na Lord Rall. To let the four of us get this cloak, Sister Jodell said. I wouldn't think you would be this careless, now that you've somehow convinced some feeble-minded sister to take pity on you and remove your Radahan. Nathan slapped his knee and howled with laughter. None of the other four so much as cracked a smile. Risky, he asked, as his fit of laughter died out. Why, what have I to fear from the likes of you four? And I'll have you know that I took off the Radahan by myself. I think it only fair to tell you that while you foolishly chose to view me as a crazy old man, I was studying things you can't even fathom. While all of you sisters get to the point, Sister Jodell growled. Nathan held up a finger. The point is, my fine people, that I have no ill will toward you or your leader. But I can weave webs you couldn't even understand, much less defend against, should you wish me harm. For example, I'm sure you detect the simple shields I've placed here and there. But there is more hidden beyond those things you sent. Should you... Sister Jodell lost her patience and cut him off again. We didn't come here to listen to the babble of a doddering old man. Do you think us stupid? We detected the pathetic magic you have so proudly laced about this place, and I can tell you with confidence there's not a bit of it that one of us alone couldn't slice apart with ease, while at the same time enjoying a bowl of soup. Vincent shoved the two sisters aside. I've heard just about enough from this dried-up old jackass. He always was full of himself. It's about time he learned just who he's dealing with. Nathan made no move to defend himself as Vincent lifted his hand. Clarissa's eyes went wide in fright as the young man's fingers curled and his face twisted with hate. Clarissa covered her mouth in terror as light shot from Vincent's hands toward Nathan. A brief whine sang through the air. The light from the young man scattered. There was a thump that Clarissa could feel in the floor as light flared through the other room. When the sound and light cleared, Vincent was gone. On the floor where he had stood, 
Clarissa could see a small pile of white ash. Nathan went to the wall and retrieved a broom leaned there just behind a curtain. He opened the door and swept the ash out through the door into the hall. Thank you for coming, Vincent. Sorry you have to leave now. Let me show you out. With a flourish, Nathan swept the last of the ash out into the hall, creating a small cloud as he did so. He shut the door and turned back to the gaping gazes of the three people left. Now, as I was saying, you will be making the last mistake of your lives if you underestimate me or what it is you think me capable of. Your negligible intellects couldn't even understand it if I showed it to you. Nathan's brow drew down in a way that frightened even Clarissa. Now, show proper respect and bow to the Lord Rahl. Reluctantly, the three people bowed, each touching a knee to the floor. What is it you want? Sister Jodell asked after she had straightened. Her voice had lost some of its edge. You can tell Jagang that I'm interested in peace. Peace? Sister Jodell fussed back some of her dark hair. What position are you in that you could make such an offer? Nathan lifted his chin. I am Lord Rahl. I will soon be master of Dahara. I will be in command of the New World. I believe it is a war with the New World in which Jagang is embroiled. Sister Jodell's eyes narrowed. What do you mean you are soon to be the master of Dahara? Just tell Jagang that his daring plan is about to be successfully completed. He will soon have eliminated the present Lord Rahl. Jagang has made a mistake, though. He forgot about me. But, but, Sister Jodell sputtered. You aren't the Lord Rahl. Nathan leaned toward them with a sly smile. If Jagang succeeds, which as a prophet I can foresee he will, then I will be the Lord Rahl. I am a Rahl born with the gift. All the Harans will become bonded to me. As you know, that bond will prevent the Dreamwalker from using his talent to take the new world. Jagang has made a mistake, Nathan thunked Pierce on the head. He's been using amateur prophets like this witless tadpole. Pierce turned red. I'm no amateur prophet. Nathan regarded him with a look of contempt. Really? Then why didn't you warn Jagang that by using prophecy to eliminate Richard Rahl, it would get him nowhere but into a worse predicament? Because it would leave me to become the Lord Rahl, master of Dahara and most of the major powers in the New World. Did you warn him about that result? While Richard may be determined, he knows next to nothing about magic, whereas I know a great deal about it. A very great deal. Nathan towered over Pierce. Just ask Vincent. A real prophet would have realized the danger lurking behind my simple shield, waiting to be triggered if anyone attacked. Did you? Sister Wilhelmina put out an arm, forcing Pierce back, and just in time it appeared to Clarissa, as Nathan looked to be about to make another pile of white dust. What is it you want, Lord Rahl? she asked. Jagang can either listen to my terms, or he can have really big trouble on his hands. Trouble a lot worse than Richard Rahl. Terms? Sister Jodell drew the word out suspiciously. The present Lord Rahl is young and idealistic. He would never surrender to Jagang. I, on the other hand, am older and wiser. I know the foolishness of a war that would take the lives of countless people. And to what purpose? Just for the right to put a name to the one who is the leader? Richard is a young fool who doesn't know how to use his power. I am not a young fool. And as you saw, I know how to use my gift. I'm willing to entertain the possibility of letting Jagang rule the new world as he wishes. And in return, Nathan casually flicked his hand. I simply want some of the spoils for myself, in return for my assistance. I will have the rule of Dahara, under his leadership, of course. I will be his man running the affairs of Dahara. Other than Jagang, no one will outrank me. Quite fair, I think. The young Pierce was still white as a sheet and trying to look invisible behind the two women. The two sisters, on the other hand, were looking suddenly a lot less unhappy. They wore small, interested smiles. How would Jagang know that you could be trusted? Trusted? Does he think I'm as stupid as the young Lord Rahl leading the new world right now? I saw what was done to Renwald. If I didn't rule Dahara as Jagang wished, allowing him generous tribute, he might come in and try to crush us. Wars are expensive. I'd rather have the wealth for myself. Sister Jodell smiled politely. 
and in the meantime, how do we know you really mean this? So it's assurance you want. Nathan rubbed his chin as he stared up at the ceiling. There is a Daharan army of close to a hundred thousand men north of here. You'll never find them without my help until they descend on Jagang's expeditionary force. When Jagang finishes eliminating the present Lord Rall, then this army's bond will transfer to me. They will be loyal to me. As soon as that happens, I will surrender that army to his, giving him even more men-at-arms. Daharans have a long tradition of warring for plunder. They'll fit right in with Jagang's force. Surrender an army, Sister Jodell said in a reflective tone. You see, my kind sisters, Jagang is trying to use prophecy to win this war. In that he has made a mistake. He is using wizards who are not real prophets. I could provide the expert service of a real prophet. His alternative is to have a real prophet as his enemy and amateurs to aid him. The aid of amateurs is what got him into this predicament, don't you see? For a small, insignificant slice of the spoils, I can get him out of it. I'm sure you can understand that after all those years under the care of you fine sisters, I'd like to spend my few remaining years enjoying the pleasures of life. With my help, there will be no more resistance from the new world than that offered by Renwall. If Jagang should choose to be unreasonable, well, who knows? With a real prophet on the side of the new world, they might even win. Sister Jodell studied Nathan's eye. Yes, I see what you mean. Nathan held out his letter. Here, give this to Jagang. It explains my proposal and terms in return for my surrender of the new world. As I said, I'm sure he will find me much more reasonable than the present Lord Rahl. I know that there is no profit in war. One leader or another, it means little. Why should hundreds of thousands of people die over the name put to that leader? Both sisters glanced around the luxurious room and smiled conspiratorially at Nathan. Why, you crafty old man, Sister Jodell said. And here all this time we thought you were just an old fool living out your life down in your apartment. Well, Lord Ra, we will pass your words along to Emperor Jagang. I think he will find them most interesting. Had the present Lord Ra been so reasonable, he wouldn't be in his present fatal difficulty. All those years do give a man time to think. Sister Jodell turned back from the door. I can't speak for the Emperor, Lord Ra, but I think he will be most pleased with this news. I think we can dare to see the end of this war and the victory that will result in Jagang being the name put to the leader of all people. I just want the killing to stop. It would profit us all, sister. Oh, and tell Jagang that I am sorry about Vincent, but the boy wasn't really serving him well anyway. Sister Jodell shrugged. You're right, Lord Rahl. He wasn't. Chapter 50 Richard ran his fingers through his hair as he rested his forehead in his palm. He looked up when he heard someone enter the room. It was Kayla. His heart lifted at her smile, her bright green eyes, the lush fall of her thick hair, and how beautiful she was. He marveled at her beauty and that she loved him. The safety he felt in that love was something he had never imagined he would feel. He had always imagined being in love with someone, but he had never imagined the feeling of security and peace it would bring to his soul. If Shota ever did anything to harm that security. Kalen carried a steaming bowl of soup. I thought you might like something to eat. You've been at this for a hand of days now. I think you need to get more sleep, too. He glanced at the big white bowl in her hand. Thanks. Her brow wrinkled. Richard, what's wrong? Your face is white as ashes. He leaned back in his chair and sighed. I feel a little sick. She turned white as ashes, too. Thick, Richard, it isn't. No, it's not that. It's this book on the Temple of the Winds Inquisition and Trial. I almost wish I'd never found it. Kalen leaned over as she set down the bowl. Here, eat some of this. What is it? Richard asked, as he watched the lush curve of her cleavage rise and fall above the square neckline of her white confessor's dress. Lentil porridge, eat some. What have you found out? Richard sucked in through his mouth to cool the spoonful of porridge. I haven't translated much yet. It's taking forever. But from just the little bit I've been able to figure out, 
these people, these wizards, they, they executed all the wizards who sent away the Temple of the Wind. The Temple Team, they called them. Almost a hundred men. He pulled a finger across his throat. Kalin sat on the edge of the table opposite him. What did they do to warrant death? Richard stirred the porridge. Well, for one thing, they left a way into the Temple of the Winds, as they were directed to do. But they made it so hard to get back into the temple that when these people wanted to get back in to retrieve some magic in order to fight the war, they couldn't. Kolo said that there were the Red Moons, that the temple sent the warning. You mean the wizards of old were never able to answer the warning? That wasn't the way it worked. They did get back in. He waved his spoon for emphasis. In fact, that was the reason for the Red Moon. It was the second attempt to get in, to answer the Red Moons caused by the first person sent that they failed at. Kalin leaned toward him while Richard ate a spoonful of porridge. But this first person got in? Oh, yes, he got in. And that was the problem. Kalin shook her head. I'm not following this. Richard sat down his spoon and leaned back in his chair. He met her gaze. The temple team who sent away the Temple of the Winds were also the ones who placed the magic in it. You know about some of the terrible magical creations that were made in the war? Things made out of people, like the Mriswith, like the Dreamwalkers? Well, the people of the New World were fighting the people of the Old World who wanted to eliminate magic, much as Jagang does today. These wizards who took the things of power to the safety of the temple were somewhat in sympathy with those in the Old World who wanted to eliminate magic. They thought that using people to create these terrible weapons was as evil as some of the very things they fought against. Fascinated, Kalin leaned toward him. You mean they turned to the side of the enemy? They were really working for those in the old world to eliminate magic? No, they weren't working to defeat the new world or to stop all magic, but they felt that they viewed the whole matter on a wider scope than just the war, unlike the wizards in charge here at the Keep. They sought the middle ground. They decided that, to an extent, the war and all their troubles were related to the misuse of magic. They decided that something had to be done. Kalin hooked some hair behind her ear. Done? Like what? You know the way the keep used to be full of wizards? The way wizards used to have both sides of the magic? The way the wizards of old wielded much more power than even Zed does now as first wizard? The way those born with the gift are more and more rare all the time? I think these wizards used the Temple of the Winds to withdraw some of magic's power from this world. They locked it away in the underworld, where it couldn't be used to cause harm, as they saw it, in this world. Kalin put a hand to her chest. Dear spirit, what gave them the right to decide this? They are not the creator who gave all things, including magic. Richard smiled. The head of the Inquisition said much the same thing. He demanded to know exactly what they had done. And have you found the answer? I haven't translated much yet, and I don't understand the way the magic worked, but I think that what the temple team did was to lock away the subtractive portion of the wizard's magic. It's the subtractive part that was used to turn people into these weapons. With it, they took away parts of who these people were, the parts these wizards didn't want, and then with additive magic, the wizards added in the things they did want, so they could use these people as weapons. What about you? You were born with both sides. If the power was locked away, how does that explain your gift? I, too, have an element of subtractive magic to my confessor's power. Dark and Rahl used subtractive magic, as do some of the sisters. There are creatures yet today who have some of this element to their magic. Richard wiped a weary hand across his face. I don't know. I'm not even positive about what I've told you. There's still most of this book to translate. I've only just begun. Even when I translate it all, I'm not sure it will provide the answers we want. This was an inquisition and trial. They weren't trying to teach me history. It was common knowledge at the time. They didn't need to explain it. What I'm beginning to think the temple team did was to halt subtractive magic's ability to be passed on to the offspring of wizards. Your magic isn't passed on from a wizard, so perhaps that's why it wasn't affected. Dark and Rahl learned to use subtractive magic. He wasn't born with it. Therein, perhaps, lies the difference. Maybe they miscalculated how taking subtractive magic out of those born with the wizard's gift would affect the balance, and so didn't anticipate the way it would cause fewer and fewer to be born with the gift. Maybe they did know. Maybe that's what they wanted. Maybe that's why they were executed.
What about the Red Moon? Well, when those in charge found all this out, they sent someone to undo what these wizards had done. They needed one with tremendous power and conviction, hoping he would have enough strength to succeed. They sent the most zealous proponent of magic among them, a fanatic, the head prosecutor, a powerful wizard named Lothane, to the Temple of the Winds to undo the damage. Kaelin drew her lower lip between her teeth. What happened? He got in through Betrayer's Hall, just like you told me. It worked just as you said. Lothane entered, but in doing so, he betrayed them. I'm not sure what it was that he did. Many of the words, I think, have to do with specific magic that I don't understand. But from what I gather, he reinforced what the wizards who sent the temple away had done and made it even worse. He betrayed those in the new world. Because he had to alter the way the Temple of the Winds held this magic, it set off the warnings of the Red Moon. When the Temple sent the Red Moons and the call for aid, a wizard was sent. Because the Temple was sending for help, the wizards were glad for the call, since it meant that they wouldn't have to enter through Betrayer's Hall. They thought they would be able to get in and at last remedy the problem. He never came back. They sent another more powerful and experienced wizard. He never returned either. Finally, in view of the seriousness of the situation, the first wizard himself went to the Temple of the Winds. Richard lifted the amulet at his chest. Baracus. Baracus? Kalin breathed in wonder. Did he get into the temple? They were never sure. Richard pushed his thumb back and forth along the edge of the table. Baracus came back in a dazed stupor. They followed after him, but he didn't react or respond to anything they said or did. He went into the first wizard's enclave, his retreat, and left this there. Richard held up the amulet at his chest, showing it to her. He came out, removed the rest of his outfit, these things I wear, and then walked to the edge of the rampart and jumped off the side of the mountain to his death. Kalin sat back up straight while Richard cleared his throat and gathered his voice before going on. After that, the wizards abandoned any further attempt to get into the Temple of the Winds to answer the call of the Red Moons as impossible. They were never able to get in to undo the damage the temple team and then Lothane had done. Kalin watched him with a sober look as he stared off at nothing. How did they know all this? Richard's fist tightened around the amulet at his chest. They used a confessor, Magda Cirrus, the first mother confessor herself. She lived in that time? She was there in this war? I never knew that. Richard rubbed his fingertips across the furrows on his brow. Lothane wouldn't tell them what he had done. The wizards conducting the trial were the ones who ordered the creation of the confessors. Magda Cirrus was the first. They knew that they wouldn't be able to torture the truth out of Lothane. They tried. So they took this woman, Magda Cirrus, created the magic of the confessors, and instilled the power in her. She touched Lothane with her power and got the truth out of him. He confessed the extent of what the temple team had done and what he had done. Richard looked away from her green eyes. The wizard who did this to Magda Cirrus, created the confessor's power, was named Merit. The tribunal was so pleased with the results of Merit's conjuring that they commanded an order of confessors to be created, and wizards assigned to safeguard them. Merit became protector to Magda Cirrus, her wizard in return for the life, the duty to which he had condemned her, to which he had condemned all the descendants of confessors to follow. The room fell silent. Kaelin was wearing her confessor's face, the blank expression that showed nothing of her feeling. He didn't need to see an expression on her face to know her feeling. Richard pulled the porridge back and ate some more. It had cooled considerably. Richard, Kaelin finally whispered, if these wizards, with all that power, with all that knowledge, if even they couldn't get into the Temple of the Winds after it sent its warning with the Red Moons, then her voice trailed off. Richard put words to the rest of it. Then how can I hope to? Richard ate lentil porridge as the uncomfortable silence dragged on. Richard, Kalin said in a quiet voice, if we don't get into the temple, then what the Spirit showed me will come to pass. Death will sweep the land. Untold numbers of people will die. Richard nearly leaped to his feet and screamed at her that he knew that. Nearly screamed, asking what she expected him to do. Instead, he swallowed back the screams along with the porridge. I know, he whispered. He went back to eating his porridge in silence. When he had finished and was sure he had composed himself, he went on. One of the temple team, 
a wizard named Ricker made a statement before they executed him. Richard pulled the piece of paper with the translation out of the disorderly stack and read it to her. I can no longer countenance what we do with our gift. We are not the creator, nor are we the keeper. Even a vexatious prostitute has the right to live her life. What was he talking about? Kaelin asked. I think that when the wizards used people, destroyed them to create the things they needed to fight the war, I think they used people who were troublesome for one reason or another, people they didn't mind destroying. I've heard it said that a wizard must use people. I doubt they knew the ghastly origin of the maxim. He saw dismay haunting her eyes. Richard. Do you think, then, from what you've read, that it's hopeless? Do you think we can do nothing, then? Richard didn't know what to say. He reached over and clasped her hand. The temple team, before they were executed, said in their own defense that they hadn't sealed the temple away for good, as they might have easily done, but instead left a way in to answer the call. They said that if the need was truly great enough, it could still be entered. I will get in, Caleb. I swear it. A small measure of relief came briefly to her beautiful eyes, but the haunted look settled back into them. Richard knew what she was thinking. It was the same as he'd wondered himself as he read of the madness that was the war and of what people had done to each other. Kalin, we don't use magic to destroy people for our own purposes. We use it to fight against a cause that murders helpless children. We fight for freedom from terror and killing. A small smile returned as she squeezed his hand. Page 378. They both looked up when they heard a knock on the open door. It was Dreffen. Can I come in? I'm not interrupting anything, am I? No, it's all right, Richard said. Come in. I just wanted you to know that I ordered the carts like you wanted. It's gotten to that point. Richard rubbed his fingertips across his forehead. How many? A little over 300 last night, if the reports are all in. As you suspected might be the case, the people can't handle that many dead anymore, and the numbers grow each day. Richard nodded. We can't let the dead wait. It could spread the plague even faster to have them rotting in the open air. They have to be buried as soon as they die. Tell the men I want the dead cart sent out just as soon as they have it organized. I give them until sunset. I already told them. As you say, we can't allow bodies infected with the plague to go untended. It could make the plague worse. It can get worse, Richard mocked. Dreffen didn't answer. I'm sorry, Richard said. That wasn't called for. Have you found anything that is of any use? Dreffen tugged down the sleeves of his white shirt. Richard, there is no cure for the plague. At least I know of none. The only hope is to stay healthy. Speaking of which, it isn't healthy to sit in here all day and most of the night. You aren't getting enough sleep again. I can see it in your eyes. I've warned you about that before. And you need to walk around, get some air. Richard was sick of trying to translate the book and sick of the things he found out when he succeeded. He flipped it closed and pushed back his chair. This is doing no good anyway. Let's go for that walk you suggested. Richard yawned as he stretched. And what have you been doing to keep busy, he asked Kalen, while I've been shut up in this stuffy room. Kalen cast a furtive glance at Dreffen. I... I've been helping Dreffen and Nadine. Helping them? Helping them do what? Dreffen smoothed the ruffles on the front of his shirt. Kalin has been helping with the staff. Some of them are ill. Richard looked from Kalin's eyes to Dreffen's. The plague is in the palace? I'm afraid so. Sixteen of them have come down sick. A few are common illnesses. The rest... Richard heaved a weary sigh. I see. Raina was standing guard outside his room. She straightened when Richard came through the door. Raina, we're going for a walk. I suppose you'd better come along, or I'll never hear the end of it from Kara. Raina smiled as she brushed back a wisp of dark hair. She knew he was right and was obviously glad he was cooperating. Lord Rall, Raina said, I didn't want to disturb you while you were working, but the captain of the city guard came by with a report. I know, I heard. Three hundred people died last night. Raina's leather creaked as she shifted her weight. That too, but they wanted me to tell you that they found another woman last night. She was cut up like the other four. Richard closed his eyes as he wiped a hand across his mouth. He noticed that he hadn't remembered to shave that day. Dear spirits. 
Don't we have enough people dying without some madman going around killing more of them? Was this one a prostitute like the others? Dreffen asked. The captain said he wasn't positive, but he was pretty sure she was. Dreffen shook his head with disgust. You'd think he'd be worried about the plague, if not getting caught. The plague is running wild among the prostitutes, more so than among the populace at large. Richard caught sight of Berdine coming up the hall. As much as I'd like to do something about it, we have bigger worries. He turned to Raina. When we get back, tell the captain that I want his men to spread the word among those women that there's a killer among them, and that for their own safety, we hope they will cease their profession, at least for the time being. I'm sure the soldiers will know where to find all the prostitutes, he added under his breath. Have them get the word out at once. If these women don't stop selling their bodies, they're likely to find themselves in the company of the wrong customer, their last customer. Richard waited until Berdine reached them. Aren't you supposed to be up in the keep taking your turn guarding the sliff? Richard asked her. Berdine shrugged. I went up there to relieve Kara, but she said she wanted to stay for another watch. Richard raked back his hair. Why would she want to do that? Berdine shrugged again. She didn't say. Kalin took his arm. I think it's the rats. What? I think she's trying to prove something to herself. Kalin hesitated. Kara doesn't like rats. I don't blame her, Raina muttered. Filthy creatures, Dreffen put in. I don't blame her either. If any of you tease her about it, Kalin warned, you will answer to me when Kara's done with you. It's not funny. No one looked in the mood to challenge Kalin, nor were any of them in a mood to see anything as funny. Where are you going? Berdine asked. We're going for a walk, Richard said. You've probably been sitting as much as I have. If you'd like, come along. Nadine came around the corner and caught sight of them just as they started out. What's going on? Nothing, Richard said. How are you doing, Nadine? Nadine smiled. Fine, thank you. I've been busy smoking sick rooms, as Dreffen asked. We were just going out for a walk, Kalin said. You've been working hard, Nadine. Why don't you come along with us? Richard frowned at Kalin. She didn't look back at him. Nadine studied Kalin's eyes for a moment. Sure, I'd like that. The six of them made their way through the marble halls, past imposing tapestries and elegant furniture, and across sumptuous carpets on their way toward the main palace gates. Soldiers on patrol bowed or clapped fists over heart as the six of them passed. The staff Richard saw going about their business seemed to be in a state of shock. He saw people weeping as they hurried about their tasks. Before they made the door, they encountered Tristan Bashkar. Richard was in no mood to speak with the Jarian ambassador. Tristan sauntered to a halt before them. There would be no avoiding him this time. Tristan bowed his head. Mother Confessor, Lord Rall, I'm glad I ran into you. What do you want, Tristan? Kalin asked in a level tone. He watched her cleavage as she spoke. His gaze moved to Richard. I want to know... Richard cut him off. Did you come to offer Jara's surrender? Tristan pulled his coat back and rested his fist on his hip. The time I was allotted is not yet expired. I'm concerned about this plague. You're Lord Rall. You're supposed to be running everything now. I want to know what you're going to do about the plague. Richard restrained himself. What we can. Tristan glanced to Kalin's chest again. Well, I'm sure that you can understand that I need assurance. His gaze returned to Richard. A sly smile spread on his face. After all, how can I, in good conscience, surrender my land to a man overseeing what may prove to be the greatest cataclysm in the history of the Midlands. No offense intended. The sky speaks the truth to me. I'm sure you can understand my position. Richard leaned toward the pompous ambassador. You are rapidly running out of time, ambassador. You had better be prepared to surrender Jara soon, or I will see to it my way. Now, if you'll excuse us, we're going to get some fresh air. It suddenly stinks in here. Tristan Bashkar's expression darkened. When his eyes turned toward Kalin again, Richard yanked the knife from Tristan's belt scabbard before he could so much as blink. Everyone froze. Richard pressed the point to the man's chest. And if I ever again catch your lecherous eyes anywhere on Kalin but her face, I'll cut out your heart. Richard turned and loosed the knife, burying it in a round oak ball atop a nearby newel. The twang echoed through the marble halls. Without waiting for a response, he took Kalin by the arm and marched away, his golden cloak billowing out behind. 
Kalin's face was red. The two moored Sith followed, grinning broadly. Drefin smiled, too, as he followed after. Nadine showed no reaction. Chapter 51 In the distance, a dog barked as Richard led them up the cobbled alley. He brought his escorts to a halt outside the small yard behind the Anderson family's home. The yard was still cluttered with cutoffs, wood scraps, shavings, stickered lumber, and the two carving benches. Richard heard neither the sound of wood being worked nor voices. He swung open the gate and made his way through the clutter. The workshop remained silent. A knock produced no response. Richard pushed open one of the double doors and called out. There was no reply. Clive, Richard called again. Darby, Erling, is anyone home? Old chairs and templates still hung from pegs on the dusty walls, and the cobwebs still hung in all the corners. Upstairs, instead of the aroma of meat pies and boiling turnips, like the last time Richard had been to the Anderson home, there was the heavy stench of death. In one of the chairs he had made sat Clive Anderson. He was dead. In his arms he was holding the stiff corpse of his wife. Richard stood stunned at the sight. Behind, he heard Kalin let out a mournful cry. Drefin went to the bedrooms. After a brief look, he returned and shook his head. Richard stood staring at the dead husband and wife. He tried to imagine Clive's misery as he sat there, sick with the plague, holding his dead wife in his arms, his dreams and hopes dead in his arms. Drefin eased a hand under Richard's arm and pulled him away. Richard, there's nothing to be done. We'd best go and have a dead cart sent. Kaylin pressed her face against his shoulder as she wept. He saw the stricken look on the faces of Berdine and Raina. He saw their fingers find one another and curl together, a furtive, comforting touch. Nadine glanced away from the rest of them. Richard felt sudden sorrow for her. She was alone among them. Thankfully, Drefin rested a comforting hand on her shoulder. The room droned with painful silence. Richard held Kalin to him as they went down the stairs. The others followed behind. When they reached the workshop, he took a breath at last. The stench upstairs had nearly gagged him. Just then, Erling, the grandfather, walked through the door. He started at seeing the six people standing in his workshop. I'm sorry, Erling, Richard said. We didn't mean to invade your home. We came to check. We came... Erling nodded distantly. My boy's dead. Hattie, too. I had to go out. I couldn't carry them by myself. We'll have a cart sent right away. There are some soldiers on the next street over. I'll send them right away to help you. Erling nodded again. That would be kind of you. The rest of them, are they... Erling's bloodshot eyes turned up. My wife, daughter, son, his wife, Darby, and little Lily, all dead. His mouth worked as his eyes watered up. Beth, she recovered. Got well again, she did. I couldn't care for her. I just now took her to Hattie's sister. So far, their home is still sound. Richard laid a hand gently on Erling's arm. I'm so sorry. Dear spirits, I'm so sorry. Erling nodded. Thank you. He cleared his throat. Long as I've lived, you'd think it would be me, not the young'uns. The spirits weren't fair in this. Not fair at all. I know, Richard said. They're at a place of peace now. We all go there sooner or later. They'll be with you again. Out in the alley, after they had made sure that Erling didn't need anything, they all paused to gather their wits. Raina, Richard said, please run over to the next street where we saw those soldiers. Get them over here right now. Tell them to get those bodies out of there for Erling. Of course, she said, before dashing away. Her dark braid flew behind as she ran. I don't know what to do, Richard whispered. What do you do for someone who has just lost his whole family? Everyone he loved. I felt a fool. I didn't know what to say. Drefin squeezed Richard's shoulder. You said the right things, Richard. You did. He took comfort in your words, Richard, Nadine said. That was all you could do. All I can do, Richard repeated as he stared off. Kalin squeezed his hand. Berdine's hand touched his. He gripped it. The three of them stood linked in shared sorrow. Richard paced as he waited for Raina to return. The sun was almost down. 
It would be dark before they got back to the palace. The least he could do was wait until Erling had help getting his dead son and daughter-in-law out of the house. Kalin and Berdeen stood close together, leaning against the wall beside the Andersons' yard. Dreffen, hands clasped behind his back, looking to be lost in thought, strolled a ways back down the alley. Nadine went to the other side of the alley alone and leaned against the clabbered wall. Richard paced as he thought about the Temple of the Winds and the magic stolen by Jagang's order. Richard could think of no way to stop this slaughter. When he thought about Tristan Bashkar's eyes on Kalin, Richard's blood boiled. Richard paused. His head came up. Nadine was behind him. He had the oddest sensation. The hair on the back of his neck stiffened. Richard heard the air whine as he spun. The world slowed. Sound dragged. He floated as he moved. The air felt as thick as mud. Everyone seemed a statue in his vision. Time was his. His arms stretched out as he drifted ahead. He commanded the thickness of the air. In the eerie silence, he could hear the feathers singing. He could hear the hiss of blade. Time was his. Nadine's startled blink took forever. He closed his fist. With a slam of sound, the world crashed back with a wild rush. In his fist, Richard held a bolt from a crossbow. The blade wasn't three inches from Nadine's wide eyes. A fraction of a second more and he would have killed her. That fraction of a second had been an hour to him. Richard, Nadine panted. How did you catch that arrow? I hope you can understand that it gives me the creeps, not that I'm complaining, she was quick to add. Dreffen was there, his jaw hanging open. How did you do that, he whispered. I'm a wizard, remember, Richard said as he turned, looking in the direction from which the arrow had come. He thought he saw movement. Kalin clutched a trembling Nadine. Are you all right? Nadine nodded and let out a belated, frightened cry as Kalin pulled her to her in a reassuring embrace. Richard's eyes locked on a movement as his fist snapped the arrow in half. He took off running. Berdine raced after him. Richard turned as he ran. Find some soldiers. I want this whole area closed off. I want him caught. Berdine cut down the street, going after soldiers. Richard ran like the wind on a storm. Rage inundated him. Someone had tried to kill Nadine. In that instant, Nadine wasn't a woman sent by Shota to marry him, a woman who was causing him trouble. In that instant, she was simply an old friend from home. The full fury of the magic took him. Buildings flashed by. Dogs barked as he raced past. People in the alley cried out and dived for safety. A woman screamed as she cowered against a small, crooked storage building. Richard vaulted the low board fence where he had seen the movement. In mid-leap, he drew his sword. The air rang with the unique sound of steel. He rolled as he landed, coming to his feet with the sword in both hands. He found himself face to face with a white goat. There was no man there. A crossbow lay on the ground, between the board fence and a squat goat shed. Richard looked around in all directions. Sheets and shirts hung from lines. A woman, her hair wrapped in a blue scarf, stood on a balcony beyond the flapping laundry. Richard slid his sword back into its scabbard and cupped his hands around his mouth. Did you see a man here? He yelled up at the woman. She lifted her arm, pointing off to her right. I saw someone running that way, she called from the distance. Richard dashed off in the direction the woman had pointed. The alley narrowed. Beyond the tunnel of buildings, the passageway opened onto a street. He looked both ways. He seized the arm of a young woman. A man came through here. Which way did he go? In fright, she tried to pull away, at the same time holding her hat on with her other hand. There be people all about. Which man? Richard released her arm. Up the street to his left, he saw a man writing an overturned hand cart full of fresh greens. The man looked up when Richard skidded to a panting halt before him. What did he look like, the man who ran through here? What did he look like? The man straightened his broad-rimmed hat. Don't know, he pointed. I was looking for a good spot. I heard the sound as my cart fell over. I saw a dark shape running up that way. Richard ran on. The ancient part of the city branched into a warren of alleys, streets, and twisting passageways. Only by keeping track of the golden glow in the western sky could he keep his bearings. That didn't mean, though, that the man he chased had run in a specific direction. He was probably just running, trying to get away. Richard came across a patrol of a dozen soldiers. Before they had time to salute, he was talking. 
A man came running through here somewhere. Did any of you see him? We saw no one running. What did he look like? I don't know. He attacked us with a crossbow and then ran. I want him found. Spread out and start searching. Before they could be on their way, Raina came running up the street with a good fifty men. Did you see where he went? She asked, gasping for breath. No, I lost him in here somewhere. I want all of you to spread out and find him. One of the soldiers, a sergeant, spoke up. Lord Roll, a man who wants to escape would make himself obvious by running. A man with any sense at all would simply round the corner and walk away. The sergeant gestured back up the street to make his point. There were people everywhere going about their business, although a good many were staring at the excitement on their street. Any number of them could have been the man he was chasing. Any idea at all what this assassin looks like? Richard shook his head in frustration. I never got a look at him. He raked back his hair as he caught his breath. Split up. Half of you go back in the direction we came from. Question everyone you can find to see if anyone got a look at him. At a man running. He may be walking now, but until he got somewhere along in here, he was running. Raina, a jeal in hand, took up her defensive position close beside him. The rest of you come with me, Richard said. We'll pick up some more men. I want to keep searching. Maybe we'll come across someone walking, and he'll panic and try to run again. If he does, I want him alive. It was late in the night by the time they returned to the confessor's palace. Soldiers there were already on high alert. Men stood with swords and battle axes to hand, arrows knocked, and spears leveled. Others patrolled the expansive grounds. A mouse wouldn't have escaped their intense scrutiny. As Kalen, Berdine, Raina, Dreffen, and Nadine accompanied him into the gathering hall inside, Richard saw Tristan Bashkar waiting there, hands clasped behind his back as he paced. He halted and looked up when he heard them coming. Richard drifted to a stop as the contrite-looking ambassador approached. Those escorting Richard gathered in a knot behind him, except Kalen, who stood close at his side. With a hand in the air, Tristan hailed them. Lord Rall. May I have a word with you, please? Richard swept his gaze over the man, noticing that he didn't rest his hand on a hip so as to show off his fancy knife. Richard held up a finger. One moment, please. Richard turned a little to the rest of them. It's late. We have a lot of work to do, so I want you to get some rest. Berdine, I want you to go up to the keep and stand guard with Kara tonight. Berdine frowned. Both of us? Richard scowled. Isn't that what I said? Yes, both of you. With this trouble, I don't want to take any chances. I will guard the mother confessor's room, then. Raina said. No, Richard lifted a thumb. I want you guarding Nadine's room. She was the one who was attacked. Yes, Lord Rall. Raina stammered. I'll see to setting up a guard of soldiers outside the mother confessor's room, then. If I wanted soldiers around Kalen's room, I'd have told you so. Now, wouldn't I? Raina's face reddened. I want all the soldiers doing their jobs, patrolling the entrances, the palace grounds, and a perimeter around the grounds. Every one of them. The danger is from out there, not in here. Kalen is perfectly safe inside the palace. I don't want men who should be guarding outside instead sitting on their bottoms around Kalen's room inside. I'll not have it. Do you hear me? But Lord Thorall, don't question me. I'm not in the mood. Kalen touched his arm. Richard, she whispered, are you sure that? Someone tried to kill Nadine. They nearly succeeded. Or did some of you miss the significance of that? I'll not take any more chances. I want her protected, and I don't want to hear any more arguments. Dreffen, I want you to start carrying a sword at once. Healers are a target. Everyone stared at the floor in silence. Good. Richard turned his glare on Tristan. What is it? Tristan spread his hands. Lord Rall, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. I realize I seemed insensitive, but I've been worried about the people here who are sick and dying. It set my nerves on edge. I meant to cause no ill will between us. I hope you will accept my apology. Richard studied Tristan's eyes. Yes, of course. Apology accepted, and I'm sorry that I lost my temper. I too have been out of sorts. Richard put a hand on Nadine's shoulder. Someone tried to kill one of my healers, a person devoted to helping others. People are beginning to blame healers because the plague continues to spread. I can't allow harm to come to people who are only trying their best to help. Yes, of course. You are most kind to accept my apology. 
Thank you, Lord Rahl. Just don't forget, Ambassador, that your time runs out tomorrow. Tristan bowed. I realize that, and you will know my stand by tomorrow, Lord Rahl. You have my word. Good night, then. Richard rounded on the rest of them. We have a lot of work to do tomorrow. It's very late. As Dreffen is constantly reminding me, we need to get some sleep. You all have your orders. Any questions? Each answered with a silent shake of the head. Two hours after they had returned to the palace, and Richard had sent them all to bed, Kaylin thought she saw something move in her room. The lamp on the far wall was turned down low. The clouds hid the moon, so there was no light coming in the glassed doors to the balcony. The thick carpet silenced the sound of footsteps, if there were any. The weak flame from the lamp was all that betrayed the shape she thought she saw. Another motion came from across the room, a hint of shadowed movement. She hadn't seen a person enter her rooms. It could be nothing other than her imagination. The day had left her in an edgy state. With the next silent step, there was no doubt there was someone in her room. Someone slipped ever closer to her bed. As furtive as the movements were, he had closed the distance in remarkably short order. Kalen didn't move a muscle as she saw the knife glint in the dim lamplight. She held her breath. A powerful arm stabbed hatefully into her bed. The arm rose and fell, stabbing in quick succession. With a finger, Richard pushed on the balcony door. It swung open on silent hinges. Berdine glided across the room the instant Richard gave her a hand signal. When she was in place, he tapped the glass once. Berdine turned up the wick on the lamp. Tristan Bashkar straightened beside Kalin's bed, knife in hand, panting with the effort of what he had just been doing. Toss down the knife, Ambassador, Richard said in a quiet tone. Tristan spun the knife in his fingers, seizing the blade in preparation to throw it. Berdine's Aegeal to the back of his neck dropped him instantly. She pressed the Aegeal down on his shoulder to support herself as she bent and picked up the knife. Tristan howled in pain. Berdine straightened, coming up with three knives. You were right, Richard, Greffin said from behind. I can't believe it, Nadine said as she stepped up into the lamplight. Believe it, General Curson said, as he too came in from the balcony. I'd say Tristan Bashkar has nullified his immunity as a diplomat. Richard put two fingers between his lips and whistled. Raina charged through the door ahead of a large contingent of Daharan soldiers bristling steel. Two of them lit more lamps. Richard hooked his thumbs behind his belt as he stood beside Kalin, a towering black form defined with gold trim on his tunic and silver ornaments, buckles, and wristbands, watching the soldiers haul Tristan to his feet. You were right, Richard, she said. He attacked Nadine to draw the guard off me. It was me he was after all along. For a while, she had thought he had lost his mind. His performance had convinced everyone, including Tristan. Thanks for believing me, Richard whispered. When he had first told her what he was doing, Kalin had suspected that Richard had accused Tristan because of the incident earlier. Kalin had not put words to it, but she had wondered if Richard was simply acting out of jealousy. Since she had told him what Shota said, he had now twice displayed jealousy, something she had never before seen from him. He didn't have any reason to be jealous, but Shota's words played on his mind, casting in doubt. Whenever she looked at Nadine, Kalin understood his feelings. Whenever she saw Nadine so much as standing near him, Kalin felt the hot claws of jealousy rake through her insides. She knew that Shota and the spirit had told her the truth. She knew that she would not have Richard. Her mind tried to put rational thought to it, to tell her that it would work out, that they would be together. But her heart knew better. Richard would marry Nadine. Kalin would marry another man. Richard refused to believe it. At least he said he refused to believe it. She wondered. In her mind's eye, Kalin saw Clive Anderson sitting dead in his chair holding his dead wife. In comparison to the tragedy that had befallen the Anderson family and so many others, what price was an unhappy marriage? Wouldn't it be worth that price if it would stop the appalling suffering and death? Nadine slipped up next to Richard on the other side. Drawing the guard off Kalin or not, I'd have been dead. Thank you, Richard. I've never seen anything like the way you caught that arrow right in front of my face. Richard gave her a quick one-armed hug. Nadine, you've said thank you enough times. 
You'd have done the same for me. Kaylin felt those hot claws again. She suppressed the feeling. As Shota had said, if she loved him, she would want him to have at least the small comfort of it being someone he knew. But what if he had killed me? I mean, if he just wanted to draw the guard away from Kalen, what if he had killed me? What good would that have done him? He knows I have the gift and counted on that. If he had happened to kill you, it might still have worked. Or he could have faked something similar with Drefin, reinforcing our belief that the target was healers and not Kalen. Why didn't he just shoot Kalen with the arrow? Richard watched the one-sided struggle on the other side of Kalen's bed. Because he likes to use that knife of his. He wanted to feel it when he killed her. His words gave Kaylin a chill. She knew Tristan. Richard might be right. Tristan would have gotten pleasure from it. The soldiers wrestled Tristan's arms behind his back as they hauled him to his feet. He was still full of fight, but he was grossly overpowered. More lamps were lit as the room filled with soldiers. Kaylin felt embarrassed to have all those people in her bedroom. She guessed it was because the Mother Confessor's rooms had always been a private sanctuary, a safe place. A man had invaded that sanctuary, a man intent on stabbing her to death. What's this all about? Tristan shouted. Oh, we just thought we'd like to watch a man stabbing a nightdress stuffed with toe, Richard said. General Curzon inspected the prisoner to assure himself that Berdine had found all his weapons. When he was satisfied, he turned to Richard. What would you like done, Lord Rowe? Behead him. Kalen turned in shock. Richard, you can't do that. You saw him. He thought he was killing you. But he didn't. He only stabbed my empty bed. The spirits mark a difference between intent and deed. He tried to kill Nadine, too. I did no such thing, Tristan shouted. That wasn't me. I haven't even left the palace tonight. Richard turned a cold glare on Tristan. You have white hairs on your knees, white goat hairs. You knelt behind that fence while you aimed the crossbow and got the goat hairs on you. Kalen glanced down and saw that Richard was right. You're crazy. I never did. Richard, Kalen said, he didn't kill Nadine either. He may have tried, but he didn't. You can't execute him for intent. Richard closed his fist around the amulet at his chest, the amulet representing the dance with death. No mercy. The general's eyes left Kalen and returned to Richard. Lord Rall? Richard, Kalen insisted. You can't. Richard glared at Tristan. He killed those women. He sliced them up with his fancy knife. You like to cut people, don't you, Tristan? What are you talking about? I never killed anyone, except in war. No, Richard said. And you didn't try to kill Kalen, and you didn't try to kill Nadine, and there aren't white goat hairs on your pants. Tristan's panicked brown eyes turned to Kalen. Mother Confessor, I didn't kill you. I didn't kill her. You said it yourself. The spirits mark a difference between intent and deed. I didn't kill anyone. You can't let him do this. Kalen recalled the whispers about Tristan, the whispers that when he went into battle he drew his knife instead of his sword and that he got sadistic pleasure from cutting people. Those women were killed for sadistic pleasure. What was it you told me, Tristan? That you often had to resort to the charms of coin for the company of a woman? And that if you broke our rules, you would expect to be subjected to our choice of punishment? What about the trial? I've killed no one. Intent is not the same as deed. And what was your intent, Tristan? Richard asked. Why did you intend to kill Kalen? It wasn't because I wanted to. It wasn't for pleasure, as you think. It was to save lives. Richard lifted an eyebrow. Killing to save lives. You've killed people. You don't do it for the pleasure of killing, but to save the lives of innocent people. That's all I'm guilty of, trying to save innocent lives. The Imperial Order sent representatives to the Royal Palace in Sandalar. They told us to join with them or die. Javis Kadar, our star guide, told me I must watch the skies for a sign. When the red moons came and the plague started, I knew what they meant. I was going to kill the Mother Confessor in order to try to gain favor with the Order, so that they wouldn't send the plague to us, too. I was only trying to save my people. Richard's eyes turned to Kalen. How far is Sandalar? A month there and back. Maybe a few days less. Richard looked back at the general. 
Get some officers together to take command of the Jarian forces and capital. Have them take Tristan's head to the royal family and tell them that he was executed for attempting to kill the mother confessor. The officers are to offer Jara surrender to Dahara under the peaceful terms already offered. It's a month there and back. The king himself is to return with the surrender documents. I expect him and the Daharan guard sent to accompany him back here within one month from tomorrow. Tell the king that if they don't surrender, and our men don't return safely, I will personally ride into Sandalar at the head of an army and I will behead every member of the royal family. We will then conquer Jara and occupy the capital. The occupation will not be friendly. General Curson clapped a fist to the chainmail over his heart. It will be as you say, Lord Rall. Richard, Kalin whispered, what if what he says is true, that he didn't kill those women? I could touch him with my confessor's power, and we would know for sure. No, I'll not have you touching him or hearing the things he did to those women. He's a monster. I don't want you to have to touch him. But what if he's telling the truth? What if he didn't kill those women? Richard's fist gripped the amulet at his chest. I'm not having him put to death for the murder of those women. He tried to kill you. I saw it. As far as I'm concerned, the intent is the same as the deed. He is going to pay for the intent the same as he would have paid for the deed. Richard turned a cold, dark glare back to the soldiers. Last night alone, 300 people died of the plague. He would have joined with the murders who caused it. I want the men on their way to Jara first thing in the morning, and I want his head to go with them. You have your orders. Get him out of here. Chapter 52 When she saw Drefin coming from the other direction, Kalin set down the basket of clean bandages and rags she was carrying. Even though Richard had only ordered it as part of his ruse to convince Tristan that his plan was working, Drefin was still wearing a sword. Perhaps it wasn't such a bad idea. Some people were beginning to resent healers because they spoke out against the potions and cures being sold on the streets. She brushed back her hair. How are they? Dreffin sighed as he glanced back up the hall. One died last night. Most are worse. We have six new ones today. Dear spirits, she whispered. What is to happen to us? Dreffin lifted her chin. We will persevere. Kalin nodded. Dreffin... If so many of the staff are coming down sick and so many have died already, what good is this infernal smoke doing? I'm sick of breathing it. The smoke is doing no good for the plague. Kalin blinked up at him. Then why must we keep doing it? Dreffin smiled sadly. The people think it helps keep the plague from being worse. It makes them feel better that we're doing something and that there is hope. If we stop, then they will think there is no hope. Is there? Is there any hope? I don't know, he whispered. Have you heard last night's report yet? He nodded. In the last week, the number of dead has continued to rise. Last night, it was up to over 600. Kalin looked away despondently. I wish we could do something. Shota had told her that a way would come. The spirit had told her that a way would come. She couldn't bear the thought of losing Richard, but she also couldn't bear the thought of all the people who were dying. Well, Dreffin said, I'm going to make my rounds through the city. Kalin clasped his forearm. He flinched. It was a reaction that she, as a confessor, was used to. She took her hand back. I know you can do nothing to stop it, but thank you for all your aid anyway. Just your words help those living to have hope. A healer's best aid, words. Most of the time it's all we can do to help. Most people think being a healer means healing people. That actually happens rarely. I learned a long time ago that being a healer means living with pain and suffering. How's Richard? Have you seen him this morning? He's in his office. He looked fine. I made him get some sleep. Good. He needed rest. Dreffin's blue eyes searched hers. He did what he had to do with that man who tried to kill you. But I know that despite how resolute he appeared, it was a terribly hard thing for him to do. Killing a man, even one who richly deserves it, is not something that comes easily to Richard. I know, Kalin said. I know that condemning a man to death weighs heavily on him. I myself have had to order the deaths of people. 
In a time of peace you have the luxury of order, but in war you must act. Hesitation is death. And have you told that to Richard? Kalin smiled. Of course I have. He knows he did what he had to, and that those of us close to him understand. In his place, I would have done the same, and I told him so. Someday, I hope to have a woman of half your strength, Drefin smiled. To say nothing of your beauty, well, I must be off. Kalin watched him walk away. His trousers were still too tight. She blushed at the thought and turned back to her work. Nadine was in the sick room, tending to people in two rows of beds. The infirmary held twenty beds, and they were all full, with more people on blankets on the floor. There were others sick in other rooms. Thanks, Nadine said, when Kalin set down the clean things she had brought. Nadine was putting herbs in pots, making teas. Other women who tended the sick were changing sheets, cleaning and wrapping open sores, or serving tea to the patients. Nadine plucked a cloth from the basket, dipped it in a basin of water, wrung it out, and laid it across the forehead of a moaning woman. Nadine patted the woman's shoulder. There you go, dear. How does that feel? The woman managed only a weak smile and nod. Kalin did the same for several more people, dabbing a cool, damp cloth to their sweaty faces, offering soft words of comfort. You could be a healer, Nadine said as she paused beside Kalin. You have a kind touch. That's the only thing I know to do. I couldn't heal anyone. Nadine leaned close. And do you think I am? Kalin glanced around the room. I see what you mean, but at least you have devoted your life to helping people. My life is devoted to duty, to fighting. What do you mean? In the end, I am a warrior. My duty is to hurt people in order to save others. It is left to people like you to heal those remaining when people like me are finished fighting. Nadine stood close to her. Sometimes I wish I was a warrior and could fight to end the suffering so that there wouldn't be so many wounded for the healers to tend to. Kalin finally had to leave the room. She couldn't stand the stink and the smoke was making her sick. Nadine felt the same and went with her. They both slid their backs down the wall and sat on the floor. I feel helpless, Nadine said. Back home, if someone had a headache, I'd give him something and he'd get to feeling better. If a woman was pregnant, I'd help settle her stomach, or I'd help deliver the baby when it was time. It seemed I was always helping people. This is different. All I do is comfort people who are going to die and wonder the whole time if it will be me on the bed tomorrow. I don't know what to do for any of them. I feel totally useless. I wish I'd come here to help these people instead of watching them die. I know, Kalen whispered. It must have been a lot more satisfying to help a woman deliver a baby. Nadine stared off in thought. Sometimes a woman would tell me that it seemed like it would never happen, that it seemed unreal. She'd wait, knowing it would happen but never really believing it, dreading the things she'd heard about how hard it would be, dreading the pain. Sometimes they think things will change, like they'll wake up one day and not be pregnant or something. Then the baby would come. Suddenly she'll be in a panic. The time has come. She'll be terrified that it's really happening at last. Sometimes they'll scream just from that fear, the fear of the pain. That's when I can help them. I'm there with them. I reassure them that it will be all right. For the first time for some of them, they finally believe it's happening. I guess it's only natural to dread such a profound change in their lives. Until it's over, until the day is upon them, some of them are miserable with dread. Together in the silence of the hall, they sat, resting listening to the moans from the sick room. Nadine, you still think you will end up marrying Richard, don't you? Nadine glanced over, scratching her freckled nose, but she didn't answer. I didn't ask that to, to start in on you or anything. I just meant, well, like you said, you might end up on one of those beds in there. I was just thinking, it could be me, too. I could get the plague or something. Nadine watched her. You won't. Don't say that. You won't get it. Kaylin ran her thumbnail along a joint in the floorboards. But I could. I was just thinking that if I did, or something, well, what about Richard? He'd be alone. What are you saying? Kaylin looked into Nadine's soft brown eyes. If for some reason you ended up being the one with him instead of me, you'd be good to him, wouldn't you? You'd always be good to him? Nadine swallowed. 
Of course I would. I'm serious, Nadine. There's so much happening. I want to know that you wouldn't ever hurt him. I'd never hurt Richard. You hurt him before. Nadine turned away and scratched her shoulder. That was different. I was trying to win him. I would have done anything to get him to be with me. I already explained it to you. I know. Kalen picked at a little stone stuck in the crack between the floorboards. But if something happened, and it turned out that you were the one, the one to marry him, I want to know that you'd never do anything like that to him again. I'd like to hear it from you, that you would never do anything to hurt Richard. Anything. Nadine met Kalen's eyes for a moment before glancing away. If I ever ended up with Richard, I would make him the happiest man in the world. I'd take the best care of him that any woman ever took of any man. I would love him better than... Well, I'd do my very best to make him happy. Kaylin felt the familiar pain gnaw at her insides. She endured it. Do you swear that that's the truth? Yes. Kaylin looked away and wiped at her eyes. Thanks, Nadine. That's what I wanted to know. Why are you asking me such a thing? Kaylin cleared her throat. As I said, I'm worried that I might get the plague, too. If anything happens, I could bear it better if I knew that there was someone who would take care of Richard. Near as I can figure, Richard pretty much takes care of himself. Do you know that that man can cook better than me? Kalen laughed. Nadine laughed with her. Isn't that the truth, Kalen said. I guess where Richard is concerned, a woman can only hope to go along with him for the ride. Lord Rawl! Richard turned to see General Curzon calling out for him. He let go of Kalen's hand. Kara glided to a stop behind Kalen. Yes, what is it, General? The General came to a halt, waving a letter. A dusty, tired-looking soldier followed behind, along with the General's usual guard. A message from General Rybish with his army to the south. The General lifted a thumb. Grissom here just rode in. Richard glanced at the young soldier, still panting to get his breath. He smelled like a horse. Richard thought he would much rather smell like a horse and be out riding than sitting in a little room day after day translating the mad account of a trial and execution. He guessed that if his labors were doing him any good, he might feel differently. He broke the seal and opened the letter. When he finished reading it, he handed the letter to Kalen. Take a look. While Kalen read the letter, Richard turned to the messenger. How is our army to the south doing? Fine when I left him, Lord Rawl. Grissom said. The Sisters of the Light caught up with us, as they said you told them to do. They're all together with our men. We're awaiting orders. The letter had said much the same thing. When Kalen had finished reading, Richard took the letter and handed it to General Curson. The general idly scratched his graying hair as he read the letter. He looked up when he had finished. What do you think, Lord Rowe? Makes sense to me. I don't think we should bring all those men back up north right now. As General Rybish says, they would be in a position to know about it if the order moves very far into the New World. What do you think? Richard asked as he passed the letter back to Kara. The General hiked up his trousers. I agree with Rybish. I'd want to do the same if I were him. He's already down there. Why not put him to good use? As he says, it would be best to know what the order is up to. And if the enemy does come up north to attack us, he will be in a position to bite their ass. He winced. Sorry, Mother Confessor. Kalen smiled. My father was a warrior general before he was king. It brings back memories. She didn't say if they were good memories. I also agree about the strategic advantage of having an army in that position. Kara handed the letter back to Richard. He's right about one other thing, too. If he abandons his position and the order went to the northeast, they would be able to sweep into Dahara unopposed. We wouldn't even know about it. That part of the Hara is sparsely populated. The order could drive north, and we would never know it until they cut west back into the Midlands. Unless they push straight for the People's Palace, the general said. That would be a fateful mistake, attacking the heart of the Hara, Kara said. Commander General Trimac of the first file of the palace guard would show the enemy why no army has ever attacked the palace and had so much as a single soldier live to recount the tale of their bloody defeat. The cavalry would cut them to pieces out on the Azrith Plains. She's right, the general said. If the enemy goes there, the vultures will feast. Tremac will see to that. 
If they did go northeast up into Dahara, it would be to flank us. Best to have Rybish guarding the gate. Richard had another reason to want General Rybish's army to stay south. Lord Rawl, the messenger asked, may I ask a question? Of course, what is it? Grissom fussed with the hilt of his short sword. What's going on in the city? I mean, I saw men holding carts with dead people, and I saw others going through the streets calling for people to bring out their dead. Richard took a deep breath. That's the other reason we want General Rybish to stay down south. The plague is loose in the Midlands. Last night, 750 people died. The spirits preserve us. Grissom wiped his palms on his hips. I was afraid it might be something like that. I want you to take my reply back to General Rybish. Having been here, I don't want you to carry the plague to him, too. When you get back, you are to pass my message along verbally. Don't approach any of his men, or any people for that matter, any closer than you must in order to be heard. When you get to their sentries, tell them to pass the message on to the general. Tell him that I find his reasoning to be sound. All of the command here agrees with him. Tell him to carry on with his plans and to keep us informed. Now that you've been here, you can't return to those men. You'll have to come back here when you've delivered the message. I want you to take a good-sized patrol with you to make sure you get our instructions through. Then all of you come back here. Grissom saluted with a fist to his heart. It shall be as you command, Lord Rall. I wish I could let you return to your men, soldier, but we're trying to keep the plague from getting to the army. We have the soldiers here spread out around the city so they don't come down sick. You can tell them that, too. General Curson scratched his face. Ah, uh, Lord Rall, I have to talk to you about that. I just found out myself. Richard frowned at the general's sudden wincing expression. What is it? Ah, uh, well, the plague has gotten to our men. Richard felt his heart in his throat. Which group? The general wiped a hand across his mouth. All of them, Lord Rall. Seems that the prostitutes have been visiting the camps. The women thought it would be safer than plying their trade in the city, what with those murders. I don't know anything about how sickness spreads, but Dreffen told me that that might have been the way it happened. Richard squeezed his temples between his thumb and second finger. He wanted to give up. He wanted to simply sit down on the floor and give up. I should never have had Tristan Bashkar put to death. I should have let him kill all those women. In the end, it would have saved countless lives. If I'd have known this, I'd have killed them all myself. He felt Kalin's hand touch his back in sympathy. Dear spirits, he whispered. He could think of nothing else to say. Dear spirits, what are we doing to ourselves? Those women have just unwittingly struck a blow for Jagang. Do you want them executed, Lord Rall? General Curson asked. No, Richard said in a quiet voice. The deed is done. It would serve no purpose now. They didn't do it intentionally to cause harm. They were just trying to keep themselves safe. Richard recalled the words of one of the temple team before he was put to death. I can no longer countenance what we do with our gift. We are not the creator, nor are we the keeper. Even a vexatious prostitute has the right to live her life. Grissom, get a patrol together, and as soon as you've had some food and rest, get my message back to General Rybish. Grissom saluted again. Yes, Lord Rall. I'll get some food and supplies, and be on my way within the hour. Richard nodded. The messenger took his leave. Lord Rall, the general said. If there's nothing else, I'd better see to my duties. Yes, General, there is one more thing. Cut the six soldiers out of the camps. Put them in a separate camp. Let's see if we can limit the extent of the outbreak. Who knows? Maybe we can even contain it. And I don't want any prostitutes in the camps. None. Maybe we can keep the distemper lighter that way. Have all the women warned to stay away under penalty of death. Post archers with the sentries. If they continue to approach after being challenged, have the archers cut them down. The general heaved a sigh. I understand, Lord Rall. I'll also separate out the men who have been with those women and have them tend to the Sikh soldiers. Good idea. Richard put his arm around Kalin's waist as he watched the general and his guard hurry to their tasks. Why didn't I think of that before? I might have kept the plague from the soldiers if only I'd thought of it. Kalin didn't have an answer. 
Lord Rahl, Kara said, I'm going up to this lift to relieve Berdine. I'll go with you. I want to see if Berdine has learned anything from the journal. Besides, I need to get out of here for a while. You want to go too? He asked Kaylin. Her arm tightened around him. I'd like that. Berdine was bent over the journal reading. The sliff looked Richard's way before Berdine did. Do you wish to travel, master? You will be pleased. No, Richard said when the echo of the eerie voice had died out. Thank you, Sliff, but not now. Berdine leaned back and yawned as she stretched her arms. Glad to see you, Kara. I can't stay awake any longer. You look like you could use some sleep. Richard gestured to the open journal on the table before her. Anything new? Berdine glanced to the Sliff as she stood. She picked up the journal and turned it around, offering it to him. She leaned closer and lowered her voice. You remember telling me about what that man said before he was put to death? What he said about even a vexatious woman having a right to her life? Richard knew what Berdine was talking about. Yes. You mean Wizard Ricker? That's the one. Well, Colo mentioned it briefly. She tapped a place in the journal. Read here. Richard studied the sentence a moment until he had it translated in his head. Ricker's vexatious prostitute is watching me as I sit here pondering what damage the team has done. I heard today that we have lost Lothane. Ricker has had his revenge. Do you know who Lothane is? Berdine asked. He was the head prosecutor at the Temple of the Winds trial. He was the one who went to undo the damage done by the team. Richard looked up. The sliff was watching him. He stepped closer. It had never occurred to him before. Why hadn't he thought of it before? Sliff? Yes, master. You wish to travel? Come, you will be pleased. Richard stepped closer. No, I don't wish to travel, but I would like to talk to you. Do you remember the time, long ago, when there was a great war going on? Long? I am long enough to travel. Tell me where you wish to go. You will be pleased. No, I don't mean traveling. Do you remember any names? Names? Names. Do you remember the name Ricker? The silver face watched without expression. I never betray my clients. Sliff, you were a person once, weren't you? A person like me? The Sliff smiled. No. Richard laid a hand on Kalen's shoulder. A person like this? The silver smile widened. Yes, I was a whore like her. Kalen cleared her throat. I think Richard meant to ask if you were a woman, Sliff. Yes, I was a woman, too. What was your name, Richard asked. Name? The Sliff frowned as if puzzled. I am the Sliff. Who made you into the Sliff? Some of my clients. Why? Why did they make you into the Sliff? Because I never reveal my clients. Sliff, could you explain that better? Some of the wizards here in this place were my clients, the most powerful of them. I was a very exclusive whore and very expensive. Many of the wizards contended for power. Others tried to use me to displace some of those who were my clients. Some wished to use me for their pleasure, but not the kind of pleasure I offered. I never reveal my clients. You mean they would have been pleased if you told them the names of the wizards who visited you, and maybe a little more about those visits? Yes. My clients feared these others would use me for this pleasure, and so they made me the sliff. Richard turned away. He raked his fingers back through his hair. Even as they fought the enemy, they fought among themselves. When he finally gathered his wits, he turned back to the beautiful silver face. Sliff, those men are all dead now. There is no one alive who knows these men. There are no wizards anymore to vie for power. Could you tell me a little more? They made me and told me that I would be unable to speak their names as long as they lived. They said that their power would prevent it. If it is true that their spirits have passed from this world... Then it will no longer matter, and I will be able to speak their names. It was this man, Lothane, 
who was one of your clients, wasn't it? And this other wizard, Ricker, thought he was a hypocrite. Lothane. The quicksilver face softened as she seemed to test the name. Wizard Ricker came to me and said that this man, Lothane, was the head prosecutor and that he was a vile beast who would turn on me. He wanted my help to depose Lothane. I refused to name my clients. Richard spoke into the silence, and Ricker's words proved true. Lothane turned on you and made you into the slip so that you couldn't speak out against him. Yes. I told Lothane that I did not reveal my clients. I told him that he had no need to fear me speaking. He said that it didn't matter, that I was only a whore, and the world would never miss me. He twisted my arm and hurt me. He used me for his pleasure without my permission. When he finished, he laughed, and then I saw a flash of light in my mind. Ricker came to me after and told me that he would put an end to Lothane and wizards like him. He wept at the edge of my well, and said he was sorry for what they did to me. He told me that he would put a stop to the way magic destroyed people. Were you sad? Berdine asked. Was it sad to be made into this leaf? They took sadness from me when they made me. Did they take happiness too? Kalin whispered. They left me with duty. Even in this they had made a mistake. They left some of who the slif had been so that they could use her. The part they left would submit to anyone with the price required. Magic. They had been tripped up by her nature. They used her, but had to guard her because she would offer herself to anyone, even the enemy, who had the required price. Sliff, Richard said. I'm so sorry that we wizards did this to you. They had no right. I'm so sorry. The Sliff smiled. Wizard Ricker told me that if any master said those words to me, I should tell them these words from him. Ward left in. Ward right out. Guard your heart from stone. What does that mean? He did not explain the words to me. Richard felt sick. Were they going to die because of a 3,000-year-old fight for power? Perhaps Jagang was right. Perhaps magic had no place in the world any longer. Richard turned back to the others. Berdine, you need to get some sleep. Raina has to be up early to relieve Kara. She needs to get to bed, too. Set a guard for Kaylin's rooms, and then both of you get some rest. I've had enough of this day, too. Richard was in a dead sleep when he awakened to a hand pushing at him. He sat up and rubbed at his eyes, trying to gather his senses in a panic. What? What is it? His voice sounded to him like gravel being poured from a bucket. Lord Rall? came a tearful voice. Are you awake? Richard squinted up at the figure holding a lamp. At first, he couldn't make out who it was. Berdine? He had never seen her in anything but her leather uniform before. She was standing in his room in a white nightdress. Her hair was down. He had never seen Berdine without her hair in the single braid. It was a disorienting sight. Richard swung his legs over the edge of the bed and pulled his pants on in a rush. Berdine, what is it? What's wrong? She wiped at the tears on her face. Lord Rahal, please come, she let out a sob. Raina is sick. Chapter 53 Verna shut the door as silently as she could after Warren dragged the flailing woman back into the darkness. His hand was clamped just as tightly over her mouth as his web was clamped around her gift. Verna wouldn't have been able to control the woman's magic as well as could Warren. The gift of a wizard was stronger than a sorceress's, even Verna's gift. Verna lit a small flame above her upturned palm. The woman's eyes widened and then filled with tears. Yes, Janet, it's me, Verna. If you promise not to cry out and betray us, I will have Warren release you. Janet nodded earnestly. Verna gripped her dacra in her other fist, held out of sight, just in case she was wrong. She gave a nod to Warren, signaling him to release the young woman. When she was free, Janet flung her arms around Verna's neck, she rejoiced with a soft sob. Warren held up his palm, letting a small flame dance above it so they could see. The tiny room was made of huge blocks of dark stone, as was the rest of the stronghold. Milky water seeped through some of the joints, leaving trails of crusty stains down the walls. Oh, Verna, Janet whispered. 
You have no idea what a joy it is to see your face. Verna embraced the trembling woman as she wept softly while clutching at Verna's cloak. Verna still had the dakra in her fist, behind Janet's back. Verna eased her away to smile at the tear-stained face. She wiped away some of the tears and smoothed back Janet's dark locks. Janet kissed her ring finger, an ancient gesture beseeching the Creator's protection. Even though she had been reasonably sure Janet was loyal to the light, Verna was relieved to see such confirmation. A sister of the dark was sworn to the keeper of the underworld and would never kiss her ring finger. It was an act that represented a sister's symbolic betrothal to the Creator. It was the one thing that a sister of the dark could not do. A sister of the dark could not hide her loyalty to her true master, the Keeper, by kissing her ring finger, for kissing that finger would invoke her dark master's wrath. Verna slipped the dakra back up her sleeve as Janet glanced back at Warren. They exchanged smiles. Both Verna and Warren took in Janet's bizarre garb. She was barefoot. The baggy garment cinched at the waist with a white cord covered her from ankles to neck to wrists, but was so sheer that the woman might as well have been naked. Between a thumb and finger, Verna tugged out some of the diaphanous material. What in the name of creation are you doing wearing this? Janet glanced down at herself. Jagang makes all his slaves dress like this. After a while, you don't even notice anymore. I see. Verna could see that Warren was doing his best to avert his eyes. Verna, what are you doing here? Janet asked in a demure voice. Verna grinned and pinched Janet's cheek. I came to get you out of here, silly. I came to rescue you. We're friends. Did you think I'd leave you here? Janet blinked in astonishment. The prelate let you come after me? Verna lifted her hand, showing the woman the sunburst patterned ring of the prelate. I am the prelate. Janet's jaw fell open. She dropped to the floor and began kissing the hem of Verna's dress. Verna gripped Janet's shoulder and urged her to her feet. Stop that. There's no time for that. But, but how? What happened? How can this be? What has happened? Verna, those webs won't hold for long, Warren cautioned in a thin whisper. We've already overstayed our welcome. Janet, listen to me. We can talk later, after we get you out of here. The things we had to do to get in here only give us a brief time to get back out. It's dangerous for us to be here. I should say so, Janet said. Prelate, you must... Verna, we're friends. It's still Verna. Verna, how in creation did you ever get into Jagang's stronghold? You must get out at once. If you are found... Verna frowned and touched the ring through Janet's lower lip. What's this? Janet paled. It marks me as one of Jagang's slaves. She started shivering. Verna, save yourself. Get out of here. You must get out, she whispered urgently. I agree, Warren whispered through gritted teeth. Let's go. Verna pushed her cloak back over her shoulders out of the way. I know. Now that we've got you, we can go. Dear Creator, you have no idea how much I'd like to go with you, but if I did, you can't imagine what Jagang would do to me. Oh, dear Creator, you can't imagine. Her eyes flooded with tears at the very thought. Verna embraced her for a moment. Janet, listen to me. I'm your friend. You know I wouldn't lie to you. She waited until the other nodded. There is a way to keep the Dreamwalker from your mind. Janet clutched Verna's dress at the shoulders. Verna, don't torment me with hope that I know is false. You have no idea how much I'd like to believe you, but I know it's true. Listen to me, Janet. I'm the prelate now. Don't you think Jagang would take me if he could? Why do you think he hasn't taken the others? He can't, that's why. Janet was shivering again, tears running down her cheeks. Warren put a hand to her back. What Verna says is true, Sister Janet. Jagang can't get into our minds. Come with us and you will be safe. Hurry. How? Janet whispered. Verna leaned close. You remember Richard? Of course. Trouble and wonder in one person. Verna smiled at the truth of that. He has the gift. That's why I went after him, but there is more to it. He is born with both sides of it. More than that, though, he is a Rall. Three thousand years ago in the Great War, Richard's ancestor created a magic to block the Dreamwalkers of that time from his people's minds. That magic was passed down to his descendants who have the gift. Janet's fist tightened on Verna's dress. How? How does it work? Verna smiled. 
It's so simple that it's hard to believe. The most powerful magic is sometimes like that. All that is necessary is to be sworn to him in your heart and his magic protects you from the dreamwalker. As long as Richard is alive and in this world, Jagang will never again be able to enter your mind. I swear allegiance to Richard and I'm free of Jagang? Verna nodded at the woman's stunned face. It's true. What do I have to do? Verna held up a finger to forestall Warren's objections. She went to her knees, pulling Janet down with her. Say the words with me and mean them in your heart. Richard is a war wizard and leads us in our fight against your gang. We believe in him, in his heart, with all our hearts. Say the words with me and believe and you will be free. Janet nodded as she clasped her hands prayerfully. Tears coursed down her cheeks. Verna whispered the devotion, pausing so Janet could repeat the words after her. Master Rall, guide us. Master Rall, teach us. Master Rall, protect us. In your light we thrive, in your mercy we are sheltered, in your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve, our lives are yours. Janet's whispered words echoed Verna's until she was finished. Verna kissed Janet's cheek. You are free, my friend. Now hurry, let's get out of here. Janet snatched Verna's sleeve. What about the others? Verna hesitated. Janet, I would like nothing better than to rescue the rest of our sisters too, but I can't, not now. We will try to get them later. If we try now, Jagang will have us. I came to get you because you are my friend and I love you. The five of us all swore to always protect each other. Phoebe is with us already. There is only you left. As much as I want to rescue the rest of our sisters, it must be left until later. I promise you, I won't forget them or leave them, but we can't do it all now, all at once. Janet's head lowered and she stared at the floor. Jagang killed Christabel. I saw him do it. Her screams still haunt my nightmares. Her screams and Jagang. Verna felt as if she had been punched in the gut. Christabel had been her best friend. She didn't want to know the details. Christabel had turned to the keeper. That's why I have to get you out of here, Janet. My fear for you and for what Jagang has done to you haunts my nightmares. Janet's head came up. What about Amelia? She was one of us five. We can't leave her. Verna gave Janet a level look. Amelia is a sister of the dark. Was, Janet said. No longer. What? Verna whispered. Warren leaned over. Once you're sworn to the keeper, you can't change your mind. You can't trust what she says, Sister Janet. Now let's get out of here. She's sworn to the keeper. Janet shook her head. No longer. Jagang sent her on some sort of mission involving magic, and in order to accomplish her task, she was forced to betray the keeper. Impossible, Verna said. True, Janet insisted. She's back. She has re-sworn her oath to the Creator. I've talked to her. She sits and weeps, kissing her ring finger half the night, praying to the Creator. Verna leaned closer, looking into Janet's eyes. Janet, listen to me. Have you seen her kiss her ring finger? Have you seen it with your own eyes? Are you absolutely sure she wasn't kissing another finger? I've sat with her trying to comfort her. I've watched her. Janet kissed her own finger with a whispered supplication that if she wasn't telling the truth, she would be struck dead. Just like that. She kisses her finger just like that? Yes. She kisses her finger and cries and prays that the Creator will kill her for the horror of what she has done. What has she done? I don't know. When I ask, she practically goes crazy with screaming and weeping. Jagang won't let her kill herself. He has control of her mind, as he does with the rest of us. He wouldn't let any of us kill ourselves. We must continue to serve him. Verna, we can't leave Amelia here. We have to take her with us. I won't leave her here. I'm the only comfort she has in this world. The things Jagang does to her... Verna turned away. Her stomach roiled at the thought of leaving Amelia, if indeed she had abandoned the keeper. The five of them had been best friends for close to 150 years, since they were young novices. The life of a sister of the light was a difficult one. They had sworn oaths always to protect one another. Verna, she is one of us, a sister of the light again. She is one of us five. Please, Verna, I'd rather stay with her than leave her here alone. Verna glanced back to Janet's haunted eyes. Verna, we must call him Excellency. Janet said in a shuddering whisper. If we displease him for any reason at all, we have to serve a week in the tents. 
Warren spoke Verna's name with rising inflection. Verna waved him to silence. The tents? What are you saying? Janet's eyes flooded with tears again. He gives us to his soldiers for a week. We have gold rings so they won't kill us, because those with gold rings belong to Jagang, but they can do whatever else they want. They pass us from tent to tent for a week. Even the old sisters are sent to the tents. Jagang calls it a lesson in discipline that all must learn. Janet fell to her knees, convulsing in sobs, as she covered her mouth with both hands. Verna sank down beside her and hugged her. You don't know what Jagang's men do to us, Janet cried. You don't know, Verna. I understand, Verna whispered. Hush now. It's all right now. We'll get you away from here. Janet shook her head against Verna's shoulder. I won't leave Amelia here. I'm all she has. I'm a sister of the light. The Creator would never forgive me if I abandoned her. If I leave her, I'd be leaving my duty to the Creator. She's my friend. She came back to the light. She came back to the Creator. Jigang sent her to the tents again. If I'm not here when she comes back, she'll go crazy. No one else will tend to her. The sisters of the dark won't go near her, and the sisters of the light won't forgive her. I'm her only friend. I'm the only one who forgave her and accepted her back to the light. She'll be a bloody mess when she gets back. You don't know what Jagang's men are like. Except for broken bones, Jagang won't allow us to use the gift to heal one another when we come back from the tents. He says it's part of the lesson, that our souls may belong to the Creator when we die, but in this life, Jagang owns our bodies. We can have our broken bones knitted by the gift when we come back, but until then we have to suffer the agony of that along with everything else. If I'm not here, no one else will heal that much for her or comfort her. Janet was nearly hysterical. I won't leave without Amelia. Verna felt dizzy and sick to her stomach. Her heart pounded in terror. Bile rose into her throat. Verna's voice broke. How do you endure it? Janet held her fists to her heart. We are sisters of the light. We must endure for the Creator. Verna shared a long look with Warren's troubled eyes. Do you know where we can find her? Maybe we could go find her and take her with us. Janet shook her head. We're passed among the tents. She could be anywhere. The army is spread out for miles and miles in every direction. Not long ago, more captured women were sent back here. The screams are everywhere, so you can't simply follow the sounds of screams. Besides, if we went out among the tents, we wouldn't last five minutes before we were dragged into one of them. How long? Verna asked. How long until Amelia is back? Five days? But she won't be able to walk for at least a day after that, maybe two. Verna held a tight grip on her rage. There's nothing saying I can't use my gift to cure her once she's back. Janet looked up. That's true. Five days then. Tomorrow night is the full moon. The fourth day after the full moon. Are you able to leave this place in order to meet us? I don't think we can get back in here again. Not very far. I can't even imagine how you could have gotten in here. Verna showed the woman a tight smile. I'm not prelate for nothing. Warren helped too. We'll come back four nights after the full moon. Verna, there's one other thing. If Jagang can't enter my dreams, he will know something is wrong. Verna pressed her hands to her face. But you've already given the oath. You can't take it back, or it would mean nothing. You have already given your heart to Richard. Then I'll have to be careful. Can you do that? Can you get away with it? Janet touched her fingers to her lips. What choice do I have? I'll have to. Verna held out her dakra. Here, at least you can protect yourself. Janet pushed it away as if it were poison. If I was caught with that thing, I'd be sent out to the tents for a year. Well, at least you can use your gift, now that Jagang can't enter your mind to prevent it. It won't do any good here. Jagang has total control over all those with the gift who are here, sisters and wizards. It would be spitting into a storm to try to use my gift against them. I know. That's why we can't try to take the others right now. We'd never make it. The Sisters of the Dark would fight us, and with their use of subtractive magic, they would cut us to pieces. Verna pressed her lips together. Janet, are you sure about this? If I don't help a sister in dire need, then what good is my oath as a Sister of the Light? One has come back to us from the Keeper. Perhaps she can teach us how to bring the others back. Verna had never thought of that. 
Warren was making impatient eye signals. She could see the muscles in his jaw flexing. Janet saw too. She gripped Verna by the shoulders and kissed her cheeks. She turned and hugged Warren. Please, Verna, get out of here before it's too late. I'll be able to endure five days. I know how to bow and scrape for Jagang. He's been busy. Maybe I can stay out of his sight for that long. All right. Where? We came down the coast to Graffin Harbor, and I don't know the lay of the land. The coast? Then you would have passed the watch house near the docks. Yes, I saw the place, but it had guards in it. Janet leaned close. As you said, there's nothing stopping you from using your gift. The guard changes around sundown. Wait until you see the guard change, and then silence them. That will give you a safe place to wait until nearly dawn. Sometime in the night, I will be there with Amelia. The watch house, then. Fourth night after the full moon. Janet gave her a quick hug. Five nights and we're free. Hurry, get out of here. Warren snatched Verna's arm and pulled her through the door. Chapter 54 Soon after he awoke, just before dawn, Richard stood outside his bedroom, reading the morning report. For the first time, the number of dead in one night had climbed over 1,000. A thousand tragedies in one night. Ulick, standing not far away with his massive arms folded, asked the number. A rare event, Ulick asking a question. Richard couldn't speak. He handed the report to his bodyguard. Ulick sighed heavily when he read the number. The city was in shambles. Trade had been disrupted to the point that food was getting scarce. Firewood used for both heat and cooking was hard to come by. Services of every kind were difficult to secure, either because people were afraid to bring their wares into the city, they had abandoned their homes and fled the city, or they were dead. Only the cures in the streets were in abundance. Richard paused beside a long tapestry of a city market scene as he was headed for his office. His shadow glided to a silent halt behind him. The thought of going back to translating the book made him nauseous. He was finding nothing new anyway. He was mired in a long report on an inquiry into the dealings Wizard Ricker had had with a people called the Andolians. It was boring and made little sense to him. Richard couldn't face the book again this early in the day. Besides, he was worried sick about Raina. In the last week, she had only gotten worse. Nothing could be done for her, any more than anything could be done for the thousand people who had died the night before. Shota had told Kalin that the Temple of the Winds would send another message would send a way to get in. The spirit had told her the same thing. Why hadn't it come? Would they all be dead before the wind sent word? Richard glanced out an east window and saw the first rays of the morning sun coming from between two mountains. With the gathering clouds he had already seen coming in from the west, he knew that they wouldn't be seeing the full moon that night. He headed for Kalin's room. He had to see her face, see something that could lift his spirits. Ulick took up station beside Egan at the corner of the hall. Egan had been with Kalin's guard the night before. Richard was greeted by Nancy, just coming out the door. Is Kalin up? Nancy pulled the door closed behind herself. She glanced up the hall to see Ulick and Egan. They were too far away to hear. Yes, Lord Rahl. She is just a little slow this morning. She isn't feeling well. Richard gripped the woman's arm. He thought that Kalin had looked out of sorts for the last few days, but she had steadfastly dismissed his concerns. Richard could feel the blood draining from his face. What's wrong? Is she sick? She doesn't... No, no, Nancy insisted, suddenly realizing that she had frightened the wits out of him. Nothing like that. Then what's wrong, Richard pressed. The woman patted her lower belly and leaned close. She let her voice drop to little more than a whisper. It's just her cycle of the moon, that's all. It'll be over in a couple more days. I wouldn't say anything, mind you, but with the plague, I don't want you to worry yourself to death. Just don't tell her I told you or she'll bite off my head. Richard sighed as he smiled with relief. He squeezed Nancy's hand in appreciation. Of course not. Thank you, Nancy. You don't know how much that eases my mind. I couldn't endure it if she... Nancy touched his arm as she gave him a warm smile. I know. That's the only reason I said anything. After Nancy had trundled off down the hall, Richard knocked on the door. Kalin had been just about to open it and was surprised to find him standing there. She smiled up at him. I was wrong. About what? 
You are more handsome than I remembered. Richard grinned. She had lifted his spirits. He gave her a quick kiss when she rose on her toes and puckered her lips. Richard gathered up her hand. I'm on my way to check on Raina. Want to come with me? She nodded, the mirth ghosting away from her face. Berdine met them not far from their room. Her eyes were red and leaden. She wore red leather. Richard didn't ask why. Lord Rall, please. Raina is asking for you. Richard enclosed her shoulders with one arm. We were on our way there. Come on. Richard didn't ask how Berdine was. It was obvious she was sick with worry. Berdine, some people have recovered from the plague. No one is stronger than Raina. She is moored Sith. She will be one of the ones who recovers. Berdine nodded woodenly. Raina was lying on her bed. She was wearing her red leather. Standing in the doorway, Richard leaned toward Berdine and whispered, Why is she dressed? He left the obvious question of why she was wearing her red leather unasked. Berdine clutched his arm. She asked me to dress her in the red leather of a moored Sith, Berdine stifled a wail. For the final battle, Richard sank to his knees beside the bed. Raina's half-open eyes rolled toward him. Sweat ran from her face. Her lower lip quivered. Raina gripped Richard's arm. Lord Rall, please take me out to see Reggie. Reggie? The chipmunks. Please take me out to feed Reggie. He's the one missing the end of his little tail. His heart breaking, he smiled for her. It would be my honor. He scooped her up in his arms. She had lost a lot of weight. She hardly weighed anything. Raina wrapped a weak arm around his neck as she cuddled her head to his shoulder while he carried her through the halls. Berdine walked beside them, holding Raina's other hand. Kalin walked at his other side. Ulick and Egan marched behind. Soldiers along the way silently stepped clear, eyes to the ground, giving a salute of fist to heart as Richard and the procession passed. The salute was for Raina. Outside, Richard sat on the stone court in the light of the dawning sun, holding Raina in his lap. Berdine sat on her heels by her head. Kalin sat on his other side. Ulick and Egan, hands clasped behind their backs, stood not far to the rear. Richard saw a tear or two wend its way down each of their stony faces. Over there, Richard said to Kalin, pointing with his chin. Give me that box. Kalin turned and saw what he meant. He kept seeds in a box under a stone bench. She wiggled off the lid and held out the box. Richard scooped out a handful of seeds and tossed some on the ground before them. He trickled the rest into Raina's bony hand. Age 408 it wasn't long before two chipmunks, tails twitching, scampered across the lawn. Richard had fed them enough so they knew that the appearance of people might mean food. They stuffed seeds in their cheeks as best they could between sudden chattering bouts of trying to chase each other away. Raina watched, her eyes only half opened. Her aegeal dangled from the chain on the wrist of the hand that Berdine held. The two chipmunks, their cheeks full, scurried for their burrows to store their booty. Raina opened her arm out and rested her hand on the paving stone. She uncurled her fingers. Each shallow breath rattled. Berdine tenderly stroked Raina's forehead. Another chipmunk appeared from under a bush. He came partway toward them, froze stiff while he checked for threat, and then dashed the rest of the way. He was missing the end of his tail. Reggie, Raina breathed. Raina smiled as Reggie climbed into her open hand, he sat there, pressing his little feet against her fingers as he popped seeds into his mouth with his tongue. He paused, sitting up in her hand to rearrange the seeds stuffed in his cheeks. Satisfied, he dropped back down, putting his little feet to Raina's fingers again. Raina let out a soft giggle. Berdine kissed her forehead. I love you, Raina, she whispered. I love you, Berdine. Richard felt Raina's muscles go slack as she died in his arms while Reggie sat eating seeds from her hand. Chapter 55 Kalen stood behind Richard as he sat in his chair in his office, her arms circled around his neck, her cheek laid against the top of his head as she wept. Richard rolled Raina's aegeal in his fingers. Berdine said that Raina had wanted him to have it. 
Berdine had asked for permission to go up to the keep to tell Kara. She also asked if she could take her turn at watch over the sliff, as Kara had been up there for the last three days. Richard told her that she could do whatever she wished for as long as she wished, and that if she wanted him to take her watch or to come sit with her, he would. She had said that she wanted to be alone for a while. Why hasn't the temple sent its message? Kalin smoothed his hair. I don't know. What are we going to do, he asked. It wasn't a question for which he expected an answer. I just don't know what to do. Kalin rubbed her palms up and down the sides of his shoulders. Do you think you might find an answer in the trial record? For all I know, it could be the very last line I translate that gives me any information I can use. He slowly shook his head. Long before I can translate every line, we'll all be dead. Richard hooked Raina's Aegeal on the chain along with the amulet at his chest. The red color of the Aegeal matched the ruby. Silence hung in the air for a time before he said, Jagang is going to win. Kalin turned his head toward her. Don't say that. Please don't say that. He forced a smile. You're right. We'll beat him. A knock came to the door. Ulick stuck his head in when Richard called to ask who it was. Lord Rall, General Curson wanted to know if he could talk to you for a minute. Kalin patted Richard's shoulder. I'm going to go tell Drefin and Nadine about Raina. Richard walked to the door with her. General Curson was waiting outside with his usual fistful of reports. I'll catch up with you in a few minutes, Richard said. As Kalin left Richard to hear the general's reports, Egan fell in with her. It felt odd to be guarded by Egan alone without a moored Sith. One of them had always seemed to be around. Mother Confessor, Egan said. Some people just arrived at the palace and wanted to see you and Lord Rall. I told him that everyone was busy. I didn't want to burden Lord Rall. Petitioner's Hall must be packed with people who want to see us, what with all the trouble. They aren't in Petitioner's Hall. The guards stopped them as they went into one of the reception rooms. They aren't exactly arrogant, like some of the representatives I've seen, but they are insistent in an odd sort of way. Kalin frowned up at the huge blonde Daharan. Did they say who they were? Did you find out that much, at least? They said they were Andolians. Kalin jerked to a halt, seizing Egan's massive arm. Andolians? And the guards let them in? They let Andolians in the palace? Egan's brow drew down. I didn't hear how they got in, only that they were here. Is this a problem, Mother Confessor? The man's hand was already on his sword. No, it's not that. It's just that... Dear spirits, how do you explain the Andolians? She searched for the right words. They aren't exactly human. What do you mean? There are creatures of magic that live in the Midlands. There are people with magic who live in the Midlands. It is sometimes difficult to know where to place the line separating them. Some of these people with magic are a part creature, like the Andolians. Magic? Egan asked with obvious distaste. Are they dangerous? Kaylin heaved a sigh as she changed her mind about where she was going and instead started out for the reception hall. Not exactly. At least not usually. Not if you know how to treat them. No one knows a great deal about the Andolians. We leave them alone. Most people of the Midlands have a strong dislike for them. The Andolians steal things, not for the wealth of the object, but simply because the Andolians are fascinated by things, shiny things mostly a piece of glass, a gold piece, or a button. It's all the same to them. People don't like them because the Andolians look much like you and I. And so people think they should behave like people, but they aren't people exactly. They usually show up in places out of simple curiosity. We don't allow them in the palace because they cause such a disruption. It's best to simply keep them out. With the magic they have, if you try to discipline them, they can turn nasty, very nasty. Perhaps I should have the soldiers get rid of them. No, that could get ugly. Dealing with them requires a very special kind of protocol. Fortunately, I know the protocol. I'll get rid of them. How? The Andolians like to carry messages. They like that more than anything, more than shiny objects even. They love to carry messages for people. I guess it makes them feel more connected to their human side to be involved in human affairs. Some people in the Midlands use them for that purpose. Andolians will carry a message more faithfully than any courier. 
They will do it for a shiny button. They would even do it for no compensation. They live to convey messages. All I have to do is give them a message to carry, and they will be off to deliver it. That's the easiest way to get rid of an Andolian. Will it get rid of all of them? Egan asked as he scratched his head. All of them? Dear spirits, don't tell me that there are more than a couple. Seven. Six women who all look alike and one man. Kalen lost a stride. I don't believe it. That would be the legate Rishi and his six wives, all sisters. The six sisters were all born of the same litter. The Andolians believed that only a litter of six females were worthy to be the legate's wives. Kalen's head spun as she tried to concentrate through the depression over Raina's death, over all the deaths. She had to think of a place to send the Andolians and a message for them to carry. Maybe something about the plague. She could send them somewhere with a warning about the plague. Maybe down into the wilds. Most of the people of the wilds tolerated the Andolians better than most other people in the Midlands. A throng of guards bristling with weapons filled the halls all around the reception room. Two guards with pikes opened the tall mahogany paneled doors as Kalen and Egan approached. The reception hall where waited the Andolians was one of the smaller ones without windows. Sculptures of every sort, from ruler's busts to a farmer and oxen, most done in pale marble, rested on square granite blocks placed back against the dark walls. Behind each sculpture, ornamental drapery of a rich maroon was swagged back to half columns of dark violet marble set against the walls between each sculpture. It lent each piece the air of being displayed on a stage with curtains opening for them. Four separate clusters of ornate lamps with cut glass chimneys hung on silver chains. Because of the dark decor, the dozens of lamps were unable to bring anything brighter than a somber atmosphere to the room. Three heavy dark tables sat on the black marble floor. The Andolians stood before one of these tables. The six sisters were tall and slender, and Kalen couldn't tell one from another. Their hair was dyed a bright orange with the berries of a hasset bush that grew in the Andolians' homeland. Their homeland wasn't close. They had made a long journey to get to Aedendril. Their big round black eyes watched Kalen approach. Their orange hair, woven into hundreds of small braids, made the women look as if they wore wigs of orange yarn. Woven into the yarn-like hair were small shiny things. Buttons, pieces of metal, gold and silver coins, shards of glass, chips of obsidian, any scrap that they found shiny enough for their taste. All six were dressed in simple but elegant white robes of a lustrous satiny material. Despite what Kayla knew about the Andolians, such as the way a simple storm could send them puling for protection under a bush or a hole in the ground, they had a noble air. Kalen guessed that made sense. They were, after all, the wives of the legate, the leader of the Andolians. The legate himself was shorter than his wives and much older. Other than his round black eyes, he looked to be nothing more than a distinguished official, a bit on the stocky side. A bald pate shone above his fringe of white hair. Some kind of grease had been rubbed on it so as to make it glossy. He wore robes similar to his wives, but of gold material trimmed with rows of shiny objects sewn on. Each finger had at least one ring. From a distance, all the shiny objects made him look opulent. Closer up, he looked more like a crazy beggar who had dug through a midden heap to pluck out worthless items discarded by normal people. Legate Rishi's eyes were red-rimmed and leaden-looking. He wore a doltish grin and swayed on his feet. Kaylin saw him infrequently, but she didn't remember him this way. The six sisters formed into a line before him. They straightened, putting their shoulders back with pride. We share the moon, one of the six said. We share the moon, Kaelin said, in their traditional greeting among females. Her waning cramps reminded her that the greeting had more than one meaning. The rest spoke the greeting in turn. The way those big black eyes blinked as they watched her gave Kaelin shivers. When they had finished with the official greeting, the six split into two groups of three and back to either side of their husband. The legate lifted a hand as if a king greeting a crowd. He grinned moronically. Kalen frowned at his odd behavior, although she wasn't at all sure that for an Andolian it was odd. We shared the sun, he said in a slur. We share the sun, Kalen answered. 
but he ignored her as his attention was diverted by something behind her. Kalin turned and saw Richard striding across the room, a glower heating his expression. What's this about the moon? Richard asked as he came up beside Kalin. She took his hand. Richard, she said in a tone of warning, this is Legate Rishi and his wives. They are Andolians. I have just given them their traditional greeting, that's all. His expression slackened. Oh, I see. When they said something about the moon, I thought... The blood suddenly drained from Richard's face. Andolians, he whispered to himself. Wizard Ricker was doing something with the Andolians. He seemed lost in a confusion of thought. We shared the sun, Legate Rishi said through his grin. The females shared the moon. A female and a male shared the sun, but not the moon. Richard rubbed his brow. He looked engrossed in recollection or confusion. Kalin squeezed his hand, hoping he would get the message to let her handle this. She turned back to the legate. Legate Rishi, I would like you to... Our husband has been drinking things that make him happy, one of the wives said, as if it were a fascinating bit of news. He has been trading some of his prizes for this drink. Her expression turned perplexed. It makes him slow, too, or we would have been here sooner. Thank you for telling me this, Kalin said. One had always to thank an Andolian for any information they offered about themselves. Information about themselves so given was considered a gift. Kalin turned her attention once more to the legate. Legate Rishi, I would like you to carry an important message for me. Sorry, the legate said. We could carry no message for you. Kalin was dumbfounded. She had never heard of an Andolian refusing to carry a message. But why not? One of the six leaned toward Kalin. Because we already carry a message of great importance. You do? Her big black eyes blinked. Yes, the greatest of all honors. Husband carries a message from the moon. You what? Richard whispered as his head came up. The moon sends a message from the winds, the legate said in a drunken slur. Kalin felt as if the world had frozen. We would have been here sooner. But husband had to stop many times to have the drink of happiness. Kalin felt her whole body tingle with icy dread. Been here sooner, Richard repeated. While all those people died, you've been drinking? His voice boomed like thunder. Raina died because you've been out getting drunk? Richard exploded in a blur of movement, his fist striking Legged Rishi so hard that the man tumbled back over the table. People are dying and you're out getting drunk, Richard roared as he vaulted over the table. Richard, no, Kalin shrieked. He has magic. Kalin saw a blur of red racing in from the side. Kara came at a dead run and dived over the table, knocking Richard sprawling across the floor. Legget Rishi rose up in a rage. Blood frothed at his mouth. Strings of it whipped from his chin. Wavering flares of light and undulating flutters of darkness radiated up his arms, gathering at his chest as he rose up. He was gathering his magic, preparing to unleash it against Richard. Richard went for his sword. Kara shoved Richard again and rebounded back at the legate, backhanding him across his bloody mouth. The legate whirled, redirecting his rage at her. Cat quick, Kara spun past him, striking him again, turning his attention away from Richard as he followed her. His magic already gathered, he unleashed it at her. The air thumped, and at the same time seemed to oscillate. The legate went down with a grunt of pain. Kara was on him before he hit the ground. She pressed her Aegeal to his throat. You are mine now, she sneered as he gagged in agony. Your magic is mine now. Kara, Kalen yelled, don't kill him. The six sisters were squatted down in a shivering clump, hugging one another in terror. Kalin put a hand to the frightened sisters, reassuring them that they wouldn't be harmed. Kara, don't hurt him, Kalin said. He carries a message from the Temple of the Winds. Kara's head came up. She had a disturbing look in her eyes. I know. It came to him with magic. His magic is mine now. The message he carries is embedded with his magic. Richard let his sword drop back into its scabbard. You mean you know the message? Kara nodded her blue eyes filling with tears. I know it with him. I share his magic, his knowledge of the message. Ulick, Egan, Richard said, clear the soldiers out. 
shut the doors. Keep everyone out. As Ulick and Egan were ushering the soldiers out, Richard seized the legate by the robes at his throat and lifted him. He heaved him into a chair. Richard towered over the suddenly meek-looking, panting Andolian leader. His chest heaving, Richard gripped the amulet and Raina's Aegeal in a fist. The muscles in his jaw flexed as he pointed at the legate's face. Let's have the message, and you had better tell it true. Thousands of people have already died while you delayed your arrival to get drunk. The message from the winds is for two people. Richard looked up. The words had come not only from the legate, but also from Kara. She had spoken the words along with him. Kara, do you know the message too, just as he does? Kara looked as surprised as Richard. I... it came to me, as it came to him. I knew only that he carried the message. He didn't know it until he spoke it. I knew it when he did. Who is the message for? Kaelin knew. For Wizard Richard Rall and for Mother Confessor Kaelin Amnell. Once again, both had spoken the words. What is the message? Richard asked. Kaelin knew. She went to Richard's side, taking his hand in hers, holding it for dear life. The room was empty of everyone except Richard, Kaelin, Kara, Legate Rishi, and the six sisters cowering under a table. The lamps around the room dimmed as if their wicks had been turned down. It cast them all in an eerie, wavering light. The Legate, his face gone blank, looked to have gone into a trance. He rose from the chair, blood still dripping from his chin. His arm lifted, pointing at Richard. Only he spoke this time. The winds summon you, Wizard Richard Rall. Magic has been stolen from the winds and used in this world to cause harm. You must wed in order to enter the Temple of the Winds. Your wife is to be one named Nadine Brighton. Unable to speak, Richard brought Kalin's hand to his heart, holding it there in both of his hands. Kara's arm lifted, pointing at Kalin. Only she spoke this time in a frigid, heartless voice. The winds summon you, Mother Confessor Kaelin Annell. Magic has been stolen from the winds and used in this world to cause harm. You must wed in order to help Wizard Richard Rall enter the Temple of the Winds. Your husband is to be one named Drefen Rall. Richard dropped to his knees. Kaelin sank down beside him. She thought she should feel something. She felt only numbness. It seemed a dream. She had thought it would never come. Now that it was happening, it seemed too fast, as if she were tumbling over a cliff, grasping for a handhold, but finding nothing to stop her fall as she plunged into icy blackness. It was over. Everything was over. Her life, her dreams, her future, her joy was over. It only remained to act it out until the end. Richard's ashen face looked up from Kara's feet. Kara, please, I'm begging you, don't do this to us. His voice broke. Dear spirits, please don't do this to us, Kara. Kara's cold blue eyes stared back. I do not do this to you. I only bear the message from the winds. You must both agree to this if you wish to enter the Temple of the Winds. Why must Kaelin marry? The winds require a virgin bride. Richard's eyes darted to Kaelin. He looked back to Kara. She isn't a virgin. Yes, she is, Kara said. No, she's not. Kaelin put her forehead against the side of Richard's face as she gripped his muscular neck, hugging herself to him. Yes, Richard, I am, she whispered. In this world, I am. Shota told me that that was all that mattered to the spirits. In this world, in our world, the world of life, I am a virgin. We were together in another world. It doesn't apply here. That's crazy, he whispered in a hoarse voice. That's just crazy. It fulfills the requirements of the winds, Kara said. This is the only chance you will be offered, the legate said. If you do not take it, then the obligation of the winds to remedy the damage will be ended. Please, Kara, Richard whispered. Please, don't do this. There has to be another way. This is the only way, Kara, in her red leather, towered above them. It is up to you whether you will repair the damage. You must agree. If you fail to answer the call, it will not come again. 
and the magic released will run free. The winds wish to know your answer, the lake had said. You must both agree to this of your free will. It must be a true marriage in all aspects. It must be for life. You must both be of honest intent in your marriages and faithful to the ones you wed. He speaks the truth of the winds. What is your answer? Kara asked in a voice like ice. Kaylin looked through the watery blur into Richard's eyes. She could see him dying behind those eyes. It is our duty. Only we can save those people. But I will say no if you wish it, Richard. How many more Rainas must die in my arms? I couldn't ask you to have me at the cost of another life. Kaylin swallowed the whale. Is there anything? Do you know of anything we could do to stop the plague? Richard shook his head. I'm sorry. I have failed you. I haven't found a way around this. You haven't failed me, Richard. I couldn't bear to think we were the cause of more death like Ryan is today. She threw her arms around his neck. I love you so much, Richard. Richard's big hand held her head to him. We are agreed then. We must do this. Richard brought her to her feet with him. There was so much she wanted to say to him. No words came. When she looked into Richard's eyes, she knew words weren't needed. They turned to Kara and the Legate. I agree. I will marry Nadine. I agree. I will marry Drefin. Kaylin fell into Richard's arms as she lost control of her tears. She sobbed in agony. Richard embraced her, nearly squeezing the life out of her. Kara and the Legate were suddenly there, pulling them apart. You are promised to another, Kara said. You may not do this now. You must each be loyal to your mates. Kaelin looked past the legate into Richard's eyes, each of them knowing that they had embraced for the last time. In that moment, her world ended. Chapter 56 Kaelin and Richard sat apart with the legate and Kara between them. Kaelin heard the doors open. It was Nadine and Drefin. After Ulick had let them in, he closed the doors. Richard raked his hair back as he rose. Kaylin didn't want to test her legs yet. It had all slipped through her fingers. Everything was lost to duty. Nadine eyed everyone in the room, the legate, his six wives, Kara, Kaylin, and finally Richard as he walked haltingly to her. Richard stared at the floor. You both know that the plague was started with magic. I told you both how it was stolen from the Temple of the Winds. The Temple has sent its requirements if I am to be allowed to enter and stop the plague. The Temple requires that both Kalen and I wed. The Temple has named who it is it requires we wed. I'm sorry that both of you have been tangled in this. I don't know the reason. The Temple will not explain why it must be so, only that this is our only chance to halt the plague. I can't force either of you to be part of this. I can only ask. Richard cleared his throat, trying to steady his voice. He lifted Nadine's hand. He couldn't look her in the eye. Nadine, will you marry me? Nadine's gaze immediately went to Kaylin. Kaylin wore her confessor's face as her mother taught her. Duty as her mother had taught her. Nadine glanced to the others and then back to the top of Richard's head. Do you love me, Richard? Richard finally looked up into her eyes. No. I'm sorry, Nadine, but no, I don't love you. She was unruffled by the answer. Kaylin was sure that she had expected it. I'll marry you, Richard. I'll make you happy. You'll see. You'll come to love me in time. No, Nadine, Richard whispered. I won't. We will be husband and wife if you agree to this, and I will be faithful to you but my heart will always belong to Kalen. I'm sorry to say such a harsh thing to you when I'm asking you to marry me, but I won't deceive you. Nadine thought a moment. Well, many marriages are arranged, and they turn out well in the end. She smiled at him. To Kalen, it looked a sympathetic smile. The spirits have arranged this one. That means something. I will marry you, Richard. Richard glanced back at Kalen. It was her turn. She saw in those dead gray eyes a glimmer of something, rage. Kaylin knew that his insides were being torn apart the same as were hers. 
She found herself before Dreffen before she realized it. The first time she tried, her voice wouldn't come out. It simply wouldn't. She tried again. Dreffen, will you be my husband? His blue, dark and raw eyes appraised her without emotion. For some reason, she recalled his hand between Kara's legs, and she almost vomited. As Nadine said, I could do worse than a marriage arranged by the spirits. I don't suppose there's any chance you will ever come to love me. Kaylin's jaw trembled as she stared at the floor. Her voice wouldn't work. She shook her head. Well, no matter. We may still have some good times. I'll do it. I will marry you, Kaylin. She was glad that she had never told Richard about what Dreffen had done to Kara. If she had, Richard might have lost control when Dreffen said he would marry Kalin and pulled free his sword. Kara and the legget stepped forward. It is agreed then, they said as one. The winds are pleased to have the consent of all involved. When? Richard asked in a hoarse voice. When will we... When do we... And when can I get into the Temple of the Winds? People are dying. I have to help the winds put a stop to it. Tonight, Kara and the Legget said as one, we will leave immediately for Mount Kaimermost. You will be wed tonight as soon as we arrive there. Kaylin didn't ask how they would get to a place that wasn't there anymore. It didn't really matter to her. The only thing that really mattered to her was that they would be wed that very night. I'm sorry about Raina, Nadine said to Richard. How is Berdine doing? Not well. She's up at the keep. Richard turned to Kara. Can we stop up there on our way? I must tell her what has happened. She will have to stay to guard the slip until I return. I have to tell her. And I'd like to give her something to help her feel better, Nadine said. It is permitted, Kara said in that awful icy voice. Berdine looked terror-stricken when Richard told her. She threw her arms around him and wept with twin misery. The sliff watched from her well, frowning with curiosity. Nadine mixed things from pouches in her big bag, giving Berdine instructions on when to take them, promising that it would help her get through her grief. Richard tried to tell Berdine everything he could think of that she might need to know. Kaylin could almost feel time tingling against her flesh as it flew past, as she plunged and plunged into the black depths. We must go, Kara said, cutting off the stalling. We must ride hard to arrive before the full moon rises. How will I find the Temple of the Winds? Richard asked. You do not find the Temple of the Winds, Kara said. The Temple of the Winds will find you if the requirements are met. Nadine lifted her bag before Richard. Can I leave this here, then? It's heavy to carry if we're coming back here anyway. Of course, Richard said, his voice a dead monotone. Kalin was made to walk behind Richard and beside Dreffen as they returned to the horses. Nadine touched Richard's back as she walked beside him. She was doing a fair job of restraining her joy over her triumph, yet it was a touch meant to send a message. He belonged to her now. At the bottom of the keep road, as they turned away from the city, Kalin could hear the men with the dead carts calling out for people to bring out their dead. Soon that would be ended, as the suffering and death of the plague was ended. Only in that did she find any solace. The children, their parents, would live. If only it had come in time for Raina. Berdine hadn't said that, but Kalin knew that that thought was screaming in her head. Richard had ordered all their guards to remain. When Ulick and Egan had seen the look on his face, they hadn't argued. Only Richard and Nadine, Kalin and Dreffen, Kara the Legate and his six wives rode out for Mount Kaimermost. Kalin didn't know how any of it was going to work, getting into the Temple of the Winds, nor did Richard. She didn't have the slightest curiosity about it. The only thing she could think about was Richard marrying Nadine. Kalin was sure that Richard could think of nothing but her marrying Dreffen. As they rode, Dreffen told stories, trying to keep everyone entertained, trying to lift their spirits. Kalin didn't hear much of it. She watched Richard's back. Her only need was to be looking when he glanced back at her, as he did from time to time. She couldn't bear not to look at him, yet meeting his eyes was like a hot knife searing into her heart. 
She took no joy in the mountainous country they rode into, the greening grass, unfurling ferns, budding trees. The day was warm compared to what the weather had been for spring so far, but the sky brooded with dark clouds. Before the day was out, she expected they would encounter a storm. The Andolians cringed every time their eyes turned up. Kaylin pulled her cloak tighter around herself. She thought about her blue wedding dress back in her room that she had planned to wear when she married Richard. She felt herself getting angry at him. He had seduced her into thinking she could have love, could have happiness, seduced her into forgetting she had only duty, seduced her into loving him. When she realized she was angry at him, the tears came again, running down her face in a silent torrent. This wasn't happening just to her. It was happening to him, too. They shared this torment. She thought about the first time she saw him. It seemed so long ago that she had been running from Dark and Rawl's assassins, and Richard had helped her. She thought about all the things they had done together, all the time she stood watch while he slept, and she gazed at him, imagining being just a normal woman who could fall in love instead of a confessor who had to keep her feelings secret and live a loveless life of duty. Richard had found a way, though, found a way that she, a confessor, could have love. And now it was in ashes. Why would the spirits do this to them? The answer came when she remembered her talk with Shota and with the spirit. There were not only good spirits, but evil spirits, too. Those evil spirits had a hand in this. They were the ones who wanted this, who demanded it as the price of the path. The spirits who demanded that price were worse than evil. Late in the morning, they stopped to rest the horses and eat. Nadine and Drefin talked with their mouths full. The legate sat back as his wives fed him. He had a hard time, what with his cut lip. They rubbed their legs against his, giggling as he took food from their fingers. They ate between offering him bites. Kara ate in silence. Kalin didn't notice what any of them had to eat. She and Richard didn't eat. They both sat on the sunny rocks like dead wood, silent, sullen, staring at nothing. When the others had finished with their meal, Richard watched as they all mounted up again. Even though none of the others noticed it, Kalin could see the smoldering rage in his eyes. The spirits had chosen Drefin to wound him. They could have done nothing worse. How's the arm? Nadine asked Drefin as they all started out again. Drefin held it up and flexed his fingers in demonstration. Nearly good as new. Kalin ignored their conversation. All morning they had chattered. In her silent world, it was barely noticed. What is wrong with your arm, Master Drefin? One of the six sisters asked. Oh, some miscreant didn't like the way I tried to purge the world of sickness. Big black eyes blinked at him. What did he do to you? Drefin straightened haughtily in his saddle. Cut me with his knife. Tried to kill me, the filthy scum. Why did he not succeed? Drefin dismissed the incident with an arrogant wave. Once I showed him some steel, he ran for his life. I sewed his wound, Nadine told the amazed sisters. And a deep one it was, too. Drefin cast a glance at Nadine that seemed to make her shrink in her saddle. I told you, Nadine, it's nothing. I don't want sympathy. A lot of people are in much greater need than I. He relented when he saw the sheepish look on her face. But you did a good job, as fine as any of my healers would have done. You did a fine job, and I appreciate it. Nadine smiled as they rode on. Drefin pulled up the broad hood of his flaxen cloak. Dear spirit, she thought, that is to be my husband. For the rest of my life, this is to be my partner in life. Until she could die and be with Richard again, sweet death could not come soon enough. Clarissa wiped her sweaty palms together as she peered through the keyhole and listened to Nathan speaking with the sisters in the other room. I'm sure you can understand, Lord Raoul, Sister Jodell said. This is for your own safety, too. Nathan chuckled. How good of the Emperor to consider my well-being. If, as you say, Richard Raoul will be eliminated tonight, then you have nothing to be concerned about. We will bring it afterwards. Surely this would be satisfactory. Nathan shot them a hot glare. I told you. 
Jagang's plan has worked. Richard Rahl will be eradicated tonight. You will learn not to question me after tonight, I pray. Clarissa had to strain to see Nathan through the keyhole as he turned away from the two sisters while he considered. He turned back to them. And he has agreed to everything else? Everything, Sister Wilhelmina assured him. He looks forward to having you as his plenipotentiary in Dahara and is most agreeable to your offer of aid with the books of prophecy he has collected over the years. Nathan grunted. Where are they? I don't know that I'm amenable to traveling all over the old world just to have a look at worthless volumes. I have business in Daharan, after all. As the new Lord Rahl, I will need to consolidate my authority. His Excellency has anticipated that this would be inconvenient for you, and so has suggested that he will have his wizards pull out things of interest and have them sent to you for your analysis. Clarissa knew what the sister was talking about. Before they had arrived, Nathan had told her that he probably wouldn't be allowed to have a look at the prophecies Jagang possessed, much less be told where they all were. Jagang would want Nathan to see only selected volumes that had been screened by others first. Nathan finally turned his full attention to the two sisters. In due time, in due time, once we have worked together and brought the new world to task and have come to fully trust one another's word, then I will happily accept visits by Jagang's lapdogs. But until then, I'm sure our emperor understands that I am leery of allowing those with the gift to know exactly where I am. That is why I will be leaving at once. Sister Jodell sighed. As I said, he would be happy to have it brought to you. But you can understand that he would have cause for concern to have a wizard of your power whose mind is a mystery to him approach too closely. While he is eager for this arrangement, he is a man who takes precautions. As am I, Nathan said. That is why I can't allow the book to be brought to me. Having you meet me here again today is the last risk I intend to take. In the meantime, I want that book. Until I have it, I have no way of knowing if it's safe for me to go to Dahara. His Excellency understands and has no disagreement with your request. His objective will soon be complete and he therefore has no further need of the book. Besides, a world without people to work for him would be of little value. The book only works for Sister Amelia, since she was the one who went to the Temple of the Winds to recover it. He has offered to let you have either the book or Sister Amelia. If you wish, we will send her to you. So Jagang will know where I am? I don't think so, Sister. I'll take the book. That too is agreeable with His Excellency. We can send it or have someone meet you to deliver it to you. He objects only to you yourself coming to get it, for safety reasons, as I've already explained. Nathan rubbed his jaw as he thought. What if I sent someone back with you? A representative, someone with my interests in mind, someone loyal to me, so I had no need to fear that Jagang would delve into their mind and find where I was to be, someone without the gift, he would have no need to fear them. Without the gift, Sister Jodell thought a moment. And we could test them without your shields around them to ensure that they, in fact, did not have the gift? Of course. I want this relationship with Jagang to work for both of us. I wouldn't jeopardize it by trying to deceive him. I want to build trust, not destroy it. Nathan hesitated, clearing his throat. But you understand, though, that this person is valued to me. If anything were to happen to her, I would view it in the harshest light. Both sisters smiled. Her, of course, Sister Wilhelmina said. Why, Nathan, Sister Jodell rocked on her heels as she smiled. You really have been enjoying your freedom. I mean it, Nathan said in a level tone. Anything happens to her and the entire agreement is ended. I'm sending her as a show of my faith in Jagang, in our agreement. I'm taking the first step of trust so that the Emperor will see that I am sincere. We understand, Nathan, Sister Jodell said, more serious now. No harm will come to her. When she leaves with the book, I want her escorted to safety beyond Jagang's troops and then left to be on her way. If she is followed, I will know it. If she is followed, I will view it in the most unfavorable light as a sign of hostility toward me and an attempt on my life. 
Sister Jodell nodded. Understood and very reasonable. She comes with us, gets the book, and returns safely to you without being followed, and we are all happy. Good, Nathan said decisively, as if closing the deal. After tonight, Jagang will be rid of Richard Rall. When I have the book safely in hand, then I will have the Southern Army surrender to Jagang's expeditionary force as my part of the bargain. Sister Jodell bowed. We have an agreement, Lord Rao. His Excellency wishes to welcome you to the Empire as his second. Nathan turned toward the door Clarissa was kneeling behind. Clarissa jumped up and rushed to the far window. She drew back the drapes with a hand and pretended to be gazing out when she heard the door open. Clarissa, Nathan called. She turned to see him standing in the doorway, holding the doorknob. Beyond him, she could see the two sisters watching. Yes, Nathan? You wish something? Yes, Clarissa. I would like you to go on a small journey for me, a bit of business. I need you to go with my friends out here. Clarissa guided her full skirts around the writing table and followed him out into the other room. Nathan introduced her to the two sisters. The two women wore knowing, smug smiles. They glanced to her cleavage and then at each other. Clarissa had that feeling of being judged as a whore again. Clarissa, you will leave at once with these ladies. When you reach your destination, they will give you a book. You will then return with it. You remember where I told you we would be off to tomorrow? Yes, Nathan. You will meet me there after you have the book. No one, no one at all is to know where it is you will be meeting me. Do you understand? Yes, Nathan. I'll go see to getting her a horse, Sister Wilhelmina said. A horse? Clarissa gasped. I've never ridden a horse in my life. I can't ride a horse. Nathan waved patience at the sudden hitch in their plans. I have a carriage. I'll have it brought around, and Clarissa can take that. There, is that satisfactory to all? Sister Jodell shrugged. Horse, carriage, it makes no difference to us, as long as we can test her for the gift first. Test her all you want. I will order the carriage while you test her, and then Clarissa can pack a few things. Agreed. Good, that's settled then. Nathan turned to Clarissa, putting his back to the two sisters. It won't be long, my dear, and we'll be together again. He adjusted the locket hanging from a fine gold chain, straightening it for her. He looked into her eyes. I will be waiting for you. I've told these friends of mine that if anything happens to you, I will be more than unhappy. Clarissa stared into his wonderful eyes. Thank you, Nathan. I will bring the book as you ask. Nathan kissed her cheek. Thank you, my dear. That's good of you. Safe journey, then. Chapter 57 Even with the gathering dark, brooding clouds, an eerie calm hung over the summit of Mount Kymramost. The Andolians cast uneasy glances skyward. As Kalin watched Richard dismount, his golden cloak hung limp in the unnaturally still air. Dreffen offered his hand to help her down. Kalin pretended not to see it. In the fading light, the ruins were only ghostly shapes, the bones of some long extinct monster waiting to come back to life and swallow her up. Though this was the night of the full moon, the leaden clouds would totally obscure it. When the last of the daylight soon left, it would be black as death atop the forsaken peak. Nadine stood close to Richard as he stared off toward the edge of the cliff. Dreffen stood nearby, not wanting to look too forward to the woman who would shortly be his wife, but not wanting to ignore her either. Like Nadine, he didn't seem to view this as the end of his happiness. After the horses were secured, the legate and Kara ushered the brides and bridegrooms to a crumbling circular garden structure made up of curved stone benches on one side and broken columns on the other. The top piece connecting the columns was mostly missing joining only four of the ten stone columns. In the distance, in the fading light, Kalin could still see the knife edge of the cliff and the black swath of mountains beyond. Somewhere out there was the Temple of the Winds. Kalin was directed to sit on a curved stone bench beside Dreffen, and Richard, two benches away, was told to sit beside Nadine. Kalin glanced over and saw Richard looking back, but then Dreffen leaned forward and blocked her view of Richard. She turned her attention to the legate and Kara standing before them. The six sisters stood behind their husband. We are gathered here, the legate and Kara said as one, 
to wed Richard Rawl and Nadine Brighton, and to wed Kaelin Amnell and Drefin Rawl. This is the most solemn of rites. It binds in the most earnest of vows, and commits these mates for life. This marriage is sanctioned and witnessed by the spirits themselves. Kaelin stared at the weeds sprouting from the cracks in the disintegrating stone floor as she only partly listened to the words about loyalty, fidelity, and obligation. It was so warm and muggy that she could hardly breathe. Her white mother confessor's dress was sticking to her back. Sweat trickled down between her breasts. Kaelin's head came up when Drefin started lifting her with a hand under her arm. What? What is it? It is time, he said. Come. And then she was standing before the legate and Kara, with Drefin beside her, and three of the legate's wives at her other side as her attendants. She looked past Drefin to see Richard standing beside Nadine, with the other three Andolians serving as her attendants. Nadine wore a smile. If anyone has any objections to the wedding of these people, they must speak now, for once it is done, it cannot be undone. I have an objection, Richard said. What is it? the legate asked. The wind said that this had to be of our own free will. It is not. We are being coerced into this. We are being told that people will die if we don't do this. I don't do this of my own free will. I do this only to save lives. Do you wish to save the lives of the people who will die if the magic stolen from the Temple of the Winds is not stopped? The legate asked. Of course I do. This wedding is part of that attempt. If you do not go through with it, then they will die. You wish to save them. This qualifies as your free will as far as the spirits involved are concerned. If you wish to withdraw your agreement to this, then it must be now, before the vows. Afterwards, you may not change your mind. Muggy silence hung in the air. She was plummeting, helpless, into the inky depth. It was all happening too fast. Too fast for her to get a breath. I wish to speak with Richard if I am to do this. Before I do this, Kalen said. Alone. The legate and Kara stared at her a moment. Then hurry, they said as one. There is not much time. The moon rises. They both walked far enough away from the circle that Kalen could be reasonably sure they couldn't be heard. She stood close, facing him. She wanted Richard to save them from this. He had to save them. He had to do something now, or it would be too late. Richard, we're out of time. Is there anything? Can you think of anything at all to stop this? Any way we can still save those people and not have to do this? Richard stood close to her, and yet a world away. I'm sorry. I don't have any other solution. Forgive me, he whispered. I have failed you. She shook her head. No, you didn't. Don't ever think that, Richard. I don't. The spirits have made it impossible for us to win. They wish this and have put us in a double bind. But at least if we go through with this, Jagang will not win. That is more important. How many lovers like us will be able to have a life now, have happiness now, have children now because of the sacrifice we make this night? Richard smiled that smile that melted her heart. That's one reason I love you so much. Your passion. Even if I never see you again, I have known true happiness with you, true love. How many ever experience even this small taste? Kalen swallowed. Richard, if we do this, we have to be true to our vows, don't we? We can't still be together sometimes, can we? The way his jaw trembled and his eyes filled with tears was more than answer enough. Just before they fell into each other's arms, Kara was there between them. It is time. What are your wishes? I have a lot of them, Richard said with sudden venom. Which do you want to hear? The winds wish to know if you will do this or not. We will do it, Richard growled. But the spirits had better know that I will have revenge. The winds are simply doing the only thing they can do to stop the death caused by what was stolen from them, Carr said with sudden compassion but still with that haunting quality that told Kalin that it wasn't Kara speaking, but the winds. They do not do this out of animosity. A wise man once told me that dead is dead, no matter the how, Richard said. He defiantly took Kalin's hand and walked with her back to the circle of stone, where they each took their places beside their chosen. 
Kaylin wore her confessor's face as she stood beside Refn. She felt pain for Richard. He had not grown up being taught how to subjugate his emotions, his longings, his desires for duty. She had had a lifetime to prepare for this final torment. He had had a lifetime to prepare for the opposite, expecting he would have happiness. Kaylin had only briefly felt the warmth of that flame. With deliberate care, she ignored the words spoken to Nadine and then to Drefen, words of loyalty and devotion to their mate. Kaylin instead focused her mind on Richard, hoping to pass to him some strength, hoping that he could get through this, so that they could save those stricken and stop the plague. Richard still had to get into the Temple of the Winds. He needed strength. Soon the ceremony would be over, and they would head back to Aidendril. Perhaps they would have to wait until Richard went into the temple and did what he had to do, and then they would return to Aidendril. In any event, it wouldn't be long, and she would be going home, home to the place she had grown up, to a life of duty to which she had been bred. Yes or no, the Lickett said. Kalin looked up. What? He glanced up at the threatening clouds and then took a hurried breath. Do you swear to honor this man to obey him as the master of your home, to care for his needs when he is well and when he is ill, and to be his loyal wife in this life as long as you both live? Kalin glanced up at Drefen. She wondered what he had sworn to. I swear to whatever it is that is required of me to stop the plague. Yes or no? Kalin let out an angry sigh. Is this what is required of me to stop the magic stolen from the winds from killing people? It is. In her mind, she swore the oath, but to Richard, not Drefen. She would swear words aloud to Drefen, but her heart would always be Richard's. Kalin's fists tightened. Then yes, I swear to do what is required to stop the plague. I swear not one stitch more, nor for one breath longer than that required of me. Then, in full view of the spirits, and by the power of the spirits, you are now pronounced husband and wife. Kaelin doubled over in sudden pain. It felt as if her insides had been torn apart. She tried to pull a breath. It wouldn't come. She saw swirling color before her wide eyes. Drefen put his arm around her waist. What is it, Kaelin? What's wrong? Her legs buckled, but he held her up. It is the spirits came the Legate and Kara's voice together. They have bound her power. She is to live this marriage as any woman wed to a man. Her power would have interfered. You can't do that, Richard screamed. She'll be defenseless. You can't take her power. Her power was not taken, but walled away so she cannot use it for the term of her vows to her husband, Drefin Rohr. It is done, the two said together. You will now swear to the vows or you will lose your chance to help the winds. Kaelin stared at the ground, feeling a swirl of emptiness, feeling the void between her mind and her power as she listened to similar words spoken before Richard. She couldn't hear his answer, but he must have said what was required because the legate pronounced him and Nadine husband and wife. They had not only taken her love, but her confessor's power as the price of the path. The emptiness threatened to smother her, the profound and sudden sense of loss clouded her mind with blackness darker than the falling night. Drefen took her arm. Here, you'd better sit down. Even in this light as a healer, I can see that you are not well. Kaelin let him guide her back to a bench and help her to sit. Your wife will be fine, the legate said. He looked up at the boiling sky. Richard Roll, Drefen Roll, come with me. Where are we going? Richard wanted to know. We are to prepare you to consummate the marriage. Kaelin's head came up. Even in the darkness, she could see that Richard was near to exploding in rage. His hand was on his sword. Drefen rubbed Kaelin's back in sympathy. You will be all right. Everything will be all right. Don't worry. I will take care of you as I promised. Thank you, Drefen, she managed through the anguish. Drefen left her and strode to Richard. Drefen gripped Richard's arm and bent close, speaking to him in a whisper. Kalin could see Richard rake his hands back through his hair and nod occasionally. Whatever Drefen was saying was cooling Richard. After Drefen and Richard parted, the legate and Kara looked back to Nadine and Kalin. You two will wait here. Kalin huddled on the stone bench as Richard and Drefen were led off in the darkness toward the cliff 
toward the two buildings, one to either side of the road that ended abruptly at the edge. It was becoming so dark that Kaylin could hardly make out Nadine's face as she sat down beside her on the stone bench. The six sisters had gone back to the horses, sucking their fingers as they watched the sky. I'm sorry about your magic, I mean. I didn't know they would do that to you. I guess you'll be like any other woman now. I guess. Kaylin, Nadine said, I won't lie to you and tell you that I'm sorry that I'm the one who married Richard, but I will tell you that I'll do my best to make him happy. Nadine, you just don't understand, do you? You can be as kind as pudding to him, or you can be as mean as nettles, and it won't make any difference. With the pain he's in, if you do your worst, it would be a bee sting after a beheading. Nadine giggled uncomfortably. Well, I know a poultice for a bee sting. Richard will see. I will... You have already promised me that you would be kind to him, Nadine. I appreciate that you will be kind to him. But at the moment, I'm not in the mood to hear the details of just how kind you are going to be. Sure. I understand. Nadine picked at the stone on the bench. Not the way I had my wedding pictured in my head. Me neither. Maybe I can make the rest of it the way I pictured. Her tone had turned cold and vindictive. You've made me to feel a fool for wanting Richard, for thinking I might have him. You've taken the pleasure out of my wedding day, but you won't take the pleasure out of the rest of it. I'm sorry, Nadine, if you think that I have... Now that I have him, I intend to show him how a woman can really please a man. He'll see. He'll see that I can be just as good a woman for him as you. You think I can't, but I can. Nadine leaned close. I'll have Richard's eyes spinning in his head before this night is out. Then we'll see who the better woman is and how much he misses you. When you're lying there with Richard's brother, listen close, and you'll hear my screams of pleasure, the screams of pleasure Richard gives me. Not you, me. Nadine stormed away to stand with her arms folded in a huff. Kaylin put her face in her hands. The spirits weren't content to destroy her. They had to twist the knife. Kara and the legate returned. It is time, they said as one. Kalen rose woodenly to stand, waiting to be told what to do next. The legate turned to Kara. This storm is going to break soon, the legate turned to peer up at the blackness. My wives and I must be off this mountain. He gripped Kara's arm. The winds speak to you the same as they speak to me. Can you take them? Yes, it is nearly done. I can finish it. Kara said. The winds will pass the message through me as well as through you. Without further word, he scurried off into the darkness. Kara's strong fingers gripped under Kalin's arm. Come with me, she said in that icy voice of the winds. Kalin dug in her heels. Kara, please, I can't. You can and you will, or the chance will pass and the plague will rage on. Kalin pulled back. No, you don't understand. I can't. I'm having my moon flow. It isn't finished yet. I can't do this. Not now. Kara's sinister glare drew close. It will not prevent you from consummating your marriage. You will do this, or all hope of stopping the plague is lost. It is not finished yet. You must do your part in this. Indulge in this. It must be now, tonight. Or would you rather the dying continue unabated? With Nadine on one side of her and Kalen on the other, Kara led them down the road through the darkness toward the edge of the cliff. Standing in the black night at the edge of the cliff, Kalen felt numb and lost. She didn't know how long Kara was gone with Nadine, taking her to Richard in the crumbling building to the right. She felt Kara's hand under her arm again. This way, came the icy voice. Kalen let the woman lead her to the ruins on the left. Kalen could hardly see a thing. Kara, led by the winds, had no trouble negotiating the halls and rooms in the wreck of a building. They came to a doorway. Kalen could just make out Drethen's sword standing up against the wall outside. Her fingers rested on its leather-bound hilt. Inside, she could just discern the rectangles where windows once stood. Beyond was the edge of the cliff and the emptiness where the temple of the winds had once been. This is your wife, Kara said with that icy, horrid voice as she spoke into the room. Here is your husband, she said to Kalen. This marriage must be consummated. 
It is now your duty to do so. The winds have requirements. You may ask no more questions. Do not speak. The winds have reasons, and it is not for you to know them, only to obey if you wish to end the death. As the test narrows, it becomes more intense. You must now lie as husband and wife. If either of you utter so much as one word, the test will end and the entry into the temple of the winds will be denied. There can be no appeal. The stolen magic will rage on, as will the death caused by it. Only after you have fulfilled the requirements of the consummation will the winds come. After the winds come, and you will have no doubt that it has happened, you may then speak to one another, not before. Kara turned Kaelin around and helped her out of her dress and the rest of her things. It wasn't hard for Kaelin not to speak. She had nothing to say. Kaelin felt the black night air on her naked flesh. She glanced down at Drefin's sword, thinking briefly that when it was over, she could always use it on herself. If not, if he denied her access to it, there was always the cliff. Kara gripped Kaelin by the wrist and led her forward. Forcefully, Kara made her kneel down and then leaned forward until Kaelin felt the edge of the pallet. Your husband awaits you here. Go to him. Kaelin heard Kara's footsteps fade into the distance. Then she was alone with Drethen. Chapter 58 As Kaelin felt her way, her hand brushed Drethen's hairy leg. She moved off to the side to lie down beside him. There was a blanket over straw, or something softer than bare wood anyway. At least it didn't hurt her back, as would have the hard ground. She lay on the pallet, staring up into the blackness with wide eyes. She couldn't see anything other than the vague indication of the windows before them. She made an effort to slow her breathing, although she could do nothing to slow her panicked pulse. This wasn't the worst thing, she told herself. Not the worst thing in the world. Not at all. This wasn't rape, exactly. After a time, she felt Drefin's hand settle on her belly. Kaelin shoved it away as she stifled a cry. She shouldn't have done that, she told herself. What was a hand compared to the plague? How many people in agony with the plague would gladly have traded places with her? Not the worst thing at all, a gentle hand. Drefin's hand found hers, trying to give it a squeeze of reassurance. She yanked her hand away as if a snake had touched her. She didn't want his reassurance. She had not vowed to hold his hand. She had not vowed to accept his reassurance. She had committed to being his wife, not to holding his hand. She would let him do to her what she must let him do to her. But she didn't have to hold his hand. Kaelin frantically tried to reason with herself. Richard had to get into the Temple of the Winds. The Temple of the Winds demanded this as the price of the path. The spirit of Chandalin's grandfather had warned her that she must not shirk her duty. She remembered his words all too well. I have not been shown the price, but I forewarn you that I do know that there is no way for you to circumvent or avoid it. It must be as it will be revealed to you, or all will be lost. I ask that when the winds show you the path, you take it, lest what I have shown you comes to be. Kaelin remembered the scenes of mass death the spirit had shown her. If she failed to do as the winds asked, what she had been shown would come to pass. She had to let Drefin do this. Stalling would not make it any easier. This couldn't be easy for Drefin. Couldn't be easy at all. What with the way she shoved away his attempts at tenderness. That made her angry all over again. She didn't want his tenderness. What did she want? Did she want him to be rough? Of course she had to let him touch her. How could he do this if he didn't touch her? Richard had to get into the Temple of the Winds. She had to let Drefin do this. Kaelin reached over and took Drefin's wrist. She put his hand back where he had tried to put it before, on her belly. She let go of his hand. It stayed there. What was he waiting for? She wanted to scream at him to get it over with. To do it and be done. To take what was his brother's by heart, if not by vow. She lay there with Drefin's hand on her, listening to the dead silence of the night. She realized that she was listening for sounds coming from Nadine and Richard. She shut her eyes. Drefin's hand moved to her breast. 
fists at her side, she forced herself to remain still. She had to let him. She tried to think of other things. She silently recited rote language lessons of her youth, trying to ignore his hand. But she couldn't. He was being gentle, but that was no consolation. Even his touch was a violation. How gently he did it made no difference, didn't make it right. That he was now her husband made no difference to her. She knew in her heart it was wrong, and that made it a violation. In her mind, she screamed at herself. She was being worse than childish. She was the mother confessor and had faced much worse than this, much worse than a man for whom she had no feelings being this close, this intimate. But she was no longer the mother confessor. The temple of the winds, the spirits, had taken that too from her. Kalin gasped in a breath and held it tight as Drefin's hand roamed down her belly and finally settled between her legs. She remembered Drefin doing that to Kara. Now he did it to her. She hated him. She was married to a man she hated. Kara had felt it the same as Kalin could feel it now. Kara hadn't been so childish about it. Kara wouldn't be this foolish. Kalin let Drefin's hand do what it would. This was to save lives. She had to save all those innocent people from the plague sent by Jagang. Her people couldn't be saved without her. It was her duty. Drefin suddenly rose up. The dark shape of him hovered over her. His knee pushed gently between her thighs, urging her to open her legs. It would be over soon, she told herself, as he put his other knee between her legs, too. The hulking shape of him lowered over her. He was big, as big as Richard. She feared he was going to crush her, but he didn't. He held himself up on his elbows so he wouldn't hurt her. He was being tender, and she was only making it harder for him. He had to do this, and she had to let him. Kalin grimaced. She wasn't ready. She held her breath. It was too late not to be ready. Drefin was there. She bit her lower lip as she winced. She felt as helpless as she had ever felt in her entire life. She was married to Drefin, not Richard, and Drefin, not Richard, was having her. Everything was lost. Her eyes squeezed shut. Kalin pressed her fists to her shoulders as he moved in her. Tears trickled from the corners of her eyes. Her nose stuffed up as she wept silently, and she had to open her mouth to breathe. She wanted to wail in anguish, but she instead had to remind herself to breathe. She couldn't seem to stop holding her breath. It took longer than she had hoped, but not as long as she feared. Finished at last, Drefin rolled off her onto his back. He had accomplished his task, but he seemed not to have relished it. She was somehow relieved that he hadn't enjoyed it. He lay there, recovering his breath, as she finally let hers out. It was over. She told herself that it hadn't been so bad. It was nothing, really. She hardly felt anything. She had foolishly balked, and here it was over already. It wasn't so bad as she had feared. It was nothing, really. But it was. She did feel something. She felt defiled. Drefin reached out, his fingers tenderly, sympathetically, brushing a tear from her cheek. She shoved his hand away. She didn't want his sympathy. She didn't want him touching her. She hadn't agreed to him touching her, just to consummating the marriage. His touch wasn't part of it. She remembered being with Richard. She remembered her hot need of him. She remembered the wild passion. She remembered her screams of sheer pleasure. Why was this so different? Because she didn't love Drefin, that was why. In fact, she was beginning to realize that she loathed him. There was something about him that she didn't like, and it was more than just the memory of his hand on Kara. There was something deceptive about him, something devious. She hadn't consciously realized it before, but she could see guile in his blue eyes. Kalin wondered why she would think that. He had just consummated their marriage, and he had been as gentle as he possibly could be while still doing it. He could easily have done anything he wanted. Her power was locked away. She couldn't stop him. Yet he had tried to be sympathetic, understanding. Still, it seemed a wonder to her that it could be so different from when she had been with Richard. She would give anything almost to have that pleasure again. She longed for that fulfillment, that satisfaction, the sating of lust. Drefin's breathing evened out after a time. Kalin lay there in the darkness beside him, beside her new husband, waiting. Why hadn't the Temple of the Winds come? She had done her part. 
Maybe Richard hadn't. Kaylin wondered if he could. After all, she had only to lie there. Richard had to be aroused. How could he be aroused over there knowing that his brother was over here, having his way with the woman Richard loved? Kaylin had seen the look in Richard's eyes, the look of wild jealousy at the mere mention of what Shota said, that Kaylin would marry another. Kaylin had never seen such a look in his eyes before, and at the time there hadn't really been a reason for it. Now there was. No, Nadine would see to it that Richard did what he needed to do. If there was one thing Kalen had confidence in, it was Nadine's desire to consummate that marriage. Nadine was a beautiful woman. She was more than enthusiastic. How could Richard not be aroused? He knew he had to do it. He would have no reason to try to resist her urging. Maybe Richard was thinking of it as revenge against his brother Michael for taking Nadine. Perhaps that was how he would get through it. Kayla knew that Nadine was having the time of her life. This was Nadine's dream. This was Kaylin's nightmare. The dark sky she could just perceive out the window seemed to boil as it had all day and all night. The air remained dead still and sticky. The storm wouldn't break. It threatened, but it would not come. Kaylin laid her wrist over her forehead as she rested, waiting. Her legs hurt, and she realized that it was because she was pressing her knees together. She let her legs relax. Dreffen had done his duty. He was finished. It was over. She could relax. Kaylin shut her eyes when she heard Nadine's distant laughter drifting through the night air. The woman was as good as her word. Did Richard have to make her laugh? Couldn't he just do his duty? No, Richard would not make Nadine laugh. Nadine laughed for Kaylin's benefit. The night dragged on endlessly. Where was the Temple of the Winds? Dreffen made no attempt to touch her again, and she was thankful for that. He lay there on his back, waiting with her. Each hour that passed brought no change. From time to time, Kaylin drifted off to sleep. Nadine's throaty laughter brought her awake with a jolt. Kaylin wanted to slap Richard. How long was he going to make this go on? He could have had Nadine three times by now. Maybe he had. Maybe when the Temple of the Winds didn't come, he kept trying. Nadine would like that. Kalen felt her cheeks burning. Dreffen was silent as he lay beside her. The winds had said that they couldn't talk. She guessed that Nadine's laughter didn't count. She used no words. Her laughter carried message enough. Kalen sighed. Sooner or later, the winds would come. They had all done as required. Had she, though? What was it Kara had said? You must do your part in this, indulge in this. Dreffen had indulged. He had been satisfied. Nadine certainly was indulging. Richard must have. Kaylin hadn't. She hadn't indulged. She dismissed the idea. It had to be something else. Maybe the winds were just waiting for Nadine to finally have enough. That would fit the way the Temple of the Winds had done everything else, twisting the pain for Richard and Kaylin, making them suffer. As the night dragged on and recollecting Kara's words about indulging, Kaylin thought again about the time she had been with Richard in that place between worlds. She had felt the kind of pleasure that other woman felt, the indulgence not only in love but in lust. Kaylin had been so frustrated lately, waiting to be with Richard, waiting for that closeness again, waiting to be married to him so they could be together as husband and wife, waiting for that satisfaction again. It was so near, she had been so close, so ready, and then it all fell apart, leaving her hopes dashed and needs unfulfilled. Now, for the first time, she was free of her confessor's power, free to take pleasure from a man, not for love, but for the sheer indulgence of pleasure. She was free to enjoy what other women enjoyed. Here she was, lying next to her husband, and not an unattractive man at all, and she was feeling frustration for the need of Richard. Was she to live the rest of her life being denied a simple pleasure of life that she was now free to indulge? But she didn't love Dreffen. Without love, the passion was empty. Still, it was passion, and if not ideal, at least she could have that much satisfaction. The spirits had taken everything else from her. They had taken Richard, the only thing she really wanted out of life. Would she let them take simple pleasure, too? What else had she now? This was her husband. 
she was condemned to live the rest of her life with him. Must it be without at least some small release of pent-up need? Wasn't she entitled to at least that much after all she had sacrificed? They had taken everything else from her, her only love in life, her confessor's power. You must do your part in this, indulge in this. What if that was why the winds hadn't come? What if it was because she hadn't indulged? Drefin rolled over on his stomach and sighed. He was frustrated by the weight, too. Or maybe he was tending to his auras. She thought about Drefin's tight trousers and the way she caught herself looking. Drefin was a handsome man. He was built like Richard. Drefin was her husband. Her anger at the spirits for taking everything from her was what finally made something inside her snap. This was all she had. She was entitled to this much, to release. When her hand touched Drefin's back, he jumped. Kalin smoothed her hand across the muscles of his back, and he settled. She let herself feel his muscles, as she used to feel Richard's muscles, feel his shape. She took a deep breath, and she let herself go. Kalin's hand moved down Drefin's back. She gritted her teeth as she gripped his buttocks. They were as tight as they looked in his trousers. She was lucky, she guessed. The spirits could have insisted that she marry a repulsive man. Instead, they had insisted that she marry Drefin, and he was far from repulsive. He wasn't as handsome as Richard. No one was as handsome to her as Richard. But women were always fawning over Drefin. Now he was her husband. He had pledged to be loyal to her. She had pledged to be loyal to him. This was the only pleasure she was to be allowed. This was all the spirits had left her. At least she could have this much. Have what she was entitled to. Kalin seized Drefin's hip and rolled him over toward her. She hooked her leg over his and let her hand roam over his chest. Drefin didn't react. Maybe he was surprised by her change of behavior. Maybe he was confused. She would have to unconfuse him. She gently pinched one of his nipples, then let her hand slide across his flat stomach and down. Kalin found that Drefin was in no condition to do her any good. If she wanted to have her pleasure, she would have to change that. She kissed his chest. She trailed wet kisses down his stomach. His breathing seemed slow. Kalin felt frustrated anger that he wasn't taking the hint. She was tired of being frustrated, while everyone else wasn't. She decided that if she wanted to have satisfaction, it was up to her to see to it that she got what she wanted. No one would give it to her. She would have to take it. Kalin let her tongue, her kisses, glide the rest of the way down Drefin's taut belly. When she took him in her mouth, she tasted her own blood. She forced herself to ignore the taste as she urged him to react. At first she thought he wasn't going to, but when she lost herself in the erotic nature of what she was doing, he finally did. He came back as strong as before. By the time Drefin was fully ready, Kalin was panting with need. Once she had decided to have her pleasure, she became insistent. Drefin was her husband now. It was his duty to fulfill her needs, too, not just his own. Kalin's head was spinning with the want of release. That it was Drefin no longer mattered. In her mind, she imagined it was Richard. At that thought, she moaned with longing and climbed atop him, straddling his hips. This time she was ready to accept him. This time she wanted him. She shut it out of her mind that this was Drefin and imagined it was Richard. Since she couldn't see Drefin's blue eyes, it wasn't hard to envision it was Richard instead. She remembered the things she did with Richard and did those things. She relived that experience in her imagination. Her mouth gaped. She gasped for air. Sweat ran down her body as she moved atop him, writhing forcefully against him. Drefin was panting now, too. She needed to have release from all the frustration that had built up for so long, all the times she had kissed Richard and wanted to do more, all the times he had touched her and she had wanted him to do more. Now he was. Kalin leaned forward to kiss him. Drefin turned his face away. She scooped her arm under his head and held him to her chest instead. His face felt hot against her breast. The roughness of his unshaved face excited her as she slid her sweaty flesh against him. It made her pant all the more. She was just about to scream at him to put his hands on her when she remembered that she wasn't allowed to utter so much as a word. 
She seized his wrist and put first one hand where she wanted it and then the other to hold her bottom while she moved so she could imagine it was Richard holding her again, kneading her. She wanted to feel him gripping her in his big hands while she moved. For the first time since she had last been with Richard, she felt wild pleasure, wild lust, a wild, desperate need. That it was with Dreffen no longer mattered to her. She wanted only release. It came with stunning, ridged shivers. Her sharp moan shook her shoulders. Her legs stiffened to stone, her toes clawed. She slammed herself down on him as the wanton fulfillment of lust inundated her. She gave herself over to it completely, and with helpless, unbridled abandon let it run free. She gasped sharply again, the cry following in the echoing wake of the first. It seemed that it lasted an eternity, as if it was almost too much to endure. With a final convulsion, it subsided. At last it was over. For one twisting moment she had been free. There was no plague, no people dying, no responsibility, no duty, no marriage to Dreffen, no Nadine. For that one moment she had been free of it all, and she had been immersed in gratification. For that one moment her heart and her lust had been with Richard again. Kaylin collapsed to the side of Dreffen, panting, getting her wind back, pushing her wet hair back off her face. It occurred to her that he hadn't reached any satisfaction this second time. She didn't care. She had. At the moment, that was all that mattered. Sweet release. For a wonderful moment, she had been free of everything and had been with her love, if only in her imagination. Kaylin realized that she was weeping with the joy of it. She lay on her side, turned away from Dreffen as she recovered. She wiped the tears of pleasure from her face. In the absence of need, she unexpectedly began to feel ashamed. Dear spirits, what had she just done? She had enjoyed herself, that was all. She had needed the release. Then why did she suddenly feel so dirty? Distant thunder rumbled toward them. A hint of embedded lightning flickered in the sky. Kalen looked up out the windows. Another flash, closer, ripped through the insides of the roiling clouds, briefly lighting the mountaintop. From the other building, Kalen heard a long scream from Nadine. Kalen blocked it from her mind. As much as Nadine's scream rankled Kalen, it at least didn't leave her as frustrated as it had before. Three more screams came from Nadine, short, piercing, urgent. Kalen pressed her hands to her ears. Nadine had made her point. Couldn't she just let it be now? The wind came up abruptly, as if a great huge door had opened. The blast of air hit like an avalanche. The building shuddered. The entire mountain quaked. Kaylin propped herself up on her elbows, peering out the windows. Distant lightning flickered through the turbulent clouds. Thunder rumbled, reverberating through the mountains. Each strike came a little closer. The temple of the winds was coming. There was no doubt in her mind. That took her thoughts back to Richard, because it was coming for him. She felt sudden shame. How could she so easily lose track of her heart? How could she find such pleasure from another man? What was she thinking? She had never felt so dirty in her whole life as she suddenly did now. With Richard, she had felt wonderful afterward. Now she was feeling worse by the moment. If Richard ever found out, he would never understand. Richard would never know. There was no way for him to find out, unless Dreffen told him. Her heart pounded. She thought about the guile she thought she had seen in Dreffen's eyes. No, he wouldn't tell Richard. But what if he did? With a sudden close strike of lightning, Kaylin sat up straight. She saw something out the window, a structure. As the winds had said, there was no doubt. She could talk now. She spun back to Dreffen. She had to secure his silence in this before they left this place. If Richard ever found out, the wind lashed at the mountaintop. The thunder boomed. Temple of the Winds by Terry Goodkind continuing on page 436. In the darkness, she reached out and clutched his arm. Dreffen, listen to me. You must promise. You can never tell what just happened, what I just did with you. Her hand tightened. Her fingernails dug into his arm. I'll do whatever you tell me to do for the rest of my life, but you must promise me that you will never tell. Ribbons of lightning lit the room. Richard, 
Thunder crashed, jarring the ground. Lightning snaked along the bottoms of the clouds, lighting the room with a harsh glare. In the flickering flashes, gray eyes were fixed on her. I think Richard already knows. Kalen screamed. Chapter 59 Kalen froze. Thoughts crashed through her mind in a confusion of thundering terror. Her scream came again, ripping through the night, loud enough to be heard over the sound of the thunder. She couldn't make herself blink. She couldn't tear her eyes from Richard's face. She couldn't understand. Couldn't make sense of it. The world felt as if it had turned upside down. Everything tumbled around in her mind, making it impossible to think. As the lightning lit the room again, she knew only one thing. This was Richard, not Drefin. No look she had ever seen on Richard's face was as terrifying to Kalen as the one she saw now. There was nothing in his eyes. Not rage, not lethal commitment, not determination, not a deadly calm countenance, not jealousy, not even empty disinterest. There was no soul in those gray eyes. No heart. Kalen covered her mouth with both trembling hands. She backed away until her back smacked into the stone wall. He had known from the first instant she had come into the room. Richard could tell it was her coming into a room. He had known it was her the whole time. From the first instant, Kara had led her in here. He knew. He had tried to squeeze her hand to reassure her, to let her know. She had pushed his hand away. He had been as gentle as he could. He had tried to brush her tears away after. She had pushed his hand away. She hadn't let him show her that it was him. Kalen collapsed to the floor with a wail of horror. No! Dear spirits, no! Richard didn't rush to her, didn't speak words of comfort, didn't yell. Instead, he went to where his clothes were lying near the door and began getting dressed. Kalen scurried to her things nearby. She raced to pull on her underthings, suddenly feeling the humiliation of her nakedness, its reminder of what she had just done. She scooped up her dress. She paused, tears streaming down her face. She reached around the outside of the doorway and brought the sword and scabbard up before her face. It had a leather handle, just as she remembered seeing, not a wire-wound hilt. It wasn't the Sword of Truth, Richard's sword. It was Drefin's sword. Kalen gripped Richard by his wrist as he picked up his pants. How? This is Drefin's sword, not yours. It's Drefin's sword. Richard took it from her and leaned it against the wall. They took your power. You have no way to defend yourself. Drefin will be the one near you now, not me. I gave him the Sword of Truth so that he could protect you. His eyes finally met hers. I guess this one finds the truth just as well as the other. Richard stuffed his leg into his pants. Kalen snatched his arm again. Richard, don't you see? It was you. It was you in here with me, not Drefin. The spirits mark a distinction between intent and deed. It wasn't him, it was you all along. He pulled his arm away. The spirits might mark a distinction, but he didn't. To Richard, the intent was the same as the deed. Richard, you don't understand. It wasn't what you think. He shot her a glare of such power that it staggered her back a step. He waited as she stood frozen, unable to find any words to explain. He went back to dressing. Kalen pulled on her white confessor's dress. Outside, the lightning was coming closer. During some of the closer strikes, she could see an immense structure rising up at the edge of the cliff, the Temple of the Winds. When the flash extinguished, the temple vanished again, and she could see the distant mountains beyond, lit by the lightning farther away. Richard, she wept as he pulled on a boot. Please talk to me. Say something. Ask me to explain. Tell me there can be no explanation. Yell at me. Call me a whore. Tell me you hate me. Hit me. Do something. Don't ignore me. He turned and picked up his black sleeveless undershirt. As he pulled it on over his head, she scooped up his black shirt and held it to her breast, hoping to halt his dressing. Richard, please. I love you. His gaze again rose to hers. She thought he was going to say something, but instead he turned away and retrieved his belt with the leather packs on it. He snapped on his wristbands. Kaylin held his shirt to her chest and shook as she watched him hook his belt together. She didn't know what to do. He picked up Drefin's sword and buckled it on. Richard, please talk to me. Say something. This is the doing of the spirits. 
Don't you remember what I told you that Grandfather Spirit told me? The winds have decided that you are the path of the price. They did this to us. He shot her a look again. The intensity in his eyes extinguished. He saw that she wasn't going to surrender his shirt, so he threw his golden cloak around his shoulders. As he turned toward the door, Kaylin seized his arm with both her hands and turned him back to her. Richard, I love you. You've got to believe me. I'll explain this in here to you later, but for now you have to believe me. I love you, no other. My heart is yours alone. Dear spirits, please believe me. Richard gripped her jaw in his hand and wiped a thumb across her lips. He held his thumb up for her to see in the pandemonium of lightning. For the one in white, his true beloved, will betray him in her blood. His words ripped her heart. Kaylin covered her scream with his shirt as he swept out the door. The one thing she had sworn she would never do, she had done. She had betrayed him. It could have been no worse betrayal. It was a betrayal that had destroyed his heart. Crying hysterically, Kaylin raced after him out into the wild night. She had to do something to mend that heart. She couldn't let him endure the pain she had caused him. She loved him more than life itself, and she had done the worst thing possible to him. Outside, the wind howled across the mountain. She could see his black shape, his bare arms, and the flashes of lightning as he headed for the road. As he reached the edge of the cliff at the end of the road, Kaylin threw herself on him, dragging him to a halt. The sky was a savage show of violent discharges. Thunder thumped in her bones. Lightning ripped across the sky, followed by deafening booms. Beyond the edge, when the most powerful of those bolts struck, the Temple of the Winds was there. But only during those fierce strikes. Between those strikes, there was nothing but empty space. Richard, what are you going to do? I'm going to stop the plague. When will you be back? I'll wait here. When will you be back? He stared into her eyes a long moment as the storm raged around them. There is nothing here for me. Kalen clutched at him. Richard, you have to come back. Come back. I'll be here waiting. I love you. Dear spirits, I need you. Richard, you have to come back to me. You have a husband. You have given him an oath. And everything else. Richard, don't leave me alone, Kalen wailed on the edge of hysteria. If you don't come back, I'll never forgive you. Richard turned to the edge of the cliff. Richard, you have a wife. You have to come back. Thunder shuddered the mountain. He looked back over his shoulder. Nadine is dead. I am no longer bound by my oath to her. You have a husband and an oath. There is nothing here for me. Brutal cords of lightning slammed into the road beyond the edge of the cliff bringing the Temple of the Winds into full view. Golden Cloak billowing out behind, Richard leaped into the lightning. Richard, I'm here. I'm here for you. We can find a way. Please come back to me. When the frenetic flash cut off, the temple was gone. Another flash came, and the soaring towers were back for a second, weaker this time, and then gone again. Kaylin dropped to the ground, clutching Richard's black shirt to herself. She had destroyed him. From the side, Richard saw a streak of red. It was Kara racing for the edge of the cliff. She leaped just as another flash erupted, lighting the Temple of the Winds into the world of life. She landed on the road in the sky, and when the flash was gone, so was the Temple of the Winds, Richard, and Kara. Devastated, Kalen stared silently at the rampaging storm, seeing from time to time the towering phantom temple in another world. It never looked solid enough again, or she would have jumped across. She should have. She couldn't understand why she hadn't. Why had she just stood here? Because Richard didn't want her. She had betrayed him. How could he do this to her? He said he would always love her. He said they would be together in the next world. He made her promises. He swore his eternal love. So had she, and she had betrayed him. From somewhere out in the storm, Kaylin heard the distant sound of laughter. The malevolent chuckle made her skin crawl. Dreffen strolled up beside her. He was alone. Where's Nadine? Kaylin asked. Dreffen cleared his throat. When the lightning came and she saw it was me and not Richard, she screamed. She went crazy. She leaped over the edge of the mountain. Kaylin stared up at him. Richard knew. 
He told her Nadine was dead. Richard was a wizard. She had seen that too in his eyes at the end before he jumped across. She saw magic in his eyes. Where's Richard? Kalen stared out at the empty air, at the black wall of night. Gone. On the road to the Temple of the Winds, in the eerie silence, Richard drew his sword. Its alien feel surprised him for an instant until he recalled whose sword it was. He was no longer the seeker of truth. He had had all the truth he could stand. It wasn't night here, nor day, yet there was light. It wasn't like sunlight, more like an overcast day, with no hint of exactly where the sun was. But he knew that there was no sun here. This was not the world of life. This was a part of the underworld, an isolated, remote, obscure niche in the world of the dead. It was as if the wizards had found an out-of-the-way hole in which to hide the Temple of the Winds. It had been similarly hidden when in the world of life. The dark walls of the immense Temple of the Winds rose up before him, the twin towers soaring up into trailers of mist. The entire side of Mount Kymermost was here, the whole part that was missing in the world of life. Richard knew where he was going. He knew more than he had ever known before. Knowledge was flooding into his mind. He was a war wizard. The Temple of the Winds had opened a floodgate into his mind. It was feeding him all he needed to know and more. He felt as if he were sentient for the first time. Recompense for the price demanded. Lord Rawl! A breathless Kara ran up beside him. Aegeel in hand, she took up a defensive position. Her Aegeel would be useless here. For that matter, it would be useless back in the world of life now. Richard turned to the winds and started out again. It wasn't far, not far at all. He knew the way in. Kara, go home. You don't belong here. Lord Rawl, what happened? I... Go home. She scowled at him as she pushed past to clear his way of any danger. She had no concept of the dangers here. I am Lord Sith. I am here to protect the Lord Rawl. I am no longer the Lord Rawl, Richard whispered. She gazed up at the huge black stone pillars beside the entrance ahead. Beside them on walls of inky stone banded with copper-colored caps, frozen in raven-black granite, stood the Skrin, guardians of the boundary between worlds, frozen only to Kara's eyes, not to his. Kara lifted a hand, bidding him to stay back as she peered down the passageway to the distant entry, checking for danger. There were bones at their feet. Lord Rawl, what is this place? You can't go in here, Kara. Why not? Richard turned and looked back toward the way he had come, at everything he was leaving behind. At nothing. Because this is the Hall of the Betrayed. Richard glanced up at the twin Skrin, guardians that had left the bones of two wizards here on this walkway at their feet. Richard remembered well the message the Slith had passed on from Wizard Ricker. Ward left in. Richard now knew what that meant. He lifted his left arm, fist out, toward the screen perched on the stone wall at the right. Ward left told him which arm to use and which screen to ward. The wrong arm would have denied him entry into this place in the world of the dead. One of Ricker's traps for the enemy. His wristband heated. The leather pad protected his flesh from the power he focused in that band. A green glow enveloped his fist. The screen to the right, to which he directed his birthright of authority, glowed in sympathy with his fist, immobilized for now, to allow Richard to enter. Richard glanced up at the guardian of raven black granite to his left. Richard called out its name, a guttural sound, to which it answered. Black stone cracked and crumbled as the screen turned to its master awaiting instruction. Richard made the sound of its name again. He lifted his hand to Kara. This one does not belong here. Ward her back to the world of life. Do not harm her. After, return to your post. The screen sprang from the stone wall, enveloping Kara. Lord Rawl, when will you be home? Richard gazed into her blue eyes. I am home. Light flared and silent thunder shook the soundless world as the screen vanished on its journey with Kara back to the world of life. Richard turned to the winds. The four winds and a seer watched from their place up on the wall. 
Richard scanned the solid gold runes running up each side of the wall beside the entrance to the hall, reading the messages and warnings placed there by wizards past. In a world without wind, Richard's cloak billowed out behind, a telltale in a place with eddies of power and currents of force as he strode onward into the Hall of the Betrayed. Kaylin threw up an arm before her face as lightning suddenly cracked before her. The road into the Temple of the Winds lit for an instant. In the distance, Kaylin could see Richard's back as he strode resolutely into a passageway. Kara tumbled to the ground on the road at the edge of the cliff at Kaylin's feet. With the boom of thunder, the Temple and Richard were gone. Kara rolled to her feet. With wild fury, she seized Kaylin by the shoulders. What have you done? Kaylin hurt too much to speak. She stared at the ground. Mother Confessor, what have you done? I fixed it for you. What did you do to him? Kaylin's head came up. You what? I swore an oath. We are sisters of the Aegeal. I swore an oath to you that if anything ever happened, if anything went wrong, I would see to it that it was you and not Nadine who was with Richard. Kaylin's mouth fell open. Kara, what did you do? What you wanted? I spoke the words of the winds as they came to me, but when I took you and Nadine to the buildings, I switched you both. I took Nadine to Drefin, and I took you to Lord Rawl. I wanted you to be with the man you truly loved. I took you to Richard. Didn't you trust in me? Didn't you have faith in me? Kaylin fell into Kara's arms. Oh, Kara, I'm sorry. I should have believed in you. Dear spirits, I should have trusted you. Lord Rawl said he was going into the Hall of the Betrayed. I asked when he would be coming home. He said he was home. He isn't coming back. What have you done? The Hall of the Betrayed. Kaelin crumpled to the ground. I have fulfilled the prophecy. I have helped Richard get into the Temple of the Winds. I have helped him stop the plague. In so doing, I have destroyed him. In so doing, I have destroyed myself. You have done more than that. Kara whispered. What do you mean? Kara lifted her Aegeal in her fist. My Aegeal, it has lost its power. The power of a moored Sith works only in the presence of the bond to our Lord Rall. It exists to protect the Lord Rall. Without a Lord Rall, there is no bond. I have lost my power. I am Lord Rall now, Drefin said as he strode up behind Kaelin. Kara sneered at him. You are no Lord Rall. You do not have the gift. Drefin met her glare. I am all the Lord Rall you have now. Someone has to hold the Daharan Empire together. Kaelin clutched Richard's black shirt to her stomach. I am the Mother Confessor. I will hold the Alliance together. You, my dear, have lost your power too. You are no longer a Confessor, much less the Mother Confessor. He reached down and gripped Kaelin under her arm. His powerful fingers tightened painfully as he lifted her. You are my wife now, and you will do as I tell you to do. You have sworn an oath to obey me. Kara reached out to force him to let go of Kaelin. Drefin backhanded her across the mouth, knocking her to the ground. And you, Kara, are a toothless snake now. If you wish to stick around, then you will have to obey me. If not, I have no use for you. For now, only we know that your Aegeal doesn't work. Keep it that way. You will protect me as any Lord Rall. Kara gave him a venomous look as she wiped the blood from her mouth. You are not the Lord Rall. No? He lifted the Sword of Truth, Richard's sword, and let it drop back into its scabbard. Well, I am the Seeker now. You are not the Seeker either, Kaelin growled. Richard is the Seeker. Richard? There is no Richard anymore. I am now Lord Rall and the Seeker. Drefin pulled Kaelin against him, his dark and raw eyes burning into her. And you are my wife. At least you will be once we consummate the marriage. But this is neither the time nor place. We have to get back. There is work to be done. Never. If you ever touch me, I'll cut your throat. You have sworn an oath before the spirits. You will do as you have sworn. Drefin smiled. You're a whore. You'll enjoy it. I want you to enjoy it, to be pleased. I really do. How dare you call me that? I am no whore, especially yours. His smile widened. Really? 
Then how did you betray Richard? Why would he walk away without even looking back? My guess would be that you enjoyed it when you thought it was me. I'd say Richard saw you for the whore you are. When it really is me, you will find pleasure in it then, too. I'll like that. Chapter 60 Verna gently shoved Warren. Wake up. Someone is coming. Warren knuckled his eyes. I'm awake. Verna glanced back at the other windows to make sure that the dead guards were still propped up to make it appear they were on watch. A light from a lamp on the table was just enough to show those outside the guards at the windows, but it would provide enough light to see her and Warren, too, so they stayed away from the windows. How do you feel? she asked. Better. I think I'm all right now. He had been unconscious earlier. The headaches caused by the gift were coming closer and closer together. Verna didn't know what to do for him. She didn't know how long it would be before his gift killed him. The only thing she could think to do was to stick to her plan. Warren had said that prophecy had told him that his only chance was to be with her. Out the window, in the darkness, she could see two shadowed figures approaching up the road. In the distance, on the hills, campfires by the thousands made the countryside look like a lake's reflection of the starry sky. Verna shuddered to think of the hundreds of thousands of brutes in those tents. The sooner they left this place, the better. She was thankful they weren't going up at Gang's stronghold again. They wouldn't be able to pull off that kind of magic twice. The spells Warren had used would not trick the guards again. Thankfully, once was enough. This time, her friends Janet and Amelia were coming out to meet her and Warren. If that was, in fact, Janet and Amelia she saw approaching. It had to be. This was the fourth night after the full moon. This was where they were to meet. Janet had said that Amelia would be back from the tents by now. Verna feared to think of what kind of shape Amelia would be in. She would probably need to be healed. Verna hoped that it wouldn't take long. It was close to dawn. She and Warren had taken turns at short naps. They had a lot of traveling to do to get back to General Rybish and his army, and they needed to be rested for the journey. Verna wanted to be as far away from this place as she could get in case an alert rose from the stronghold. Verna hoped that Janet had already told Amelia about the bond to Richard so that she wouldn't have to waste time with that, too. As soon as Amelia was sworn to Richard, the bond would protect her, too, from the Dreamwalker. Then they could escape. Verna dearly wanted to rescue the rest of the sisters, but she knew that presumption was a road to ruin. On her twenty-year journey away from the cloistered life of the Palace of the Prophets, Verna had learned that out in the world a sister had to do her work with care if there was to be any hope of success. Rescuing the rest of the sisters would be worse than tricky, and it would do them no good if Verna got herself caught while trying to rescue them all at once. Best be aware of your limitations and take it one step at a time. She would get the rest of the sisters safely away from the Dreamwalker in due time. Right now it was most important to get her two friends out, get information from them that would help her to rescue the rest, and get Warren some help. Without Warren, their cause would be jeopardized. Warren was a prophet, just beginning to come into his talent, if that talent didn't kill him before they could get him the help he needed. One step at a time, she reminded herself. Use care, use your head, and you have the best chance of success. A knock came at the door. Verna cracked it open and peeked out as Warren called out like a guard for them to announce themselves. Two of His Excellency's slaves, Sister Janet and Sister Amelia, Verna pulled open the door, reached out, snatching the cloak of one, yanked her in, and then the other. Verna flattened them both against the wall so they couldn't be seen from the windows. Thank the Creator, Verna said with a sigh. I thought you two would never get here. Both women stood with wide eyes, trembling like frightened rabbits. Sister Amelia's face was bruised, cut, and swollen. Warren moved close to Verna. She took his hand as she looked from one white face to the other. Her heart ached for Amelia's obvious pain, but there was something more in her eyes. Terror. What's wrong, she whispered. You lied to us, Janet said in a pained whisper. What are you talking about? The bond. The bond to protect us from His Excellency. I told Amelia about it. She swore the oath to Richard as you told it to me. Verna frowned and leaned closer. What in creation are you saying? 
I told you it will keep Jagang from entering your mind. Janet slowly shook her head. No, Verna, it won't. Not from my mind, not from Amelia's, not from Warren's, not from yours. Verna laid a comforting hand on Janet's arm, trying to calm the frightened woman. Yes, it will, Janet. You must only believe and you will be protected. Janet slowly shook her head again. Before I swore the oath to Richard, Jagang was in my mind. He knew my thoughts. He knew what you told me. He knew it all. Verna covered her mouth in horror. She hadn't considered that possibility. But you swore the oath. That protects you now. Again, Janet slowly shook her head. It did for the first day. But four days ago, on the night of the full moon, His Excellency returned to my mind. I didn't know it. I told Amelia about the oath. She swore as had I. We thought we were safe. We thought that when you came back, we would escape with you. You will, Verna assured her. We all will escape right now. None of us is going to escape, Verna. Jagang has you. He has Warren. He told us that he slipped into the cracks of your minds while you slept the first night after the full moon. Tears filled Janet's eyes. I'm sorry, Verna. You should never have come here to rescue me. It is to cost you both your freedom. Verna smiled through her rising panic. Janet, that just isn't possible. The bond protects us. It would, Janet said in a suddenly gruff, suddenly sinister voice. Were Richard Rawl still alive, but Richard Rawl departed the world of the living four nights ago on the night of the full moon. Janet laughed a hearty belly laugh, even as tears ran down her face. Verna couldn't draw a breath. Richard is dead? Warren slapped his hands to the sides of his head as he let out a cry of anguish. No! No! Verna clutched at him as he sank toward the floor. Warren, what is it? His Excellency. His Excellency has tasks for me. Tasks? Warren, what's wrong? What's happening? His Excellency has a new prophet, Warren cried out. Please stop the pain. I will serve. I will serve as I am commanded. Verna crouched over him. Warren! It felt as if a white hot steel rod slammed through her skull. Verna cried out as she clamped her hands to her head. Nothing in her entire life of 156 years had prepared her for the fount of pain erupting in her mind. The room went black. She felt the floor smack her face. Her arms and legs twitched with the agony. Baleful laughter danced through the hot torture like flames through a ruin. Verna prayed to the Creator that she would black out. Her prayer went unanswered. Above her, she heard a voice, Janet's voice. I'm so sorry, Verna. You should never have come here to try to rescue us. You will serve His Excellency now as his slaves. The blonde one, Kara, followed him into the reception room. She stayed three paces behind, as he had ordered. She always wore her red leather now, as he had ordered. He liked the way the red leather made them look, like they were sheathed in blood. One of them was always there with him, a blood-red reminder of the slick, sticky debauchery to come. Her blue eyes turned away when he glanced back over his shoulder. He knew that she stayed only to be near Kalen. That was fine by him. That she stayed was all that mattered. She was harmless now, but it looked better if the Lord Rawl had an escort of guards like her, a proper accoutrement of his rank. And he was the Lord Rawl now, as the whispers from the ethers had promised him. Only he had the intellect to perceive the voices, the wisdom to hear them, the acumen to heed them. It had brought him triumph. Attention to detail had brought him his rewards. His extraordinary insight had brought him to the place of power he had always deserved. His gift was his genius, and it would serve him better than mere magic. He was a man above others, and for good reason. He was superior to others. A man of rare understanding, instinct, and rare ethics, unadulterated by the twisted excuses women put to their vulgar pleasures. His own virtue intoxicated him. Kaylin glanced up when she saw him striding into the room. Her face showed a blankness, an expression she wore almost constantly. She only thought it showed nothing. To him, it revealed a panoply of emotion. 
Immersed in the details of her bewitching face, he could discern the rich flux of emotions she tried to hide. He saw the way she looked at him. He had caught her glances at his body in the past. He knew. She wanted him. She hungered for him. She wanted pleasure from him. That she tried to deny it only excited him all the more. That she covered her hunger for him with harsh words only proved it to him. That she pretended revulsion only showed him the extraordinary depths of her need. When she finally gave in to her lust, it would be all the more glorious for the wait, for the abstinence, for the yearning, for the delayed fulfillment. Then at long last he would give her what she wanted. Then he would hear her screams. The general with Kalin bowed. Good morning, Lord Rall. What's this, he asked. He didn't like it when the soldiers brought things to Kalin without seeing to informing the Lord Rall first. It's just the morning reports, Treffen, Kalin said in that flat tone of hers. Then why wasn't I informed? Reports should come to the Lord Rall first. General Curson stole a glance at Kalin. He bowed again. As you wish, Lord Rall. I just thought, I do the thinking, you do the soldiering. The general cleared his throat. Of course, Lord Rall. So what do the morning reports have to say? The general glanced to Kalin again. Dreffen saw the slight nod, as if the general needed permission from the Lord Rawl's wife to report. Dreffen let it pass, as he always did. He enjoyed her games, the way she thought he missed things. It amused him. Well, Lord Rawl, the plague is nearly over. Describe nearly over, if you would, please. As a healer, vagueness hardly does me any good. In the last week, the deaths from the plague have dropped to only three confirmed cases last night. Nearly everyone who was sick when Lord, he caught himself, when Richard left, has recovered. Whatever Richard did, my brother died. That's what he did. I am the healer. I am the one responsible for the plague ending. Kalin lost the calm look. Her expression twisted to tightly controlled rage. He wondered how her face would twist were it pain were a terror. He would know in the end. Richard went to the Temple of the Winds. He sacrificed himself to save everyone. Richard, not you, Dreffen, Richard. Dreffen dismissed her tirade with a casual flip of his hand. Nonsense. What did Richard know of healing? I am the healer. It is Lord Rall who has saved his people from the plague. Dreffen raised a finger to the general. And you had better see to it that everyone knows it. Kalin gave her slight nod to the general again. Yes, Lord Rall, the general said. I will personally see to it that everyone knows that it was Lord Rall himself who stopped the plague. Kalin's face showed the slightest hint of a smile at the general's ambiguous response. Dreffen let it go. He had more important business than her disrespect for her husband. And what else have you to report, general? Well, Lord Rall, it seems that some of our units are missing... Missing? How can troops be missing? I want them found. We must have the army together to defend against the Imperial Order. I won't have the Diharan Empire fall to the Imperial Order because my officers fail to maintain discipline. Yes, Lord Rao. I have already sent scouts to find the troops who have wandered off from their stations. It's the bond, Dreffen, Kalin said. The Diharans aren't bonded to you. The army is breaking up, wandering off aimlessly, because they have lost the bond, lost their leader. They don't know what to do. They are without a Lord Rawl. He struck her. The sharp sound reverberated through the room. Stand up! He waited until she regained her feet. I'll not have insolence from my wife. Do you understand? Kalin pressed her fingers to her nose, trying to halt the flow of blood. The crimson tide flooded over her fingers and lips and down her chin. The sight of it nearly drove a gasp from him. The sight of the mother confessor with blood on her made his hands shake. He longed for the slicing, for the sight of blood everywhere on her, for her screams, for her terror. But he could wait until she begged for it. As had Nadine. He had enjoyed Nadine's perverted hunger. He had relished her surprise, her terror, her agony before he cast her over the side of the mountain, still alive, so she could think about her vile nature all the way down. It had sated him for now. 
He could wait until the mother confessor's true corruption finally surfaced once again, as it had the first night. Richard must have been horrified to discover how much she really wanted his brother, that the woman he had loved was as impure as any whore. Poor, innocent, stupid Richard. He never even looked back over his shoulder as he walked away. Dreffitt could wait. She would need time to recover from the shock of causing Richard's death. Dreffin could wait. It wouldn't take her long, as badly as she wanted him. He swept Kalen up in his arms. Forgive me, my wife. I didn't mean to hurt you. Forgive me, please. I was only worried for our safety from the order. This thought that these worthless soldiers won't follow orders and in so doing endanger us all. Kalen wrenched herself out of his arms. I understand. She lied so poorly. From the corner of his eye, he could see the coiled form in red leather. If she moved to strike, he would slice her down. If she didn't, he still had use for her. Kalin twitched a finger in caution to Kara. Kara reluctantly relaxed. Kalin thought she was so clever, thought he didn't see the way she gave orders to people. For now, it didn't matter. General Curson, Dreffen said, I want those derelict troops found. We must have discipline in the army, or we are lost to the order. When they are found, I want the officers executed. What? You want me to execute my own men because they have lost the bond? I want you to execute them for treason. When the rest of the men learn that we won't tolerate such negligence to duty, they will think twice about joining with our enemy. Our enemy, Lord Raoul? Of course! If they don't do their duty as the Harans to serve and protect the Deharan Empire to say nothing of their Lord Rall, then they are aiding the enemy. That makes them traitors. It endangers the life of my wife, of everyone. He glided his fingers over the raised gold letters on the hilt of the Sword of Truth. His sword. He wielded it by right. Now, do you have anything else to report? The general and Kalin surreptitiously shared a look. No, Lord Rall. Good. That will be all, then. Dismissed. He turned to Kalin and held out his arm. Come, my dear. We will have breakfast together. Chapter 61 In a daze, Richard stepped down off the wizard's throne at the head of the Hall of the Winds. His footsteps echoed into the distance. It was his rightful place, the wizard's throne. He was the only war wizard, the only wizard with both additive and subtractive magic. The inside of the Temple of the Winds was beyond colossal. It was almost beyond comprehension. There was no sound in this soundless place, unless he put one there or willed it into being. The arched ceiling enclosing the lofty heights overhead could have contained eagles, and they hardly would have been aware that they were captive inside a structure. Mountain hawks, were there any, could soar and dive under that aerial arch and feel at home. To the sides, massive columns supported walls that ascended into the remote curve of the ribbed ceiling. In those side walls, enormous windows let in more of the omnipresent diffused light. At least he could see the side walls. The far distant end of the hall simply faded out of sight into a haze. Nearly everything was the color of a pale afternoon mist. The floors, the columns, the walls, the ceiling. They almost seemed made of the filmy light. Richard was a flea in a vast canyon. Even so, the place was not limitless as it was outside the walls. Before, he would have been stunned and awed by this place. Now he was neither. He was simply numb. Here, time had no meaning other than that which he brought with him. Time had no place to anchor in eternity. He could have been here a century, rather than a mere couple of weeks, and only he would note the difference, and then only if he so chose. Life had little meaning here, a concept as distant as the other end of eternity. He brought that, too, to this place. Yet the Temple of the Winds had perception and sheltered him in its wizard-crafted stone embrace. To the sides, as he strode the hall, there were alcoves under each arch, beyond each pair of columns, in each alcove resided the things of magic stored here for safekeeping, sent here from the world of life for the safekeeping of the world of life. Richard understood them and could use them. He understood how dangerous these things were and why some had wanted them locked away for all time. 
The knowledge of the winds was his now. With that knowledge, he had halted the plague. He didn't have the book that was used to start the plague, but it wasn't necessary to have the book to render it impotent. The book was stolen from this place, and so was still yoked to the winds. It was a simple matter of switching the fluxes of power emanating from the winds, which enabled the magic of the book to function in the world of life. In fact, it was so simple that he was ashamed that he hadn't realized the way to do it before. Thousands of people had died because he had been so ignorant. Had he known then what he knew now, he could have merely cast a web spun with both sides of his power, and the book would have been useless to Jagang. All those people dead, and it had been so simple. At least he was able to use his healing powers to halt the sickness among most who were afflicted before he had interrupted the currents of magic. At least the plague was ended. It had only cost him everything. What price for all those lives? What price the spirits had set? What price indeed? It had cost Nadine her life. He felt profound sorrow for her. He would have eliminated Jagang and the threat from the old world too, but he couldn't do so from this place. That was the world of life, and he could only affect those things taken from this place to the world of life and the damage they caused. He had touched the core of power in this place, though. There would be no more entry through Betrayer's Hall. Jagang would not twice accomplish the same feat. Richard paused. He drew his sword, Dreffen the sword. He held it out in his palm, staring at it, watching the light catch it. This wasn't his sword, the sword of truth. He let his will flow from the core of his soul, carrying his birthright of power with it. His gift came as easily as a sigh, where before he had struggled to bring forth the most insignificant shred of his power. Force flowed outward through his arms and into the object he held. His mind guided its elements, balancing each to the desired sequence and result, until the sword in his hands transmuted into the twin of the one he knew so well. He held the twin to the sword of truth, although without its attendant impressions of those past souls who had used his real sword. In every other way, though, it was the same. It held the same power, the same magic. Wizards had died in the attempt to make the sword of truth until some were finally successful. Once they had succeeded, that knowledge was born to this place, and it was therefore Richard's for the taking, as was all the knowledge here. He seized the hilt and held the blade aloft. Richard let the power, the magic, the rage of the sword inundate him, storm through him, just to feel something. Even wrath was something. He had no need of a sword, though. The wrath winked out to be replaced again by the emptiness. He tossed the sword high into the air and held it there, where it rotated slowly on a bed of force. With a pulse of power, he shattered the sword he had made into a cloud of metallic dust, and with another thought, evacuated the dust out of existence. He stood empty again, empty and alone. A presence caused him to turn. It was another spirit. They came from time to time to see him, to speak with him, to urge him to return to his world before it was too late, before he lost the thread back to the world of life. This form, this spirit, rooted him to the floor in rigid shock. It looked like Kalin. The soft, glowing apparition hovered before him, radiating with the glow the same color as everything else in this place, only with more intensity, more definition. It looked like Kalin. For the first time in weeks, his heart pounded. Kalin, have you died? Are you a spirit now? No, the spirit said. I am Kalin's mother. Richard's muscles went slack again. He turned away and continued on through the hall. What do you want? The spirit followed, as they sometimes did, interested in him, a curiosity, perhaps, in their world. I have brought you something the spirit said. Richard turned. What? She held out a rose. The green of the stem and the red of the petals were stunning in this colorless world, a ripple of pleasure to his eyes. The fragrance filled his lungs with its pleasant aroma. He had almost forgotten the pleasure of such a thing. What am I to do with this? The spirit held it out, urging him to take it. He had no fear of the spirits who came to see him. 
Even those who hated him could not harm him. He knew how to protect himself. Richard took the rose. Thank you. He slid the stem behind his belt. He turned and continued on. The spirit of Kalin's mother followed. He didn't like looking into her face. Though she was a spirit, and her features were indistinct in that glow they had, she still looked too much like Kalin. Richard, may I talk with you? His footsteps echoed through the vast hall. If you wish. I wish to tell you about my daughter, Kalin. Richard stopped and turned back to the spirit. Why? Because she is part of me. She was of my flesh, just as you are of your mother's flesh. Kalin is my connection to the world of life, the place I once was, where you must return. Richard started out once more. I am home. I have no intention of returning to that bitter world. If you wish me to carry a message to your daughter, I'm sorry I can't. Leave me. He lifted his hand to banish her from the hall, but she raised her hands, pleading for him to stay his power. I do not wish you to carry a message. Kalin knows I love her. I wish to talk to you. Why? Because of what I did to Kalin. Did to her? What did you do to her? I instilled in her a sense of duty. Confessors don't have love, Kalin. They have duty. That was what I told her. To my shame, I never explained what I meant by that. I fear I left her no room for life. More than any confessor I knew, Kalin wanted to live life, to relish it. Duty denied her much of that. That is what makes her such a good protector of her people. She wants them to have a chance at their joy because she sees so clearly what she was denied. She is left to take small pleasures as she can. Is there a point to this? Don't you enjoy life, Richard? Richard walked on. I understand about duty. I have been born to duty. I am now done with it. I am done with everything. You too misunderstand what I meant about duty. To the right person, the person who is truly born to it, duty is a form of love through which all is possible. Duty is not always a denial of things, but an expansion of them to others. Duty is not always a chore, but is best carried out with love. Will you not return to her, Richard? She needs you. Kalin has a husband now. I have no place in her life. You have a place in her heart. Kalin said she would never forgive me. Richard, have you never said something you didn't mean in desperation? Have you never wished you could take back the words? I can't return to her. She is married to another. She has given an oath and she has... I won't go back. Even if she is married to another, even if you cannot be with her, even if it breaks your heart to know you can't have her, don't you love her enough to mend her heart, to put her heart at peace? Is it all you and none of it her in this love you have? Richard glared at the spirit. She has found happiness in my absence. She doesn't need anything from me. Do you find enjoyment in the rose, Richard? Richard walked on. Yes, it's very nice. Thank you. Will you consider going back then? Richard wheeled to the spirit of Kalin's mother. Thank you for the rose. Here are a thousand in repayment, so you may not say I owe you anything in return. Richard cast out his hand and the air filled with roses. Rose petals flew and swirled in a red blizzard. I'm sorry I could not make you understand, Richard. I can see that I only bring you pain. I will leave you. When she vanished, the floor was bespattered with red petals, looking like nothing so much as a pool of blood. Richard sank to the floor, feeling too sick to stand. Soon he would be one of them, a spirit, and he would not have to endure this limbo where he twisted between worlds. He had food when he wanted it, he had sleep when he wanted it, but he couldn't maintain life here indefinitely. This was not the world of life. Soon enough, he would be one of them, and finished with this emptiness that was his life. Kalin had once filled that emptiness. She had once been everything to him. He had trusted her. He had thought his heart had been safe in her care. He had imagined more than was true. How could he have been such a fool? Was it all such illusion? Richard's head came up. He peered across the hall. 
He went through a mental inventory of the items stored here. The gazing font. It was there, across the hall. He knew how to use it. He rose and crossed the hall, going between two of the columns to find the stone gazing font. It had two basins in two tiers, the lower one waist high and the upper just above his head. Each basin was a long rectangle. Carved into the glittering charcoal gray stone were ornate symbols of instruction and power. The lower basin was brimful of a silver liquid, appearing similar to the sliff, but very different, he knew. Richard lifted the silver ewer from the shelf below and dipped it in the lower basin. He emptied the ewer into the upper basin. He continued until the upper basin was loaded with its charge of the gazing liquid. Richard leaned across the lower basin to place his hands on the proper symbols spread wide to each side. He read the ancient words before him as he leaned in, hands pressed to the gazing keyways. When the words were said, he focused his mind on the person he wished to gaze upon. As he did this, he let slip a small cord of power to release the liquid in the upper font. Across the entire knife-edge front of the upper basin, the silver liquid spilled out in a thin silvery sheet before his face. In that waterfall of gazing liquid, Richard saw the person he called in his mind, Kalen. His chest tightened at seeing her. He almost gasped, almost called out her name in anguish. She was in her white confessor's dress. The familiar contours of her face made him ache with longing. She was near her rooms, her bedroom in the confessor's palace. It was night there. Richard could feel his heart hammering against his ribs as he watched her glide to a halt at the door. Dreffen slipped up behind her. He put his hands on her shoulders, giving them a squeeze as he leaned close, putting his mouth by her ear. Kaelin, my wife, my love, are you ready to go into bed? I've had a hard day. I so look forward to a night of your lustful passion. Richard released the font. He lifted his fists as he staggered back. The gazing font exploded apart, heavy pieces of rock driven ahead of huge gouts of flame and smoke. Shards of stone whistled through the hall, disappearing into the distance. Massive chunks of stone wailed as they rose up into the air, lifted on a raging inferno, until they lost their upward momentum and dropped back down to shatter into fragments and dust. The gazing liquid flooded the floor. In each droplet and pool, Richard could see Kalin's face. He turned his back and stalked away. A furnace of flame blasted the floor, evaporating each droplet, yet he could still perceive her face in the tiniest mist of it filling the air. He cast up his fists. Every droplet, every infinitesimal bit of mist winked into nothingness behind him. In the center of the hall, in a daze, Richard slumped to the floor, staring out at nothing. A malicious chuckle drifted through the winds. Richard knew who it was. His father was back to torment him again. What's the matter, my son? Darkenrall said in his derisive hiss. Aren't you happy with my choice of a husband for your true love? My own son, my own flesh and blood, Dreffin, wed to the mother confessor. I think it a good choice myself. He's a good boy. She seemed pleased. But then you already know that, don't you? You should be pleased that she is pleased, so very pleased. Dark and Rawl's laughter cavorted through the hall. Richard didn't bother to banish the luminous form standing over him. What did it matter? So, what do you say, my wife? Shall we have a night of wild passion like you showed my brother when you thought it me? Kaelin used all her strength to ram her elbow into Dreffen's sternum. She had caught him off guard. He hadn't expected that. He doubled over in pain, unable to get his breath. I told you, Dreffen, if you touch me, I'll cut your throat. Before he could recover to laugh at her anger or to taunt her with his threats of force, she slipped into her room, slammed the door, and threw the bolt. She stood trembling in the near darkness. She had felt something. For a moment, it had felt as if Richard was there with her. She had almost called out his name, screamed she loved him. She clutched her abdomen in agony. When would she ever stop thinking about him? Richard was never coming back. Kaelin crossed the thick carpets in her sitting room and went back into the bedroom. 
She dropped into a defensive crouch when someone stepped out in front of her. Sorry, Verdine whispered. I didn't mean to frighten you. Kaylin sighed as she unclenched her fists and rose to her feet. Verdine, she threw her arms around the woman. Oh, Verdine, I'm glad to see you. How are you doing? Verdine hugged Kaylin with a desperate need for comfort. It's been a few weeks, but it seems as if Raina died only yesterday. I'm so angry with her for leaving me. And then when I get angry at her, I cry because I miss her so. If she would only have held on for a few more days, she would be alive now. Just a couple of days. I know, I know, Kaylin whispered. She parted from Berdine, keeping her voice low. What are you doing here? I thought you went up to the keep to relieve Kara. I did, but I had to come down to talk to you. You mean the sliff is unguarded? Berdine nodded. Berdine, we can't leave her alone. We would never know if someone slipped into Aedendril. Someone with dangerous magic. That was what... Berdine shushed her. I know. This is important, too. Besides, what difference does it really make? Kara and I have lost our power. We couldn't stop someone with magic now if they did come through this lift. I have to talk to you, Mother Confessor. And I can never do it in the day because Drefin is always showing up. Don't let him catch you calling him anything other than Lord Rall, or he... He isn't Lord Rall. He isn't, Mother Confessor. I know, but he's all the Lord Rall we have. Verdine looked Kaelin in the eye. Kara and I have been talking. We decided we should kill him. We need you to help us. We can't do that. Kaelin gripped Verdine's shoulder. We can't. Sure we can. We'll hide out on the balcony. You get him out of his clothes so that he's away from those knives of his. And while you distract his attention, we'll burst in and end it. Verdine, we can't. Well, all right, if you're skittish about that plan, we can easily think of another. The point is, we have to kill him. No, the point is, we can't kill him. Berdine scowled. Do you want to be married to that pig? Sooner or later, he's going to insist on his rights as your husband. Berdine, listen to me. Even if he does that, I will have to endure it. I can endure rape if it means saving lives. We can't kill Dreffen. He's the only Lord Rawl we have. Until we can figure out what to do, he is the only thing holding the army together. Right now they're confused by his aggressive command. The Harans are used to being told what to do by Lord Rawl. Drefin is acting as if he is the Lord Rawl. And for the moment, the army is scratching their heads, wondering if they're sure he isn't. But he isn't, Berdine insisted. But at the moment, that's all that is holding the whole thing together. If it falls apart, then the Imperial Order will be able to roll right over the Midlands. Drefin is right about that much of it. But you are the Mother Confessor. General Curson is loyal to you. Even without the bond, he sticks around because of you. Most of the officers do the same. Because of you, not Drefin. You could hold things together as well as Drefin. Maybe it would work. And maybe not. I may not like Drefin, but he has done nothing to earn assassination. As much as I don't like his ways, he's doing his best to keep us all together. With him and me, we may be able to keep everyone together in this. Berdine tilted her head closer. It won't last, and you know it. Kaelin wiped a hand across her face. Berdine, Drefin is my husband. I have sworn an oath to him. An oath, is it? Then why haven't you let him in your bed? Kaelin opened her mouth but couldn't find the words. It's because of Lord Rall, isn't it? You still think he's coming back, don't you? You want him to come back. Kaylin put her fingertips to her lips. She turned away. If Richard was going to come back, he'd have done so by now. Maybe it's the plague. Maybe he isn't finished ridding the magic of the plague. Maybe when he's finished, he will return. Kaylin hugged her arms to herself. She knew that wasn't it. Mother Confessor, you do want him to return, don't you? I'm married to Drefin. I have a husband. That isn't what I asked you. You do want him to return. You must want him to come back. Kaelin shook her head. He said he would always love me. He said his heart would always be mine. He promised. Kaelin swallowed the anguish. He walked away. I may have hurt him, but if he really loved me, he wouldn't do this to me. He'd have given me a chance. But you still want him back. 
No. I don't want ever to go through this kind of pain again. I don't want ever to leave myself open to this much hurt. I was wrong ever to let myself fall in love with him in the first place. Kaylin shook her head again. I don't want him to come back. I don't believe you. You're just upset as I get because Raina died. But if she came back, I'd forgive her for dying and take her back in a heartbeat. Not Richard. I'll not trust my heart to him again. Regardless of what I did, that doesn't make it right for him to hurt me as he did. He just walked away from me. And after he'd made promises of always loving me no matter what, he failed me in that test. I never thought he would hurt me like that. I thought my heart was safe with him no matter what, but it wasn't. Berdine turned her around and gripped her shoulders. Mother confessor, you don't mean that. You don't. Trust works both ways. If you really loved him, then you must trust in him, no matter what, just as you expected him to always trust in you. Tears trickled down Kalen's cheeks. I can't, Berdine. It hurts too much. I'll not put myself through it again. It doesn't matter anyway. It's been weeks. The plague is long over. Richard is never coming back. Look, I don't know exactly what happened up on the mountain, but you just ask yourself this. If the situation were reversed, if you were in his place, how would you feel? Don't you think I do that every moment of every day? I know how I'd feel. I'd feel betrayed. I'd never forgive me if I were him. I'd hate me, just as I know he does. No, Berdine soothed. That isn't true. He doesn't hate you. Lord Rawl may be confused or hurt, but he could never hate you. He does. He hates me for what I did. That's the other reason I can never take him back. I hurt him too much. How could I ever look him in the eye again? I couldn't. I could never ask him to trust me again. Berdine circled an arm around Kaylin's neck and drew her to a shoulder. Don't close your heart, Kaylin. Please don't do that. You are a sister of the Aegeal. As your sister, I beg you not to do that. It makes no difference, Kaylin whispered. I can't be with him anyway, no matter what I might think or wish or hope. I must forget him. The spirits have forced me into marrying Drefen. I have given my oath to Drefen and to the spirits in trade to save lives. I must respect the oath I've given. Richard, too, must respect my oath. Chapter 62 Wake him, the voice in her head commanded. Verna cried out. It felt as though she was covered with wasps, and they were all stinging her at once. She frantically swiped at her arms, her shoulders, her legs, her face. She screamed in panic, swatting, swatting. Wake him, came the voice in her head again. His Excellency's voice. Verna snatched the cloth from the bucket. She turned Warren's head. He was sprawled forward on the table, unconscious. She dabbed the wet cloth on his cheeks, his forehead. With trembling fingers, she smoothed back his hair. He hadn't been out long, so she had a better chance to bring him around. Warren! Warren, please wake up! Warren! He moaned in delirium. She pressed the wet cloth to his lips. She rubbed his back with her other hand as she kissed his cheek. It broke her heart to see him so afflicted with the pain, not only of the dreamwalker, but of the gift out of control. She pressed her fingers to the back of his neck and let a warm flow of Han seep into him, hoping it would give him strength, hoping it would bring him around. Warren, she cried, please wake up. Please, for me, wake up, or His Excellency will be angry. Please, Warren. Tears streamed down her face. She didn't care. She needed only to wake Warren, or His Excellency would make them both suffer. She had never known that resistance could be so futile. She had never known that she could so easily be made to betray everything in which she believed. She couldn't even protect those she loved by killing herself. She had tried. Oh, how she had tried. He wouldn't allow it. He wanted them alive so that they could serve him. He wished to use their talents. She now knew that it had to be true. Richard had to be dead. The bond to him was broken, and they were defenseless against the dream walker. He intruded into her mind at will. With frightening ease, Jagang bent her to his wishes. It was as if she were no longer in control of the simplest of actions. If Jagang willed it, her arm lifted. 
and she could do nothing but watch. He controlled her use of her Han, too. Without the bond, she was powerless. Warren let out another groggy groan. He moved of his own accord at last. Only Verna seemed able to wake him when he passed out from the gift. That was the only reason Jagang hadn't sent her to the tents. Only his heart's connection to her was enough to stir Warren. She knew that it was harmful to wake him when the gift wanted him unconscious. It did that as a way to stretch his endurance until he could get proper help. But she had no choice. She was using their love to wake him, and in so doing was bringing him closer to death. But Jagang didn't care, as long as Warren did as ordered. Sorry, Warren mumbled. I... I couldn't... I know, Verna comforted. I know. Wake up now, Warren. His Excellency wants us to keep working. We have to keep working. I can't. I can't, Verna. My head... Please, Warren. Verna couldn't control the tears. The pain of a thousand wasps stinging her everywhere at once made it impossible to hold still. She flinched constantly. Warren, you know what he'll do to us. Please, Warren, you must go back to the books. I'll carry them down. Just tell me which ones you need. I'll get them for you. He nodded as he pushed himself up. He was becoming more alert. Verna slid the lamp near him and turned up the wick. She pushed close the volume he had been reading when he had passed out and tapped the page. Here, Warren. Here. This is where you were. His Excellency wants to know what this means. Warren pressed his fists to the sides of his head. I don't know. Please, Excellency, I don't know. I can't make the visions of prophecy come at will. I'm not a prophet yet. I am only beginning. Warren cried out, squirming in his chair. I'll try. I'll try. Please let me try. Warren panted as his agony subsided. He bent over the book, licking his lips. Fingers shook as he set them to the book, following along the line of words, the line of prophecy. Patronizing past, he muttered as he read to himself. Patronizing past carries forward the same disfavor, twisted to new use for a new master. Dear Creator, I don't know what it means. Please let the vision come. Clarissa peered out into the darkness as the coach rocked to a stop. Dust hung in the air, their ghost-like escort. A stone fortress rose up just outside the coach's window. It was dark, and she couldn't see the whole thing, but what she could see made her heart pound out of control. She waited, twisting her fingers together until the soldier opened the door. Clarissa, he whispered, this is the place. Clarissa took his hand as she stepped out into the inky night. Thank you, Walsh. The other one of Nathan's soldier friends, a man named Bolsdon, waited up in the driver's seat, keeping tight the reins. Hurry now, Walsh told her. Nathan said he doesn't want you in there for more than a few minutes. If anything happens, the two of us aren't going to be able to fight much of a battle to get you out. She knew the truth of that. They had ridden past so many tents that it left her stunned by their numbers. The horde who had overrun Renwald had been nothing compared to the numbers of men here. Clarissa pulled up the hood on her cloak. Don't you worry. I know better than to dally. Nathan told me what to do. She clutched her cloak together in her fist. She had promised Nathan. He had done so much for her. He had saved her life. She would do this for him. She would do this so others wouldn't die. As terrified as she was, she would do anything for Nathan. There was no better man in the whole world. No kinder man. No more compassionate. No braver. Walsh walked beside her as they passed under an iron portcullis and then into an entryway under a barreled roof. Two brutish guards wearing hide mantles and hung with grisly-looking weapons stood beside a hissing torch. Clarissa kept her cloak tightly drawn and her hood pulled forward. She hung her head so that the guards couldn't see her face in the shadow. She let Walsh do the talking, as she had been instructed. Walsh flicked his hand toward her. The representative of His Excellency's plenipotentiary Lord Rawl, he said in a gruff voice, as if unhappy that this assignment had fallen to him. The bearded guard grunted. So I've been told, he lifted a thumb toward the door. Go on in. Someone is supposed to be waiting for you. Walsh adjusted his weapons belt. Good. I have to drive this one back tonight. Can you believe it? Won't even let us wait until morning. 
That Lord Rawl is as demanding as they come. The guard grunted as if he well understood the annoyance of night duty. Oh, Walsh added, as if an afterthought. Lord Rawl also wanted to know if his representative could pay the Lord Rawl's respects to His Excellency. The guard shrugged. Sorry, Jagang took out of here this morning. He took most everyone with him. Just left a few behind to mind things. Clarissa's heart sank with disappointment. Nathan had been hoping that Jagang would be here, but he had said that even though he hoped it, Jagang would likely be smarter than that. Jagang wasn't one to trust his life to the unknown abilities of a wizard as powerful as Nathan. Walsh took Clarissa's arm and pushed her on ahead as he gave the guard a good-natured slap on the shoulder. Thanks. Yeah, just go on in down the hall. There's one of the women waiting there for you. Last I saw her, she was pacing by the second set of torches. Walsh and Bolsden were Imperial Order soldiers, and they had had no trouble with any of the other soldiers either. Clarissa dreaded to think what would have happened to her without those two the times their coach had been stopped by troops to query its mission. Walsh and Bolsden also had little trouble ushering her through checkpoints. Clarissa remembered all too well what happened to the women in Renwald. She still had nightmares about what she had seen happening to Manda Perlin when the Order's troops captured Renwald. And right there, on the floor beside her murdered husband, Rupert. Their footsteps echoed as they hurried down the stone corridor. It was a dark, dank, and depressing place. It looked to Clarissa to have no comforts other than a few wooden benches. This was a place for soldiers, not a place for families to live. As the guard had said, the woman was waiting near the second set of torches. Yes, the woman asked. What is it? As Clarissa came to a stop before the woman, she could see in the torchlight that her face was badly battered. She had horrid-looking cuts and bruises. One side of her lower lip was swollen to twice normal size. Even Walsh moved back a little when he got a good look at her. I am to meet Sister Amelia. His Excellency's plenipotentiary sent me. The woman slumped with relief. Good. I am Sister Amelia. I have the book. I hope never to see it again. His Excellency's plenipotentiary also told me that I am to pay his respects to an acquaintance of his, Sister Verna. Is she here? Well, I don't know if I should... If I'm not allowed to see her, His Excellency will be most unhappy when his plenipotentiary reports how his request was so rudely treated by a slave. As a slave myself serving His Excellency, I can tell you that I will not be the one to take the blame. Clarissa felt foolish saying such words, but as Nathan had told her, they seemed to work magic. Sister Amelia's eyes fixed on the gold ring through Clarissa's lip. Her hesitation vanished. Of course. Please follow me. That is where the book is kept anyway. With Walsh close at her side and his hand near the hilt of his short sword, Clarissa followed Sister Amelia deeper into the gloomy fortress. They went down a long hall and then took a turn. Clarissa was paying careful attention as they went so that if they had to get out fast, she wouldn't take a wrong route and be caught in here. Sister Amelia stopped before a door, glancing to Clarissa for just an instant before she lifted the lever and led them in. A woman and a man were in the room, he sitting at a simple plank table reading a book laid open on the table, and she looking over his shoulder. The woman glanced up. She was a little older than Clarissa and attractive with curly brown hair. She looked to Clarissa to be a woman of authority crushed by humiliation. She looked in agony. Whether it was physical or emotional, Clarissa didn't know. Sister Amelia held out a hand. This is Verna. Verna straightened. She had a gold ring in her lip, the same as Sister Amelia, the same as Clarissa. The man, his curly blonde hair in disarray, didn't look up. He seemed frantically absorbed in his book. Pleased to meet you, Clarissa said. Verna turned back to the man and the book he was studying. Clarissa pushed back her hood as she turned to Sister Amelia. The book? Sister Amelia bowed. Of course, it's right here. She scurried to a shelf. The room wasn't large. One of the stone block walls had a crudely built shelf holding books. There were perhaps no more than a hundred. Nathan had been hoping there would be a great many more. As Nathan had expected, though, Jagang wouldn't keep many of his prizes together in one place. Sister Amelia pulled a volume from a shelf and placed it on the table. She looked to be uncomfortable, even touching it. This is it. 
The cover was as Nathan had described it to her, a strange black that seemed to absorb the light from the room. Clarissa flipped open the cover. What are you doing? Sister Amelia cried out as she stepped closer. Clarissa looked up. I was instructed how to make sure it is the right book. Please leave it to me. Sister Amelia stepped back, wringing her hands together. Of course. But I can tell you only too well that it's the right book. It's the one His Excellency agreed to. Clarissa carefully turned over the first page as Sister Amelia nervously licked her lips. Verna watched from the corner of her eye. Clarissa reached inside her cloak and pulled out the little leather pouch of powder Nathan had given her. She sprinkled it over the open page. Words began to appear. Assigned to the Winds by Wizard Ricker. It was the book she had come for. Nathan hadn't known the name of the wizard, but he had told her it would say, Assigned to the Winds, and then a name. She flipped the cover closed. Sister Amelia, would you leave us for a moment, please? The woman bowed and quickly scurried out of the room. Verna frowned as she straightened again. What's this about? May I see your ring, please? My ring? Verna finally sighed and held out her hand, showing Clarissa the ring on her third finger. It had the sunburst pattern, as Nathan had described. Why do you want to see... For the first time, Verna noticed Clarissa's guard. Her eyes went wide. She jostled Warren's shoulder while she spoke. Walsh? Warren's head came up. Walsh smiled. How you doing, prelate? Warren? Not very well. Clarissa stepped closer. The man, Warren, was looking very puzzled. I was sent by Lord Rawl to get this book. Clarissa gave Verna and Warren both a meaningful look. I am bonded to Lord Rawl. Richard is dead, Verna said in a flat whisper. I know, but I was sent by Lord Rawl, Nathan Rawl, the master of Dahara. He wanted me to pass along his regards. Verna's mouth fell open. Warren's chair skidded across the floor as he rushed to his feet. Do you understand? Clarissa carefully asked. If you do, then you had better be quick about it. But Nathan, we couldn't... Well, Clarissa said, I must be getting back to Lord Rawl. He's waiting for me. I have a coach, and I must be leaving at once. Verna's eyes turned up to Walsh. He gave her a nod. Verna fell to her knees. She snatched Warren's violet robes and yanked him down beside her. Do it, Warren! She folded her hands together as she bowed her head. Her words spilled out. Master Rawl, guide us. Master Rawl, teach us. Master Rawl, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Warren spoke the words, too just a little in her wake. Verna knelt frozen for a moment, her hands still folded together prayerfully. She suddenly let out a cry of joy. She laughed like a madwoman. Thank the Creator. My prayers have been answered. I'm free. He's gone. I can feel that he's gone from my mind. Clarissa sighed in relief. Nathan had warned her that if Verna failed to do as they had hoped, she would have to die here. Verna and Warren hugged as they wept with joy. Clarissa seized them both and urged them up. We have to get out of here, but Lord Rawl wants me to do something else first. I need to look for some books. Books? Warren asked. What books? Mountain's Twin, Celeron's Seventh Task, The Book of Inversion and Duplex, and Twelve Words Left for Reason. Warren turned to the book on the table. Twelve words, that's this one here. I think I saw a couple of the others. Clarissa went to the shelves. Help me look. Nathan wants to know if they are here. He needs to know. They all scanned the titles on the spines and had to pull out several that weren't marked so as to check their titles. They found all but the Book of Inversion and Duplex. Clarissa brushed the dust from her hands. That will have to do. Nathan said that they might not all be here. With only one missing, that's better than we could have hoped. What does Nathan want with these books? Warren asked. He doesn't want your gang to have them. He says that they're dangerous for Jagang to have. They all could be dangerous, Verna said. Let me worry about that, Clarissa said, as she slipped the book from the table back into an empty slot. Nathan just needed to know which were here. Now we can leave. Verna clutched Clarissa's sleeve. I have two friends here. We have to get them out with us. You said you have a coach. We can all go. Who? Walsh asked. Janet and Amelia. Walsh let out a knowing grunt as Clarissa glanced to the door. But Nathan said, Look, if they give their oath to, to Lord Rawl also, they can escape. Verna touched the ring in Clarissa's lip. 
You don't know what they do to the women here. Did you see Amelia's face? I know what they do, Clarissa whispered, remembering the scenes in Renwald. Will they take the oath? Of course. Wouldn't you if it would get you away from here? Clarissa swallowed. I'd do anything. Hurry then, Walsh said. There's room in the coach, but we have to hurry. Verna nodded and then slipped out the door. While Verna went to get the other two, Clarissa unhooked the clasp on the fine gold chain around her neck. Warren watched with a frown as Clarissa pulled a book from a lower shelf and then set it on the table. Clarissa placed the locket on the shelf in the empty slot. Carefully, she laid open the locket. With a finger, she gently pushed it all the way back against the wall. She wiggled her fingers at Warren. He handed back the book she had removed. Clarissa slid it back into its place. What did you do? Warren asked. What Nathan wanted me to do. Verna burst back into the room, holding the hands of two beaming women. One was the one with the battered face, Sister Amelia. They've given the oath, Verna said in a breathless voice. They are bonded to Lord Rahl. Let's get out of here. About time, Walsh said. He had a little smile on his face for Verna. It was obvious to Clarissa that they knew each other. Walsh took a hold of Clarissa's arm, and the two of them let out the rest to retrace their route back through the fortress. The dark, dripping stones smelled of rot. They saw only a few guards inside the stronghold, most people having left along with Jagang, gone to his huge tents. Nathan said that Jagang traveled with a large contingent of people and that he had big round tents with all the comforts of a palace. Of the people left behind, there seemed to be a scattering of officers and guards and a few of the women who were slaves to Jagang and his army. As they came around a corner, one of those slaves was coming the other way carrying two steaming kettles of what smelled like lamb stew. She was dressed the same as the other women Clarissa had seen, except Verna. The clothes they wore, like Janet and Amelia, were not clothes as far as Clarissa was concerned. The women might as well have been naked for all the good those transparent garments did. When the woman looked up and saw them coming, especially Walsh, she immediately stepped to the side of the hall out of their way. Clarissa jerked to a halt, staring at the woman, whose gaze fixed on the floor. Manda? Clarissa whispered. Manda Perlin, is that you? Manda looked up. Yes, mistress? Manda, it's me, Clarissa. From Renwald. I'm Clarissa. The young woman looked up the length of Clarissa, at her expensive gown, at her jewelry, at her hair all done in ringlets. Manda's gaze met Clarissa's, and her eyes widened. Clarissa, is it really you? Yes. I don't hardly recognize you. You look so different. You look so... The spark went out of her expression. Were you captured back home too, then? I see the ring. No, I wasn't captured. Manda's eyes filled with tears. Oh, good. I'm so glad they didn't get you there. It was... Clarissa hugged the young woman. Manda had never spoken this many words to her in all the years Clarissa had known her, and the words she had spoken hadn't been decent. Clarissa had always hated Manda for the cruel words, the cruel smirks, the condescending glances. Now Clarissa felt sorrow for her. Manda, we have to go. Would you like to come away with us? Verna snatched Clarissa's arm. We can't do that. Clarissa glared at Verna. I came here to rescue you. I let you take your friends with us. I want to take my friend out of here, too. Verna sighed and let go of Clarissa's arm. Of course. Friend? Manda whined as her face twisted with untold sorrow. Yes, Clarissa said. I could get you out of here, too. You would do that for me? After all the times I... Sobbing, Manda threw her arms around Clarissa. Oh, yes. Oh, Clarissa, please. Oh, Clarissa, please let me go with you. Clarissa gripped the woman's wrists and pushed her away. Then listen carefully. I give you only one chance. My master has magic to protect your mind from the Dreamwalker. You must swear an oath to him. You must be loyal to him. Manda fell to her knees, clutching at Clarissa's dress. Yes, I swear. Then say these words, and you must mean them with all your heart. Clarissa spoke the devotion, pausing to let Manda repeat the words. When she finished, Verna and Clarissa helped the sobbing woman to her feet. Clarissa had always been so intimidated by Manda, always so afraid of her scorn. 
How many times had Clarissa crossed the street, her head bowed low, as she tried to avoid Manda's attention? Hurry now, Walsh said. Nathan told us to get out of here fast. At the entrance, Walsh had to make up a story about His Excellency's plenipotentiary wanting some women. The guard eyed the nearly naked women, smiled knowingly, and slapped Walsh on the back. They all piled into the coach as Walsh climbed up into the driver's seat with Bolsden. As the coach lurched and then started out, Clarissa pushed Janet and Manda to the floor in the center so she could lift the leather-covered seat. She pulled out a long cloak. She only had one extra. They had expected to rescue Verna and Warren. Since Verna had a cloak, Clarissa gave the extra cloak to Manda and retrieved blankets for Janet and Amelia. All three women were immensely grateful to be able to cover themselves at last. Clarissa sat at the end of the seat, holding the strange black book Nathan had sent her for, with Amelia at the other end and Manda in the center, clutching at Clarissa for comfort. Page 465. Manda kept weeping on Clarissa's shoulder and thanking her profusely. Clarissa put an arm around Manda and told her that she had expressed her gratitude enough time. It did feel good, though, to have the beautiful Manda Perlin looking up to Clarissa for a change, rather than looking down on her, all because of Nathan. How he had changed her life, changed everything. They had to stop three times while soldiers checked the coach. Once, the soldiers made them all get out and line up for a look. The blankets and cloak had to remain in the coach as Janet, Amelia, and Manda climbed out for an inspection. Walsh explained in very crude terms what he was doing with these slaves, how he was taking them for the pleasure of His Excellency's plenipotentiary. The soldiers were satisfied by Walsh's explanation and allowed them to continue on their way. They turned north at the harbor and headed up the coast road. Clarissa sighed in relief as she saw the last of the fires and tents finally fade into the distance behind them. It wasn't until they crested a hill, nearly an hour's ride out after leaving the last of the soldiers, that the flash lit the sky behind. Clarissa heard a cheer from up on the driver's seat. Walsh leaned down, gripping a rail with one arm, and stuck his face nearly upside down, partly into the window. Good job, Clarissa! You did it! Clarissa grinned. He swung back up, and he and Bolsden hooted into the night air. It was then that the sudden boom reached them, making Manda jump with fright. Verna, sitting in the center opposite, produced a flame above her upturned palm and leaned toward Clarissa. Job, what is it that you have done? Clarissa patted the inky black book in her lap. Nathan sent me for this book, and he wanted the ones left behind destroyed. He said that they were dangerous, what with you, and especially Warren, telling Jagang the meaning of the prophecies in them. Nathan didn't want Jagang to be able to use the information. I see, Verna said. Lucky for us that we agreed to swear loyalty to Lord Rall and go with you. Clarissa nodded. Nathan said I was to offer you the chance, but in either case I was to open that locket and leave it hidden there. He said that Jagang, having both Warren and the prophecies together, could ruin everything if you told Jagang anything important. Verna pressed her lips together as she let out a breath. She shared a look with Warren. I can't believe that after all this time, I'm finally going to get to meet the prophet himself, Warren said. Not long ago I had given up hope, and now I will be meeting Nathan, Verna harumphed. Out of the rain and into the lake, I can't believe I've sworn loyalty to that crazy old man. Clarissa leaned forward. Nathan is dashing. He isn't old. Verna barked a laugh. You have no idea, child. And he isn't crazy either. Nathan is the kindest, most wonderful, most generous man I've ever met. Verna glanced down at Clarissa's cleavage and back up to her eyes. She had that look that Clarissa was used to seeing. Yes, Verna murmured. I'm sure he is, my dear. You could have no better man to swear loyalty to, Clarissa said. Besides being thoughtful and kind, Nathan is a powerful wizard. I saw him turn another wizard to a pile of dust. Verna's brow creased. Another wizard? Clarissa nodded. Named Vincent. Vincent and another wizard and two sisters, Jodell and Wilhelmina, came to see Nathan. They tried to hurt him. Nathan turned Vincent into a pile of ash. Verna's eyebrows rose. After that, Clarissa said, they were very polite to Nathan, and Jagang agreed to give the book. 
She tapped the book on her lap to Nathan. Jagang said Nathan could have either the book or Sister Amelia. Now Nathan will have both. Nathan has great plans. Nathan will rule the world one day. Berna and Warren shared a sidelong glance. She looked at Amelia. What is this book, Amelia? I stole it from the Temple of the Wind, Amelia said in a hoarse voice. I'm the only one who can use it. I started a plague. Thousands have already died because of what I did. It was how Jagang eliminated Richard Rall. Thank the Creator that we still have Nathan Rall to protect us with the bond to him. Dear Creator, Verna whispered, what have we agreed to with our oath to the likes of Nathan? Chapter 63 Richard rose from the wizard's chair when he recognized the spirit gliding toward him. He couldn't call a specific spirit, and he didn't always know the ones who came, but he knew this one. With this one he had a deep connection. The person this spirit once was he had loathed, he had feared. Only once he understood her, and only after he had forgiven her for what she had done to him was he able to gain his release. This one he had killed, and in so doing he freed her from her torment. This spirit was the one who had later brought Kalin and Richard together in that place between worlds. Richard, the spirit said, as she seemed to smile. Dena. I see you wear a Nigel. It is not mine. Richard slowly shook his head. It is that of yet another moored Sith who died because of me. Raina. I knew her in the world of life, and I know her here. Since she passed into the spirit world after the violation of the winds, she may not come to you here. She is not one of those who hold sway over the forces involved as they pertain to you and the winds. Know that her spirit is at peace. You gave her peace in life, and so she asked me to come to you. Richard rolled the red Aegeal in his fingers. I gave your Aegeal to Kalin, as I promised you one time, only she is able to give me more pain than you. Only you, Richard, are able to give yourself more pain than I could give you. Have it your way. I care not to argue. It is good to see you, Denna. You may disagree after I am finished with you. Richard smiled at her nature showing through, even in her spirit form. You cannot harm me here, Denna. You think not? I may not be able to harm your body, but I can still hurt you. She nodded to herself. Oh, yes, Richard, I can hurt you. And how is that? Denna lifted an arm. I can make you remember. Remember and make it real again. You and I have a past. Richard spread his hand. And to what purpose? Denna spread her luminous arms. That is for you to decide, Richard. With a flash of light in his mind, the Temple of the Winds was gone, fading from his consciousness and he was in a place he remembered, the castle in Tamarang. He was there again. He could taste the terror. Denna had captured him. She had tortured him for days. He was delirious and weak. Every step was painful as he followed Denna through the grand dining hall. His wrists were cut and swollen from the manacles she used to shackle him up to a beam. When Denna stopped and spoke to people, Richard kept his eyes to her braid as he silently waited behind her. Denna controlled his life, his destiny. He was allowed only that which she granted. He hadn't eaten since she had captured him. He longed to eat something, anything. All around, the jumble of talking and laughter from the queen's guests droned in his head. Denna, too, was a guest of the queen. Richard, at the end of a chain, running from his mistress to a collar around his neck, was Denna's prisoner. She hadn't let him eat during those days of torture, and he needed food. As she sat at the dining table, Denna snapped her fingers pointing at the floor behind her chair. Richard sank to the floor, relieved to be allowed that small comfort. He could rest. He wasn't hanging from the shackles. He wasn't being made to stand all night. He wasn't being tortured. All of the guests were eating. The varied aromas tormented him. He ached with hunger. Everyone else was eating, but he had to sit on the floor behind Denna, watching what others enjoyed, what he was denied. Richard thought about the times he had been with Kalin at camp eating rabbit cooked over the fire or porridge sweetened with berries. He licked his lips thinking about the succulent, hot, tender meat, brown and crunchy on the outside from the fire. 
He had so enjoyed those meals with her. The food and the company were the best. Now he was denied that life and was yoked to another. After everyone else had been eating for a while, a server brought a bowl of gruel. Denna had him hand it down to Richard. He held it in trembling hands. Almost any time before, he would have cast it aside in disgust, but now it was all he had. He was made to put it on the floor and to eat it like a dog, while laughter from the guests filled his ears. He didn't care. He was being allowed to eat at last. Gruel was all he was allowed, but at that moment, in his state of tormented need, it was wonderful. It was freedom from the ache of hunger, freedom from the misery of seeing others eat while he starved, fulfillment of a simple but long-denied need. He slurped at it, relishing it, gulping it down. He could not escape his imprisonment in his new life, over which he had no say and so he decided that if gruel was all he would be allowed, then he would have to accept that fact and sate his hunger with what he was given. The light flashed in his head. Color bled from his sight, vanishing almost painfully, and he saw again the muted mists of the Temple of the Winds around him. Richard was on his hands and knees on the floor, panting in terror. The glowing white spirit of Denna towered over him. Denna was right. She could hurt him still. This pain, though, she had given him out of love. Richard staggered to his feet. How could he have thought he was ignorant before and that the knowledge of the Temple of the Winds had brought him new sight? He had had sight all along, but had failed to see. Knowledge without heart was empty. Wizard Ricker had left, with the sliff, a message for him, but he had ignored it. Ward left in, ward right out, guard your heart from stone. He had failed to guard his heart from stone, and it had almost cost him everything. Thank you, Denna, for that gift of pain. It has taught you something, Richard? That I have to go home, back to my world. Thank you, Richard, for living up to what I expect of you. Richard smiled. Were you not a spirit, I'd kiss you. Denna smiled a sad smile. The thought is the gift, Richard. Richard shared a gaze with her for a moment a gaze between worlds. Denna, please tell Raina that we all love her. Raina knows this. Feelings of the heart cross the boundary. Richard nodded. Then you know how much we love you, too. That is why I came to vouch for you in your quest to the wind. Richard held his arm out. Would you escort me to the passageway? I would find peace in your company before I leave this empty place. The worst is yet ahead of me. Denna glided along at his side as he headed for the passageway out, striding the Hall of the Winds for the last time. They didn't speak. Words were too paltry to touch what was in his heart. Near the great doors, the spirit of Dark and Rawl waited. Going somewhere, my son. The sound of his words echoed painfully through the hall. Richard glared at the spirit of his father. Back to my world. There is nothing for you there. Kaelin, your true love, is married to another man. She has sworn an oath to him before the spirit. You could never understand why I'm going back. Kaelin is married to my son, Drefen. You cannot have her now. That is not why I'm going back. Then why leave this place? The world of life will be empty for you now. Richard stalked past the spirit of his father. He didn't have to explain his reasons to the one who had caused so much grief. Denna glided along beside Richard. At the doors, Dark and Rawl appeared again, blocking the way. You may not leave. You can't stop me. Oh, yes, my son, I can. You must let him pass, Denna said. Only if he agrees to the terms. Richard turned to Denna. What's he talking about? The spirits set the requirements for your path into our world. Because it was your unique path here, Dark and Raw was called upon and given commensurate sway over your price for coming here, your sacrifice to come here. Dark and Raw set the more onerous of the sacrifices, such as Dref and marrying Kaelin. If one who participated in your coming so chooses, this spirit also has the right to set requirements if you are to leave. I will simply banish him, Richard said. I know how to do that now. I can banish him from the winds and then leave. It is not that simple, Denna said. You traveled from the world of life, through the underworld, to this place within the world of souls. 
you must return through the underworld. The spirits can set a price. It must, however, be one that is fair, in view of the forces in the worlds involved, and it must be a price within your ability to satisfy. Richard ran his fingers back through his hair. And I must pay? If he names a price within the edict, then you must, if you are to return to your world. Smiling that vile smile of his, Dark and Raoul glided closer. I only have two small, insignificant requirements. Meet them, and you may return to your brother, Drefen, and his wife. Richard glared. Name them. But if you set the price too high, and I choose not to pay it and remain here instead, then I swear I will devote my eternity to making your soul twist in torment. And you know I can do it. The winds have taught me how. Then I guess you will have to decide just how important this is to you, my son. I think you will pay it. Richard didn't want to tell him how important it was or the price would climb. Name the price, and I will decide if I will pay it. I was willing to stay here. I may yet decide to do so. Dark and Rawl came closer, close enough that the pain of his spirit coruscation was almost enough to make Richard back away. He willed himself to hold his ground without a shield of magic. Oh, the price is going to be high indeed, but I think you will pay it. I know you, Richard. I know your foolish heart. Even this price you will pay for her. Dark and Rawl did indeed know Richard's heart. Dark and Rawl, after all, was the one who had almost destroyed it. Name the price or be gone. First, the knowledge of the Temple of the Winds was not yours before you came to this place. You will return as you came, without the knowledge you acquired here. Back in your world, you will be as you were before you left it. Richard had expected as much. Agreed. Oh, very good, my son. How eager, how earnest you are. Will you agree to the second requirement so readily? His smile seemed as if it would strip flesh from bone. I wonder. His voice went on in a lethal hiss. When Dark and Rawl named the second requirement, Richard's knees nearly buckled. Can he do that? Richard could manage no more than a whisper. Can he demand that? Denna stared back with somber spirit eyes. Yes. Richard turned away from the two spirits. Head bent, he pressed his hand over his eyes. It is that important to me, he whispered. I agree to the price. I knew you would. Dark and Rawl's malevolent laugh echoed the length of the Temple of the Wind. I knew that even this you would pay for her. Richard gathered his senses. He slowly turned, lifting his hand toward the evil spirit. And with this price, you have shown me your barren spirit. In that, dear father, you have made a mistake, for I can now use that emptiness against you. The laughter died out. You have agreed to the price I have set within my right and power. You can do nothing but banish me from the winds, and that will not negate the price. The world of souls will enforce it now that it is named and accepted. So they will, Richard said. But you will taste my revenge for all you have done, including the price you have demanded, when you could have stopped with the first as fair. Richard freed a pristine flow of subtractive magic, uncontaminated by so much as a scintilla of the additive. It was the force of the void unleashed. Total oblivion of light engulfed the spirit of Dark and Rawl. A wail came from that deep forever as Dark and Rawl was plunged into the unmitigated shadow of the Keeper of the Underworld, where not the slightest trace of light from the Creator shone. It was the pain of denial of that light that was the true torture of the Keeper's dark eternity. When he was gone, Richard turned once more to the passageway back to the world of life. I am sorry, Richard, came Denna's tender voice. None but he would have demanded this of you. I know, Richard whispered, as he called the lightning to take him back. Dear spirit, I know. Chapter 64 Dreffen hooked his hand under her arm and pulled her shoulder against him. At the white ruffles of his shirt hung two red aegils. Isn't it about time you ended this pretense, my wife? 
Isn't it about time you gave in to your desires and admitted your hunger for me? Kalin glared into his blue, dark and raw eyes. Are you really mad, Drefan, or do you just pretend it? I agreed to wed you to save Lai, not because I wanted it. When will you ever admit it to yourself? I do not love you, nor will I ever. Love? When have I ever mentioned love? I speak of passion. You are delusional if you think I will ever... You already have. You want it again. It cut her to the heart that he had so easily deduced what had happened with Richard. He pointed it out constantly. He taunted her for it. It was her eternal punishment for what she had done, a stain she couldn't annul. Distant thunder rumbled through the mountains as the spring storm that had come so suddenly moved on away from the city. The wild lightning had reminded Kalin of Richard. She had stood at the window watching the violent flashes, remembering. Never. You are my wife. You have sworn an oath. Yes, Drefan, I have sworn an oath, and I am your wife. I will live by my word. But the spirits are satisfied with what I have given. They demand no more, or the plague would not be gone. She pulled her arm away. If you want me, then you will have to rape me, for that is what it will be. I will not go to your bed willingly, nor easily. His smile was maddening. I can wait until you finally give in to your lust. I want you to enjoy it. I long for you finally to admit it, to ask for it. He stalked away, but turned back when she called his name. What are you doing with Kara and Berdine's Aegeel? Touching an Aegeel was painful only if it was one that had been used against you in the past, if you had been the prisoner of a Mord Sith. Aegeel were weapons only in the hands of the Mord Sith to whom they belonged, but without the bond to a true Lord Rahl they no longer functioned. For Drefin they were nothing more than obscene decoration. He lifted the red rods away from his chest to have a look at them. Well, I thought that since I am the Lord Rall now, I should wear these as a symbol of my authority. After all, Richard wore one. You wear one. The Aegeal we wear are not symbols of authority. They are symbols of our respect for the women to whom they belong. He shrugged as he let them drop back down. The army seems quite intimidated to see me wearing them. That will do. Good night, my dear. Sleep well. His sly smile returned. Call out if you have need of anything. Muttering a curse under her breath, Kalen shouldered open the door to her rooms. She was exhausted and wanted only to fall into bed, but she knew that her racing mind would deny her sleep. Berdine was waiting for her. Is he gone to bed? she asked, referring to Drefin. Yes, Kalen said, as I am about to do. No, you can't. You have to come with me. Kalin frowned at the serious look on Berdine's face. Where do you want me to go? We have to go up to the keep. What's wrong? Is it the sliff? Has someone tried to come through the sliff? Berdine waved dismissively as she stepped closer. No, no, it's not the sliff. Then what is it? I just want you to come up there with me, that's all. I want some company. Kalin stroked her hand down the woman's shoulder. Berdine, I know how lonely you are, but it's late. I have a headache, and I'm tired. All afternoon and evening I've been in meetings with Drefin, General Kurson, and a number of officers. Drefin wants to move the troops back to Dahara, for us all to go to Dahara. He wants to abandon the Midlands to the Order and concentrate on defending Dahara. I've been arguing myself blue. I need to go to bed and get some rest so I can get up in the morning and try again to convince them of the folly of Drefin's plan. The general isn't so sure that Drefin isn't right. I am. Leap later. You are coming up to the keep with me. Kalin gazed into the Mord Sith's eyes. And that was what they were. Mord Sith eyes. This was not Berdine speaking. It was Mistress Berdine, as cold and demanding as any Mord Sith came. Not until you tell me why, Kalin said in a level tone. Berdine seized Kalin's arm. You are going up to the keep with me. You can either go sitting in the saddle or lying over it. Your choice. But you are going, and you are going now. Kalin had never seen such a look of determination in Berdine's eyes. It was frightening. That was the only word for it. Frightening. All right, if it's that important to you, let's go. I just want to know why. Instead of answering, Berdine tightened her grip on Kalin's arm and forced her to the door. 
Berdine cracked the door, checking, then opened it enough to stick her head out for a look. It's clear, she whispered. Come on. Berdine, you're scaring me. What's going on? Without answering, Berdine shoved her through the door. They took the service stairs and avoided the passageways that were heavily patrolled. Berdine must have spoken with the guards they did encounter because when the two of them approached, the guards turned the other way, looking off as if they had seen no one. Two horses waited, both army horses, big bay gelding. Berdine tossed a soldier's cloak at Kalin. Here, put this on to cover that white dress of yours so people won't recognize you, or Dreffen will hear about it. Why don't you want Dreffen to know where we're going? Berdine seized Kalin's ankle and stuffed her foot into the stirrup. The stirrup was big and loose, made for a man's boot. Berdine smacked Kalin's bottom. Get it up there. Kalin abandoned her resistance. Berdine obviously wasn't going to tell her what the urgency was about. The ride to the wizard's keep was silent, as was the march through the empty halls, passageway, and rooms. Before they turned down the last stone corridor to the slift, they encountered Kara standing guard outside a door. Kara, like Berdine, was unreadable in her stern demeanor as she watched Berdine and Kalin hurry toward her. At the door, Berdine seized the lever with one hand and Kalin's arm with the other. The look in Berdine's eyes was unequivocal sobriety. Don't you dare disappoint me, Mother Confessor, or you will find out exactly why Mord Sith are so feared. Kara and I will be with this lift. Without looking back, Kara started out toward the sliff while Berdine, without further word, opened the door and roughly shoved Kalin into the room. Kalin stumbled, catching her balance, as she glanced back to see Berdine pull shut the door. Kalin turned and found herself looking into Richard's eyes. Her heart seemed to stop along with her breathing. A half dozen candles in an iron stand reflected little points of light in his gray eyes. He seemed bigger than life. Every detail was as she remembered. Only his sword was missing from that of her mental image of him. Ambivalence kept her breath locked in her lungs. Finally, she found words. The plague is ended. I know. The room felt so small, the stone so dark, the air so heavy. She labored to breathe, to slow her suddenly racing heart. His forehead was beaded with sweat, even though it was cool in the depths of the keep. A drop rolled down over his cheekbone, leaving a wet trail. Then what are you doing here? There can be no point to it. I have a husband. We have nothing to say to each other, not after. Not here, like this, alone. His gaze left hers at hearing the cool tone of her voice. She had hoped it would force him to say it. Dear spirit, let him say he forgives me. He said instead, I asked. Kara and Berdine to bring you here so I could talk to you. I came back because I must speak with you. Will you grant me that much? Kalen didn't know what to do with her hand. Of course, Richard. He nodded his thanks. He looked in pain. He looked in anguish. His eyes had the dull gloss of distress. She wanted nothing so much as for him to say that he forgave her. Only that would mend her broken heart. Those were the only words that would mean anything to her. She wanted him to say it, but he just stood there while his gaze focused beyond the cold stone of the wall. She decided that if he was going to say it, to forgive her, then the only way was to force him into it. So have you come to forgive me, Richard? His words came softly, but with great resolve. No, I did not come to forgive you. I can't forgive you, Kaylin. She turned away. She finally found something to do with her hands. She pressed her fists against her stomach. I see. Kalen, he said from behind her, I can't forgive you because it would be wrong of me to come here to forgive you. Would you have me forgive your humanity? Shall I forgive you slaking your thirst? Shall I forgive your eating when you hunger? Shall I forgive you for the feel of warm sunlight on your face? Kalen wiped at her cheeks and then turned to him. What are you talking about? The stem of a rose was stuck behind his belt. Richard lifted the rose and held it out to her. Your mother gave this to me. My mother? Richard nodded. She asked if I found enjoyment in it. And when I told her that I did, she asked if I would then return to you. It took a long time for me to understand what she meant. And what did she mean? What she meant 
is that we have the capacity to enjoy such things. Is it wrong for you to find pleasure at the sight of a rose in its fragrance if I am not the one who gave it to you? How can I forgive you that? Richard, this is far different from finding pleasure in the fragrance of a rose. He sank to one knee. He put a fist to his abdomen. Kalen, I was once connected to a woman by my flesh as you were connected to your mother. That is the only connection of flesh we have in this life. His fist moved to his chest. It is here that we connect ever after that. We can be connected only in our heart. You did not give him your heart. That was mine and mine alone. The winds, the spirits, took their price from you. They left you with little, and you chose to take what was left and to live. You chose to be human. You chose to live life as best you could with what you had left of yourself. You fought for life. You simply took pleasure to which you were entitled. I do not own you. You are not my slave. There is nothing for me to forgive. You did not betray me in your heart. It would be presumption of the worst order if I came with an offer of forgiveness when you never betrayed me with your heart. Kaylin could feel herself trembling as she drew a breath. You hurt me, Richard. I thought my heart was safe with you. Always, no matter what, and you walked away from me. You promised it was. You wouldn't even let me try to explain. I know, he whispered. His other knee touched the floor as he bent at her feet, his head bowed. That is why I have returned. I have come to beg your forgiveness. I am the one who was wrong. I am the one who caused the true pain. I am the one who betrayed our hearts, not you. It is the worst sin I could commit, and I alone am guilty of it. I am without defense. There can be no excuse. I am so sorry for what I have done to you, Kalen. I cannot undo the wrong I have done. I have wounded your heart, and for that I throw myself before you and beg your forgiveness. I do not deserve it, and so cannot ask it. I can only beg it. The way he knelt at her feet, she towered over him. Will you forgive me, Richard? There is no room in my heart to hold anything for you but love, even though we cannot be together. Though I am free of my oath, you are sworn to another, and I must respect that. But I cannot help that I can love no other but you. If your heart wishes it, then I forgive you. Please, Kalen, all I can have in this life, if you will grant it, is your forgiveness. Mere moments before, she had had doubts, been uncertain as to her true feelings about him. Now absolute conviction avalanched through her. Kalin sank down to the floor before him. She put her hands to his shoulders and urged him to look up at her. I forgive you, Richard. With all my heart, I love you and I forgive you. He smiled a sad smile. Thank you. She could feel the miracle of her heart mending, of joy flooding into the emptiness like life itself returning. At the ceremony, when I was being married to Drefen, I said the words aloud that they demanded, but in my mind, in my heart, I was saying the oath of marriage to you. Richard wiped a tear from her chin. I did the same. She squeezed his arms. Richard, what are we going to do now? There is nothing to do now. You are sworn to Drefen. He touched her fingers to his face. But what about you? What about you and me? His smile left. He shook his head. It doesn't matter. I have what I needed, what I came for. You have returned my heart. But how can we go on like this? Not only that, but we have to do something and fast. Drefin wants to withdraw the troops back to Dahara and make a stand against the order there. Anger flashed in Richard's eyes. No, you can't let him do that, Kalin. If you let Jagang divide the new world, he will take it one piece at a time, with Dahara the last to fall. You can't let Drefin do that. Promise me you won't. I don't need to promise. You are Lord Rahl. You can stop it now. I am the Mother Confessor. We'll do it together. You must do it, Kalen. I can't help you. But why not? You've returned. Everything will work out. We'll think of something. Find a way. You are the Seeker. You always find a way. I'm dying. Ice flashed through her. What? What do you mean you're dying? Richard, you can't die, not now, not after. No, Richard, no. It's all right now. You're back. Everything is going to be all right. 
He saw it then, the pain in his eyes, and realized when he slumped to a hip that he was unable to stand. In order for me to return, the spirits demanded a price. He coughed, wincing in pain. She clutched at him. What are you talking about? What price? When I was there at the Temple of the Winds, I gained all the knowledge there. I understood my power. I could use it. I used it to stop the plague. I somehow interrupted the flow of power from the winds that made the Book of Magic work in this world. You mean that you no longer know how to do it? You mean the plague will come back? He lifted a hand to allay her fear. No, the plague will not return. But as the price of returning to this world, I was not allowed to keep the knowledge of the wind. I had to come back as I was before. But you mean that you are simply mortal like before? No, they demanded more. They demanded that if I was to return, I had to take the magic of the stolen book into myself to keep it from the rest of the world of life. What? Kalen breathed wide-eyed. You don't mean... I have the plague. She gripped his shoulder with one hand and felt his forehead with the other. He was burning with fever. Richard, why didn't you tell me before? He smiled through the pain. Forgiveness was all I needed, all I wanted. But I had to know it was true and not granted out of pity. Richard, you can't die, not now. Dear spirits, you can't die. The dear spirit had nothing to do with this. It was Dark and Rall who chose Drethen to be her husband as the price of the path into the winds, and Dark and Rall who demanded this as the price of my return. Your return? Don't tell me that you only came back to die. Oh, Richard, why would you do such a foolish thing? If I had stayed at the Temple of the Winds, I would eventually have died, but without your forgiveness. I chose instead to return and hope that a part of you still loved me enough to forgive me so I could die with that much at least, with your love back. I couldn't go on knowing what I had done to you, knowing how I had hurt your heart. And you don't think this hurts my heart? Richard, there has to be something we can do. What can we do? Please, you must have known. Richard fell onto his side, holding his stomach. I'm sorry, Kalen. There is nothing. I am absorbing the magic from the book that was stolen. When I die... The magic will die with me. Kalen crouched over him, clutching at him as the tears overwhelmed her. Richard, please don't do this. Please don't die. I'm sorry, Kalen. I can't stop it. I gladly paid the price. My heart is at peace now. He reached up and touched the Aegeal hanging from the chain at her throat. There was never a moment's hesitation once I understood. Denna helped me to understand. Kalen hugged him as he rolled onto his back. Richard, there must be something. You would have known what to do before they took the knowledge from you. Try to remember. Please, Richard, try to remember. His eyelids drooped. I need to rest. I'm sorry, I used all my strength. I need to rest a bit. Kalen gripped his hand in both of hers as she wept. It was all too overwhelming to endure. To have him back, only to lose him, was too crushing to endure. She opened his limp hand to press it to her cheek and saw something in his palm. She pulled back his fingers, and through the tears, she saw writing in the palm of his hand. It said, Find book. Destroy it to live. Kalen sprawled over his unconscious form and grabbed his other hand. It, too, had writing in it. Pinch of white sorcerer's sand on third page. One grain of black sorcerer's sand tossed on. There were three other words, but in her mind's state of chaotic disorder, she couldn't think of how to pronounce them. He knew he was going to forget, and before he did, he wrote a message to himself. He had even forgotten that he had written it. The book. She had to have the book. And then she was running, screaming as she went, Kara, Verdine, help me! Kara, Verdine! Both women dashed out of the Sliff's room, out onto the walkway beside the inky pool when they heard Kalen screaming their names as she raced into the tower room. Kalen grasped at their leather as she tried to explain. They each seized one of Kalen's arms and pressed her up against the wall. Slow down, Verdine said. We can't understand you, Kara said. Get your breath. Stop crying and get your breath. Richard, she tried to point, but they held her arms. Richard has the plague. 
I need the book. Verdine leaned in close. Lord Raoul has the plague? Kalin nodded frantically. I have to get the book. The book that was stolen from the Temple of the Winds. I have to get it or he will die. Kalin tore her arms away from them. Please help me. Richard has the plague. What do you need us to do? Kara asked. I'm going to the Old World. Protect him. The Old World? Verdine gasped. Do you know where the book is? Did he tell you where to find it? Did he give you any hint? Kalin shook her head. There wasn't time. She had to hurry. She had to go. I don't know where it is, but it's the only chance he has. He took on the magic of the plague in order to return to this world, in order to beg my forgiveness. He wanted to tell me he was sorry for hurting me. If we don't destroy the book, he'll die. Just so he could say he was sorry. He'll die. I have to go. But Mother Confessor, Verdine said, the old world is a big place. If Richard has the plague, how can you hope to find the book? In time. That was what she meant. How could she hope to find the book in time, before Richard died? Kalin gripped a fistful of red leather. I have to try. Protect Richard. Don't let Dreffen know that Richard is back. I don't know what Dreffen would do. Don't tell him. Kara was shaking her head. Don't worry about that. We won't tell Dreffen. We'll take care of Richard while you're gone. We'll hide him here in the keep. But hurry. If you can't find it, please come back before... Kalin rushed into the room with the Sliff. She raced to the Sliff's well. The Sliff smiled at seeing her. Do you wish... Travel. I need to travel now. To where do you wish to travel? The Old World. Where in the Old World? There are a number of places I know there. We can go to any you wish. I will take you. You will be pleased. Kalin pressed her hands to her head, growling in frustration as the Sliff started naming places Kalin had never heard of. The place you came to with Richard with your master when he went to get me. The first time I traveled with you. I know the place of which you speak. Kaylin hiked up her white dress and clambered up onto the wall of the well. That place. Take me there. Hurry. Your master's life is at stake. Protect Richard, Kaylin called out to Kara and Berdine. What should we tell Dreffen when he wants to know where you are? Berdine asked. I don't know. You'll have to think of something. We will care for Richard until you return, Kara said. May the good spirits be with you. Tell him I love him. If... Tell him I love him, she called out as the Sliff's silver arms swept Kalin from the top of the wall. Her voice was still echoing off the stone walls when Kalin was plunged into the quicksilver froth. She gasped in the Sliff, praying to the good spirits that they would help her find the book. With frantic effort, she swam into what in the past had been the silver rapture. Now there was only dark terror. Chapter 65 Anne leaned toward him. This is your fault, you know. Zed, sitting on the floor in the center of the room with her, glanced over. You broke her prized mirror. That was an accident, Anne insisted. You are the one who ruined their shrine. I was simply trying to get it clean. How was I to know that it would catch fire? They shouldn't have put all those dried flowers around it. You were the one who spilled that berry wine on her best dress. Anne turned her nose up. The pitcher was too full. You're the one who filled it. Besides, you broke his prized knife handle. He won't ever be able to find a burled wasen root like that one again. He was understandably upset. Zed harumphed. What do I know about sharpening knives? I'm a wizard, not a blacksmith. That would explain the incident with the elder's horse. They can't blame that on me. I didn't leave the gate open. At least I'm pretty sure I didn't leave it open. Anyway, there is bound to be another horse that fast he can buy. He can afford it. What I want to know is how you managed to turn his number three wife's hair that color green. Anne folded her arms. Well, it was an accident. I thought those herbs would make her hair smell good. I wanted to surprise her. But the elder's prized rabbit-skin headdress, that was no accident. That was plain laziness. You should have checked it sooner instead of leaving it to dry unattended over the fire. That headdress was a work of art. What with those thousands of beads? He won't easily replace such a nice headdress. Zed shrugged. Well, we never told them that we were any good at domestic tasks. We never told them that at all. Quite right, we didn't. It's not our fault if we didn't work out. We could have told them if they'd asked. 
We certainly could have. Anne cleared her throat into the silence. What do you think they are going to do with us? Both of them were sitting back to back, bound together with a coarse rope, while the meeting across the room dragged on. They still wore the wristbands that kept them from using their magic. Zed glanced across the room where a heated discussion was being conducted. The bare-headed elder, his number one wife, several influential members of the Sea Dok community who had claimed rights to use the services of the captives, and the Sea Dok shaman were all complaining to one another about troubles they had had. Zed couldn't understand all of the words, but he could understand enough to follow the deliberation. They've decided they want to cut their losses and rid themselves of their domestic slaves, Zed whispered to Anne. What's happening? Anne asked, when the chattering finally came to an end. What have they decided? Are they going to set us free? The eyes across the room all turned to the captives. Zed made a warning sound to Anne. I think maybe we should have been a little more attentive to our chores, Zed whispered over his shoulder. I think we're in a great deal of trouble. Why? What are they going to do, Anne mocked? Return us to the Nang Tong and demand their blankets back? Zed shook his head as the sea dok rose up. The shaman's necklaces jangled together. The elder thumped his staff. I wish they would. They want to get back all their costs and something toward the damages. They are going to take us on a journey. They have just decided that they can get the best price for us by selling us to cannibals. Anne's head swung around. Cannibals? That's what they said, cannibals. Zed, you were able to take the collar off your neck. Can't you get these confounded bracelets off our wrists? I think that now would be the time. I'm afraid we may end up in a cookpot with them still on us. Zed watched an angry elder and a seething shaman stalking toward them. Well, it's been fun, Anne, but I'm afraid the fun is over. Verna put an arm around Warren's waist, trying to help him as he stumbled along. As she followed behind Clarissa, who was following behind Walsh and Bolsdon, Janet hurried to the other side of Warren and lifted his arm, draping it over her shoulder. Are you sure? Verna whispered to Walsh. Here? Nathan wanted us to meet him in the Hagen Woods? Yes, Walsh said over his shoulder. That was the name he told me, too, Clarissa added. Verna let out an annoyed breath. It was just like Nathan to make them go into the Hagen Woods. Even if Richard had cleared them wristwith from this place, he still didn't like it. Verna always suspected Nathan of being dangerously unbalanced, and that he would want her to meet him here only confirmed it. Trailers of moss hung down like gauzy rags of the dead. Roots tripped their feet as they moved through the darkness. Unpleasant odors wafted in on the warm, humid air. Verna had never been this deep into the Hagen Woods before, and for good reason. How are you doing, Warren? she whispered. Fine, he mumbled in a groggy voice. It won't be long, Warren. It won't be long now. Just a little farther, and then it will be over. Nathan will help you. Nathan, he mumbled under his breath, must warn him. They came upon a massive stone block that was obviously worked by man. It was square. It was nearly covered with snaking tendrils and gnarled roots. More stones, like white bones in the moonlight, jutted up from the thick vegetation. She saw the low, jagged remains of a wall and columns looking like the ribs of a monster. Light shone through the undergrowth. The way it flickered, it appeared to be the light of a campfire. Walsh and Bolsden held aside the branches for the rest of them. The fire was set in a circle of rocks placed on the stone floor of old ruins. Beyond the fire, Verna could see the round wall of a large well, or something like a well. She had never known that this place was hidden in the Hagen Woods, but as infrequently as anyone went into the Hagen Woods, that wasn't surprising. Nathan, dressed like a rich nobleman, rose to greet them. He was tall and intimidating, especially without a Radahan around his neck. When he saw them all, he grinned that confident, raw grin. Walsh and Bolsden laughed aloud and received good-natured slaps on the back. Clarissa ducked under an arm, throwing hers around Nathan's midsection. He grunted when she squeezed with all her might and ardor. When she proudly held out the book, he took it from her. He gave her a private smile laden with meaning. Clarissa's eyes sparkled. Verna's eyes rolled. Verna, Nathan called out when he saw her. Glad you could make it. How good to see you, Lord Rao. 
You shouldn't scowl like that, Verna. You'll get wrinkles. He scanned the others. Janet, so you have joined us too. His brow tightened a bit. And Amelia. He looked to the other woman, standing off to the side. And who have we here? Clarissa held out an arm, wiggling her fingers, urging Manda forward. From underneath, Manda's fist tightened the cloak at her throat. He timidly stepped forward. Nathan, this is a friend of mine. Manda, from Renwald. Manda put a knee to the ground as she bowed deeply. Lord Rahl, my life is yours. Renwald. Nathan's brow twitched again as he glanced briefly at Clarissa. Yes. Well, glad you escaped from Jagang, Manda. I owe it all to Clarissa, Manda said as she came to her feet. She is the bravest woman I've ever seen. Clarissa giggled as she pressed herself to Nathan. Nonsense. I'm so thankful that the good spirits put you where they did, or I'd never have even known you were there. Nathan turned his attention back toward Verna. Who have we here? The young Warren, I presume. Verna did her best to smooth her own brow. Nathan, Lord Rawl. His grin cracked through the scowl. But we are old friends, Verna. I am still Nathan to you and all my old friends. Verna dipped her head as she bit the inside of her cheek. Nathan, she began again. You're right. This is Warren. Can you help him? He's just coming into prophecy. Just starting to have them. I took his collar off a while back and there is nothing to protect him from the gift. He's having the headaches. Nathan, he's in a bad way. I'll follow you anywhere if you will help him. Help him? Please, Nathan, I'm begging you. Nothing to it, Verna. I'd be delighted to help the boy, Nathan gestured. Bring him over here by the fire. Warren mumbled, trying to introduce himself, but he was nearly unconscious. Verna and Janet helped him down where Nathan pointed and balanced him upright. Nathan hiked up his trousers at his knees and lowered himself to the stone floor of the missing building, sitting cross-legged. He set the book beside him. His brow drew down in that raw frown as he studied Warren's face. He waved his hand at Verna and Janet, ordering them away. With a web, Nathan held Warren upright. He inched forward until their knees touched. Warren, Nathan called in that deep, commanding voice of his. Warren's eyes opened. Hold up your hand. Fingers extended, both Warren and Nathan held up their hands. They pressed their fingers together, their eyes fixed on each other. Let your Han flow into my fingertips, Nathan said in gentle prompting. Open the seventh gateway, close the others. You know of what I speak? Yes. That's a good lad. Do it then, it will make it easier if I have your help. A warm, mellow glow enveloped both men. The night air hummed with the power from that light. It was neither flame nor heat. Verna didn't know what Nathan was doing. She was somewhat astounded that Nathan did. Nathan had always been something of an enigma at the Palace of the Prophets. He had seemed an old man to her even when Verna was a young girl. He had always been regarded as, at the least, unbalanced, even by the most magnanimous of the sisters. There were those at the palace who didn't believe that Nathan had more than the slightest hint of the gift in anything but prophecy. Others suspected, but were never sure, that he was capable of much more than he ever showed them. There were others who were so terrified of him that they feared going to the rooms where he was confined, even though he had a Radahan around his neck. Verna had always considered Nathan trouble on two feet. Now she watched as this troublesome old lecher of a wizard did his best to save the life of the man Verna loved. At times, the light glowed more strongly in one man than the other before passing away and then coming back, as if it had forgotten something and then returned for it. Walsh and Bolsden loafed near the round stone wall behind Nathan, but the rest of the party watched transfixed. Verna had no more idea what Nathan was doing than did Manda. What unnerved Verna the most was when both men, their knees touching, their fingers pressed together, floated a few inches off the ground. She was relieved when they at last settled back down. Nathan clapped his hands together once. There, he announced. That should do it. Verna couldn't see how that could have possibly been enough to set the gift right in Warren. Warren, though, wore a wide grin. Nathan, that was marvelous. The headache is completely gone. I feel so clear-headed, so alive. Nathan picked up the inky book and stood. I enjoyed it too, my boy. 
took that gaggle of sisters near to three hundred years to do for me what I have just done for you. But then they were a misguided lot. He glanced Verna's way. Sorry, prelate, no slight intended. None taken. Verna rushed to Warren's side. Thank you, Nathan. I was so worried for him. You have no idea what a relief this is. Warren's face was losing the joyous look. Nathan, now that you have done this for me, I can see more clearly that we have inadvertently given Jagang insight into prophecy that Nathan cried out, Clarissa cried out, Verna froze. She could feel something sharp pressed to her back. Amelia had a dakra stabbed in the back of Nathan's thigh. Manda had a knife at Clarissa's throat. Janet was holding a weapon at Verna's back. Warren stiffened when Janet held a warning finger to him and then to the two soldiers. Don't you move a muscle, Nathan, Amelia said, or I let flow my Han and you are instantly dead. Warren is right, Janet said. He did, in fact, give His Excellency some very valuable information. Amelia! Janet! Verna cried out. What are you doing? Amelia turned a wicked smile on Verna. His Excellency's bidding, of course. But you swore the oath. We swore the oath in word only, not in our hearts. But you can be free of him. You don't need to serve Jagang. Had you told us true the first time, maybe. But once we tried and failed to hold the bond when Richard died, His Excellency punished us. We'll not take the chance again. Don't do this, Verna pleaded. We're friends. I came to save you. Don't do this, please. Swear the bond and you will be free. Oh, darling, I'm afraid she can't do that. It was not Amelia's voice alone, but more. It was the voice Verna had heard in her own head, Jagang. She felt herself suddenly trembling, just at hearing his tone and inflection in Amelia's voice. Now, my loyal and faithful plenipotentiary, hand over the book. Sister Amelia and I have more use of it. Nathan held it out to the side. With her other hand, the one not on the dakra in his leg, Amelia snatched back the book. Well, Nathan said, are you going to kill me or not? Oh, yes, I intend to kill you, Amelia said in Jagang's voice. You betrayed our bargain, Lord Ral. Besides, I don't like having subordinates who won't allow me into their mind. Before you die, I thought I'd let you watch how a real slave obeys orders. I thought you'd like to watch me cut your little darling Clarissa's throat. Breathe. Kaylin expelled the sliff from her lungs and with frantic need sucked in the alien air. Night crashed in around her. She refused to spare the time to fear the sudden vision, the sudden sound, to give it time to settle into place in her mind, and instead seized the stone wall to hoist herself out. A frightening sight to match the word she had already seen greeted her. With her vision enhanced by the sliff, she took in the whole scene at once in one slamming jolt. The instant she saw him, Kaylin knew this was Nathan. He looked like a Rahl, and Richard had told her about Nathan, tall, older, with long white hair to his shoulders. A woman had stabbed a Dakra into his leg and was holding it there. Kaylin had heard her name, Amelia, the one who had started the play. Kaylin saw Verna with a woman at her back. A young man stood frozen. Kaylin saw a beautiful young woman holding another woman by a fistful of hair done in ringlets. It could only be Clarissa. The woman's other fist held a knife at the terrified Clarissa's throat. As Kaylin had emerged from the sliff, she was conscious of the last part of the conversation that had just taken place and knew well the voice coming from the woman holding the dakra in Nathan's leg. Kaylin knew well the word Darlin. She remembered hearing that voice from the wizard Marlin, who had come to assassinate Richard. It was Jagang's voice. The image of the amulet Richard wore came unbidden into Kaylin's mind. It means only one thing and everything, cut. Once committed to fight, cut. Everything else is secondary, cut. Her training at the hands of her warrior father had been much the same, kill or be killed, never yield, never wait, attack. Richard was near death, near his last breath. She had no time to spare, no time to consider. She was committed, cut. In one fluid movement, she erupted from the sliff, dived out of the well, yanked a short sword free of the scabbard on the soldier standing right there, ducked her head, tumbled forward, and came up with the sword already whipping down. 
In the span of a heartbeat, before anyone had time to flinch, Kaylin was there. She had to stop Amelia before she released her magic into the Dakra in Nathan's leg or he would be dead. Like lightning, her sword descended, severing Sister Amelia's arm at the crook of her elbow. And then everything moved in a painfully slow dance. Kaylin could see the expression on every face. The woman Kaylin had just cut, Sister Amelia, was falling back with a cry. Already, Kaylin's sword was whirling to reverse her handhold as she followed her quarry down. Verna was spinning, a dakra in her own hand, toward a surprised woman behind her. The young man was diving toward the woman with the knife. Nathan's hands were coming up toward Clarissa. His scream cut through the night. Clarissa was reaching toward Nathan. The young woman holding her by the hair snarled with a vicious sneer and savagely cut through Clarissa's throat. Kaylin saw the spray of blood for only an instant before the night exploded with lightning from both Nathan and the young man. Her left hand now joined with her right. Kaylin slammed her sword down through Sister Amelia's heart, pinning her to the ground before the second soldier had his sword clear of his scabbard. Verna's Dakra expeditiously dispatched the woman behind her at the same time as the young woman with the knife took two bolts of lightning, shattering her in a red horror as Clarissa's body still collapsed toward the ground. The violence was over before comprehension could catch up with it. In a daze, Nathan staggered toward Clarissa's body. Kalen rushed past him and knelt beside Clarissa. The sight that greeted her brought a gasp. Kalen sprang up and put her hands against Nathan, stopping him. It's too late, Nathan. She's with the spirits now. Don't look. Please don't look. I saw in her eyes the love she had for you. Please don't look at her like this. Remember her the way she was. Nathan nodded. She had a good heart. She saved so many people. She had a good heart. Nathan lifted his arms. He held his palms out toward Clarissa's body. Intense light flared forth, flooding the dead woman with a brilliant blaze so radiant that the body couldn't be seen at its center. From the light of this fire and into the light, safe journey to the spirit world, Nathan whispered. When the light was gone, only ash remained. Nathan slumped. The vultures can have the rest of them. Verna tucked her dakra back up her sleeve. One soldier retrieved his sword from Amelia's body as the other sheathed his. The young woman looked in shock. Nathan, I'm so sorry. I gave Jagang the meaning of prophecy that helped him. I didn't want to, but he made me. I'm so sorry. Nathan's doleful azure eyes turned toward the young man. I understand, Warren. You didn't do it out of malice. The Dreamwalker was in your mind and you had no choice. You are free of him now. Nathan yanked the Dakra from his leg. He turned to Verna. You brought traitors to me, Verna. You brought assassins to me. But I realize you had not intended it. Sometimes prophecy overwhelms our attempts to outwit it and catches us unaware. Sometimes we think we are more clever than we are, and that we can stay the hand of fate if we wish it hard enough. Verna straightened her cloak on her shoulders. I thought I was saving them from Jagang. I never had any idea that they would give the oath to you without committing their heart. I understand, Nathan whispered. I don't know what goes through that head of yours, Nathan. Lord Rahl, indeed. Verna glanced to where Clarissa's body had been, and where now there was only white ash. And I see that you haven't changed your ways, Nathan. Once again, you've gotten another of your little whores killed. The impact of Nathan's fist lifted Verna clear off the ground. Her jawbone shattered with a loud crack. Strings of blood sailed out into the night air. Warren cried out as Verna landed flat on her back. She didn't move. Warren, crouched at Verna's side, looked up with frantic eyes. Nathan! Dear Creator, why would you do this? You've broken her jaw! Why would you try to kill her? Nathan flexed his fist. If I was trying to kill her, she would be dead. If you want her to live, then I would suggest you heal her. I've heard that you are talented at healing, and with what I have done for you tonight, you should be able to accomplish it in short order. Put some sense in her head while you're at it. Warren bent over Verna, pressing his hands to the unconscious woman's face. Kalen said nothing. She had seen love in Nathan's eyes when he had looked at Clarissa. She had just seen rage, too. Nathan bent and retrieved the inky black book lying on the ground beside Sister Amelia's body. 
He straightened and turned those raw eyes on Kalin. He held out the book. You could be none other than Kalin. I have been expecting you. Prophecy, you know. I'm glad I was not too late. You don't have much time. Give this to Lord Rawl. I hope he knows how to destroy it. He knew when he was at the Temple of the Winds, but he said he had to give up his knowledge and leave. But he wrote a message in the palms of his hands. It says, Pinch of white sorcerer's sand on third page, one grain of black sorcerer's sand tossed on. And then there were three words, but I don't know what they mean. Nathan laid a big hand on her shoulder. The words are the three chimes. Richani, Sintrosi, Vasi. I don't have time to teach you about the three chimes, but know that they must be spoken after the white and before the black. That's what is important. Richani, Sintrosi, Vasi, Kalin repeated, trying to commit the words to memory. She said them over again in her head. Richard does have both white and black sorcerer's sand, does he not? Kalin nodded. Yes, he told me about it. He has both. Nathan shook his head, as if considering some private thought. Both, he muttered. Nathan squeezed her shoulder. I know from prophecy some of what he has been through. Stand by him. Love is too precious a gift to lose. Kalin smiled. I understand. May the good spirits bring it to your heart, Nathan. I can't thank you enough for helping Richard, for helping me. Her voice broke. I didn't know what I was going to do. I only knew I had to come here. Nathan hugged her. She thought more for his own need than hers. You did the right thing. Maybe the good spirits guided you. Get back to him now, or we will lose our Lord Rahl. Kalin nodded. The killing is over. The killing is just about to begin. Nathan turned and held both fists skyward, an awesome flare of light ignited at his fists and shot into the night sky. Kalin watched as it streaked northwest, so bright that the stars vanished in the glare. Kalin saw Verna sitting up with Warren's help. He was wiping the blood away from her newly healed jaw. What have you done? Kalin asked Nathan. He looked down at her a long moment, and then a sly smile spread on his lips. I have just given Jagang a nasty surprise. I have just given General Rybish the signal to attack. Attack? Attack who? Jagang's expeditionary force. They destroyed Renwald. They are up to other trouble in the New World, too, but are unaware of who shadows them. It will be a short battle. The prophecy says that the Daharans will fight as fiercely as they have ever fought and will, before this night is over, destroy the enemy in the traditional Daharan fashion, without mercy. Verna was coming to her feet. Kalin had never seen Verna looking so meek. Nathan, I beg your forgiveness. I'm not interested. Kalin laid a hand on Nathan's arm and whispered up at him. Nathan, please, for your own sake, listen to her. Nathan gazed into Kalin's eyes a moment before he turned his glare on Verna. I'm listening. Nathan, I've known you a long time. My whole life. I've seen things before that perhaps I didn't understand. I thought you were doing this to seize power for yourself. Please forgive me for lashing out at you for my own guilt at my friends turning against me, against us. I sometimes jump to judgment. I can see that I have mistaken what was truly going on with you and Clarissa. She adored you, and I thought, I beg you to forgive me, Nathan. Nathan let out a grunt. Knowing you, Verna, that must have been the hardest thing you have ever had to say. Forgiveness granted. Thank you, Nathan, she sighed. Nathan bent and kissed Kalin's cheek. May the good spirits be with you, Mother Confessor. Tell Richard I give him back his title. Maybe I will see him again some day. With his hands on her waist, he boosted Kalin up onto the sliff's wall. Thank you, Nathan. I can see why Richard liked you. Clarissa, too. I think she saw the real Nathan. Nathan smiled, but then turned serious. When you get back, you must offer Richard's brother what he truly wants, if you are to save Richard. You wish to travel? The Sliff asked. Kalen's stomach roiled. Yes, back to Aidendril. Is Richard truly alive? Verna asked. Yes, Kalen said with revived panic. He's sick, but he will be fine once I get this book back to him and it's destroyed. 
Walsh, Bolsden, Nathan gestured as he started away. My coach awaits. Let's be off. But Nathan, Warren said, I want to learn about prophecy. I would like to study with you. A true prophet is born, Warren, not made. Where are you going? Verna called after him. You can't leave. You're a prophet. You can't be left to run. I mean, we must know where you will be in case we need you. Without looking back, Nathan pointed. Your sisters are that way, prelate, to the northwest. Go to them and save yourself the trouble of trying to follow me. You won't succeed. Your sisters are safe from the Dreamwalker. I had them transfer their bond to me while Richard went to the world of the dead. If Richard lives, you all can transfer it back to him. Goodbye, Verna. Warren. Kalen pressed a fist to her stomach. If he lives? If? Hurry, she said to the sliff. Hurry! A silver arm swept her from the wall and down into the quick silver froth. Chapter 66 He smiled at the way she struggled. He liked the way she had fought him. He enjoyed teaching her how useless it was to fight a person of his superior strength, superior intellect. He watched in fascination as blood ran from her mouth and nose. The gash on her jaw oozed. You are only succeeding at making your wrists bleed, he taunted. You can't break the ropes, but keep at it if you wish. She spat at him. He smacked her again. He dug his thumb across the cut on her jaw, spellbound by the pattern of blood flooding down the side of her neck. He knew her auras. He'd felt them before. He knew just which ones to touch to cripple her. It hadn't taken long to overpower her. Not long at all. Her teeth gritted as she growled with effort, straining against the ropes. She was strong, but she was not strong enough. Without her power and her weapon, she was a mere woman. No mere woman was a match for him, not in any way. When his fingers began unbuttoning the row of buttons along the side of her ribs, she tugged violently at the ropes holding her wrists and ankles. He liked that. He liked to watch her struggle to watch her bleed. He punched her face again. He was intrigued that she didn't cry out, that she didn't beg for mercy, that she didn't scream. She would. Oh, how she would scream. His punch had stunned her for the moment. Her eyes rolled as she fought to remain conscious. He threw back the front of her outfit, exposing her breasts and the upper half of her torso. He hooked his fingers under the tight waist of her red leather pants, and with a quick pull yanked them down enough for what he was going to do to her. Her entire belly was exposed. He felt it, tight, hard. There were scars on her. They riveted him. He tried to imagine what had caused such scars. As jagged and white as they were, it would have been bloody. I've been raped before, he sneered. More times than I can remember. I can tell you from experience that you're not very good at it. You haven't even gotten my pants down enough, you stupid pig. Get on with it if you even can. I'm waiting. Oh, Kara, I'm not going to rape you. That would be wrong. I have never raped a woman. I only have women who want it. She laughed at him. Laughed. You are one twisted bastard. He resisted his urge to smash her face. He wanted her awake for this, alive for this. But he shook with rage. Bastard? His fist tightened. Because of women like you! He hammered a fist down on her breast. Her eyes squeezed shut and her teeth clenched as she winced in pain, trying to curl up in a ball but unable to, stretched out in the ropes as she was. He took a settling breath, regaining his control. He wouldn't let her divert him with her filthy mouth. Now, I'm going to give you one last where is Richard? The soldiers are going wild with talk of Richard being back, of the bond being back. Where are you whores hiding him? The voices from the ether had told him, too, that Richard was back. The voices had told him that if he wished to assume his rightful place, he must eliminate Richard. And where is my loving wife? Where has she gone to? The voices told him that she was in the sliff, but the sliff wouldn't tell him where she had gone. Kara spat at him again. I am Mord Sith. 
You are too stupid to even imagine what has been done to me before. You couldn't fill the boots of the meekest trainer of Mord Sith. Your puny torture will pry nothing from me. Oh, Kara, you have never encountered one of my talents. Do what you want with me, Drefen. But Lord Rall, the real Lord Rall, is going to cut you up into little pieces. And just how would he be able to do that? He lifted the hilt of the Sword of Truth clear of its scabbard, so she could see the gold lettering that spelled out the word Truth. I'm the one who is going to be doing the cutting into little pieces. Little tiny Richard pieces. Where is he? When she spat at him again, he couldn't resist fisting her across her cut and swollen lip. The blood gushed anew. He turned and retrieved one of the items he had brought. An iron pot. He put it on her belly, upside down. I'm too big to cook in that pot, you stupid pig. You will have to cut me up. Do I have to explain everything to you? He liked the way she tried to antagonize him, to make him lose his temper. She wanted him to kill her. He would, but she would talk first. Cook you? Oh, no, Kara, you have the wrong idea. The wrong idea entirely. You think me some maniacal murderer. No murderer I. I am the hand of justice. I am the hand of mercy. Come to bring eternal virtue to those who have none. This pot isn't to cook you. It's to cook the rat. He was watching. He saw the way her blue eyes flicked toward him. He had been waiting for just that reaction. Rat. I hope you aren't stupid enough to think that I am afraid of rats just because I am a woman. I'm no woman like you have ever seen before. I used to keep rats as pets. Really? You lie so poorly. My dear, loving, passionate wife, explain to me how afraid you are of rats. She didn't answer. She was afraid of showing her fear, but he could see it in her eyes. I have a sack of rats here. Nice, fat rats. Just get on with this rape. I'm growing bored. I told you I don't rape women. They want it from me. They ask for it. They beg for it. He tugged down his ruffled cuffs. No, Kara, I have something else in mind for you. I want you to tell me where I can find my loving brother. She turned her face away. Never. Get on with the torture before I fall asleep and miss it. You see, as I told you, women always ask me for it. He pressed the iron pot to her belly and wound a chain around her middle to hold down the pot. He forced a finger under the rim, checking to make sure that it was tight enough. He then loosened the rough knot in the chain so he could get the rats under the pot. Kara showed no reaction when he shoved the first under the pot. Holding the second by the scruff of its neck, he held it before her face, letting her see it squirm and squeak. See, Kara? As I promised you, rat. Big rat. Sweat beaded on her forehead. I kind of like it. It feels fuzzy against my stomach. I may fall asleep. He stuffed the second and then a third under the pot. There was room for no more. He took the slack from the chain and tightened the knot of link. Fuzzy, he mocked. I think they will keep you wide awake, Kara. Wide awake and eager to talk, eager to betray Richard. Whores have no honor. You will betray him. Verdine is going to be here soon. She will skin you alive. He lifted an eyebrow. You relieved Verdine. I saw you. After she left, I took you down. She won't be back for quite a while. But when she does come back, she will get the same as you. With tongs, he retrieved a big glowing coal from the pan over the mass of candles. He plunked the red-hot coal down inside the rim of the footed bottom of the iron pot. You see, Kara, the coals are going to heat this iron pot. Get it very hot. He looked at her eyes. The rats aren't going to like that. They are going to want out. Her breathing quickened. Sweat rolled down her face. Where were her brave words now? She was silent now. And how do you suppose the rats are going to get out, Kara, once they start to get hot? Once the iron pot starts burning them, singeing their tender noses? Just cut my throat and kill me, you bastard. When the rats get hot enough under there, they'll panic. 
They'll be frantic to get out. Guess how they'll get out, Kara. She had no haughty answer to fill the silence. He pulled his knife and with the handle tapped the iron pot. How are you doing in there, my little rat friends? Kara flinched. He smiled when her eyes turned to him, watching him. He could see fear in those eyes. Real fear. He plunked down a half dozen more glowing coals on the iron pot. Where is Richard? She had nothing to say. He piled on more coals into a nice round hump. That was all the pot's bottom would hold. He bent over and looked into her eyes. Her skin was as white as chalk. Sweat glistened on her face, on her breast. Where are you whores hiding, Richard? You are crazy, Dreffen. I don't like this. But if this is how I am to die, then I will die. But I will never betray Lord Rall. I am Lord Rall. When I get rid of my brother, there will be no one to challenge my rule. I am the son of Dark and Rall, and the rightful master of Dahara. She turned her face away. He saw her swallow. Her feet were trembling. Her smooth breathing was interrupted now and again, caught up short. He chuckled. I'll ask again when the rats start gnawing their way through you to get away from their hot iron prison. When their sharp little claws start digging into your belly, when the rats start tunneling into your guts trying to get out. Kara's whole body jerked. It jerked again. Her eyes widened as she glared up at the ceiling, trying to keep the moan from escaping her throat. He glanced back and saw a drop of blood run from under the rim of the bowl down her side. Well, looks like they already want out. Ready to talk yet? She spat at him and then gasped sharply, her wide blue eyes fixed on the ceiling. She was trembling all over now. Her whole body stiffened. Every muscle strained. She started to pant. Tears filled the corners of her eyes to run down the side of her face. She was feeling every little thing the rats did, every frantic bite, every desperate digging, ripping of their claws. Kara let out a short little cry, sharp, shrill, clip. It was rapture. He knew it was only the beginning. Even if she talked, he had no intention of stopping this. He longed to hear screams, real from the gut screams. Kara obliged him and let out her first. Because of his singular perception, another detail caught his attention. His vigilance had again rewarded him. Smiling, he turned to the Sliff's well. Breathe. Kaylin expelled the Sliff, but she knew something was wrong even before she sucked a breath of air. A piercing scream echoed around the stone room. Kaylin thought the shriek would make her ears bleed. As she erupted from the Sliff before she could brace herself to react, Big, strong hands reached down and seized her. She struggled to get her bearings to make sense of what was happening as the sudden light and sound whirled in around her. The hands tore the book from her grasp. An arm clamped around her neck, its big fist gripping her arm. She felt rope being wound around her wrist. A nightmare came to life in her vision as she was dragged from the well, kicking and twisting and trying to get away. She went limp when a fist in her gut drove the wind from her lungs. Her knees smacked the stone floor. Her arms felt as if they were being wrenched from her shoulder sockets as they were twisted behind her back. She fought to reach her confessor's power, only to remember when she couldn't touch it that the spirits had walled it from her so she could be married to Drefen. She was defenseless. It was Drefen attacking her. Kara was there on the floor, her wrists bound above her head, the rope fastened to a pin in the wall. Her ankles, likewise secured with rope, were stretched toward the opposite wall. She had an iron pot chained over her middle. The smell of hot coals and burning flesh assailed Kalin's nostrils, gagging her. Drefen pressed his knee to her arm as he knotted rope around her wrist. Kalin tried to bite his leg. He backhanded her across the face so hard that her vision narrowed to a tiny spot. She fought to keep that vision, to stay conscious. She knew that she was lost if she passed out. Her arms bound behind her, Unable to break her fall, she smacked into the stone floor, face first. Drefen pounced on her back, sitting on her, holding her down as he bound her legs together. Kalin struggled to pull a breath against the weight of him. Blood gushed from her nose. The rope around her wrists was so tight that already her fingers were tingling. Kara screamed. It was the loudest, 
scream Kaylin had ever heard. It sent icy needles stabbing into her head. It made her face hurt. Blood was running from under the rim of the iron pot. Kara shook and thrashed. She stiffened and screamed again. Drefin lifted Kaylin's head by her hair. Where's Richard? Richard. Richard is dead. Kaylin grunted at a punch in her kidney. She couldn't get her breath. Drefin turned his attention to Kara. Ready to talk yet? Where did you hide Richard? Kara's only answer was another shuddering scream. When it ended, she panted in pain. Why did you tell him? Kara wept. Why did you tell him about the rats? Dear spirits, why did you tell him about the rats? Terror locked Kaylin's breath in her lungs. Blood, vivid red against white skin, ran in rivulets from under the pot's rim and down Kara's side. Smoke curled up from the hot coals atop it. And then Kaylin saw the bloody claw wriggling from under the rim of the pot on Kara's stomach. Kaylin suddenly understood. It took all her force of will to keep from vomiting. Kara cried hysterically, thrashing at the bloody ropes holding her. Kaylin furiously squirmed forward, going for the chain to try to undo it with her teeth, to try to get the iron pot off Kara. Drefin lifted Kaylin by her hair. Your turn will come, wife. He heaved her back. Kaylin smacked into the wall and slid down onto something hard and sharp. The pain brought stinging tears to her eyes. It was Nadine's bag full of all those horn containers. She lurched and wrenched herself until she was able to slip to the side off the bag and get her breath back. Drefin turned his dark and raw eyes on her. If you tell me where Richard is, I'll let Kara go. Don't tell him, Kara screamed. Don't tell him. I couldn't if I wanted to, Kalen called out to Kara. I don't know where you hid him. Drefin picked up the book Kalen had brought. What's this? Kalen's gaze locked on the sinister black book. She had to have that book or Richard would die. Well, no matter. You won't be needing it anymore. No, Kalen screamed when she saw what Drefin was going to do with the book. Please! He looked back at her as he held the book out over the sliff's well. Tell me where Richard is. He smiled, lifting an eyebrow. No? Page 493. He dropped the book down the well. Kalen's heart sank with the book. The Sliff, who liked to watch the people in the room, was nowhere to be seen now. She probably had been frightened away by the screams. Drefin, let Kara go, please. You have me. Do what you want to with me, but please let her go. Drefin smiled as wicked a smile as Kalen had ever seen. It was a twin to Darken Rawl's smile. Oh, don't you worry. I intend to do what I want with you, when it is time. He turned back to Kara. How are the rats doing, Kara? Ready to talk yet? Kara cursed him through clenched teeth. Drefin reached into his sack and brought out a rat, holding it by the scruff of its neck. He shook it in her face as she tried to turn away. He lowered it against her. Squeaking and twisting, its claws scratched and dug as it tried to get away from Drefin's grip leaving red streaks along Kara's cheeks, chin, and lips. Please, Kara wailed. Please get them away. Where's Richard? Dear spirits, help me. Please help me. Please help me, she mumbled over and over. Where's Richard? Kara's body jerked violently. Mama, she shrieked. Help me, Mama. Get them off, Mama. Kara was alone in a cage with rats in the grip of terror and pain. She was a helpless child again, begging for the comfort and protection of her mother, wailing for her mother. Kaylin gasped in tears. This was her fault. She had told Drefin that Kara was afraid of rats. Kara, forgive me, I didn't know. Kara thrashed at her ropes, a little girl frantically begging for her mother to get the rats away. Kaylin strained to pull a hand free. If she could only get a hand free of the ropes, but they were so tight. She tugged and pulled. Her fingers tingled. The coarse rope cut into her wrists. Kaylin pressed her wrists against Nadine's bag, searching for something sharp to cut the ropes. The bag was cloth, the handle smooth wood. The bag. Kaylin bent to the side, her fingers feeling for the button that held the bag closed. She found it. 
She struggled to undo the button, but her fingers were numb, and at the angle that her arms were twisted, she couldn't make her fingers work properly. She dug at the button with her thumbnail, trying to hook it to the side, trying to rip it off. It was sewn on with heavy thread to stand up to the rigors of use and weight. At last, the button popped through its hole. Kaylin scooped at the contents in the bag, trying to sling them out where she could see them. Every shrill wail from Kara made Kaylin flinch. Every time Kara cried for her mother to save her from the rats, Kaylin had to hold back a sob of her own. When she glanced up, she saw Dreffen wiping a rat across Kara's face. He had broken the back of another and draped it across her throat. Kaylin gritted her teeth and fingered the horn containers out of the bag. Kara was her sister of the Aegeal. Kaylin had to do something. Kara's only hope was Kaylin. She twisted her neck trying to see the markings on the horns. She couldn't find the one she wanted. She used her fingers groping at the symbols scratched into the horn. She felt one that she thought was the right one, and her hope soared, only to be dashed when she felt that there were three circles. She flicked each horn out of the way when she determined that it was not the one she needed. She rooted in the bag and found another. Her fingers blindly felt the scratches. They went in a circle. She slipped her fingers along the horn and found another circle. She felt a heavily scratched straight line between them. Kaylin held the horn in her fingertips and twisted, trying to see if she was right. Kara screamed and Kaylin dropped the horn. She scooted to the side so she could see it on the floor. It had two circles scratched into the patina of the horn. A horizontal line ran through both circles. It was the right one, Canaan Pepper. Nadine had warned her about taking off the wooden stopper, warned her about getting it in your face, your eyes. It would immobilize a person for a time, Nadine had said. Make them helpless for a time. Kaylin worked the horn back into her fingers. She wiggled the wooden stopper, trying to loosen it. It was cut to fit tightly to keep the dangerous substance from leaking out. Kaylin's fingers were so numb they had no strength. She gritted her teeth as she tried to work the stopper loose. She didn't want it off yet, but she had to know she could get it off. With her hands behind her back, she couldn't throw it. She frantically tried to think of what she was going to do. She had to do something. If she didn't, Kara would soon be dead, and then Dreffen would start in on his loving wife. Kara wailed in agony. Please, Mama, get the rats away from Kari. Please, Mama, please. Help me. Please help me. The pleading cries of hopeless terror ripped at Kaylin's heart. She could wait no longer. She would just have to figure out what to do when the time came. She had to act. Treffen! His head twisted around. Are you ready to tell me where Richard is? Kaylin remembered something Nathan had told her. You must offer Richard's brother what he truly wants if you are to save Richard. Maybe it would save Kara. Richard? What would I want with Richard? You know that it's you I want. He smiled a knowing, satisfied smile. Soon, my dear, in a little while. You can wait. He turned back to Kara. No, Treffen, I can't wait. I need you now. I want you now. I can't resist any longer. I can't pretend any longer. I need you. I said, just like your mother. He froze at her words. I need you like your whore of a mother needed your father. His expression darkened. Like a provoked bull, he turned toward her, his piercing eyes riveted on her. What do you mean? You know exactly what I mean. I need to be taken like your father took your mother. I want you to take me like that. Only you can satisfy me. Do it. Do it now, please. He rose up, huge and imposing. His muscles rippled and knotted. His brow drew down in that grim, raw glare. I knew it, he breathed. I knew it. I knew you would finally give in to your filthy perversion. He hesitated, looking back at Kara. Yes, you're right. You're always right, Treffen. You're smarter than me. You were right all along. I can't fool you any longer. Give me what I want. Give me what I need. Please, Dreffen, I'm begging you. I need you. The look on his face was frightening. It was madness. If she could have shrunk back into the stone, she would have. Dreffen slipped free the knife at his belt as his tongue wet his lips. He started toward her. She had had no idea just how effective her words had been. 
In sudden panic, Kalin wiggled the wooden stopper. Dreffen's whole face, the whole way he carried his body, changed. He was a seething monster coming at her. His eyes narrowed with bestial loathing, savage hatred, hatred for her. Kalin swallowed back the sudden terror welling up in her throat. Dear spirits, what had she just done? She scuffed her feet against the stone floor, trying to back away. She was already against the wall. How was she going to get the powder in his face? Dear spirits, what do I do? Kalin wiggled the stopper with all her might. It popped off. Dreffen went to a knee beside her. Tell me how much you want me to please you. Yes, I want you now. Give me the pleasure only you can give me. He brought the knife up as he leaned toward her. Kaylin heaved herself toward him, twisting, rolling to the side as hard as she could, flinging the horn full of powder at his face as she rolled onto hers. She couldn't see face down on the stone. She didn't know if she had missed, if the oily powder had come out, if she had had the horn turned the right way, if he was close enough. She held her breath, bracing for the thrust of his knife, imagining it coming, knowing it was coming. She could almost feel the sharp edge slicing her. She struggled against the panic of not knowing just where he was going to cut her. Dreffen staggered back. She turned her face and saw him fall on his back, writhing, gasping for breath. Kalin flipped herself over and started scooting toward Kara. She tried to move around Dreffen, but she didn't have much room to maneuver. His groping hand caught her ankles. She kicked, trying to pull away from his grip. His fingers tightened around her ankles. His powerful arm dragged her toward him. He gasped for air, his other hand flailing about, trying to feel what was around him. He was blind. Kalin saw yellow powder on his cheek and neck. She hadn't gotten it in his eyes, as she had hoped. She hadn't gotten it directly in his mouth or nose, just the side of his face. Most had missed. She didn't know how long that would stop him, but she didn't think for long. Dear spirits, let it be enough. The horn was on the other side of him. She couldn't get to it. With all her strength, when he tugged on her leg, she used his pull to add momentum and kicked as hard as she could at his face. She caught his ear, tearing it partly away from his head. He bellowed and released her ankle. Desperately, Kaylin pushed with her feet to get away from his grasping fingers. She made it out of his reach. She bumped into Kara. Kaylin sat up and scooted back toward the woman. Hold on, Kara. Please hold on. I'm here. I'm going to get them off you. I swear I'll get them off you. Please, Mama, Kara wailed. It hurts so much. It hurts. It hurts. Kaylin pulled her feet under herself so she could raise up enough. She craned her neck, looking over her shoulder, trying to see what she was doing. She seized the chain. It burned her fingers, making her recoil. She made herself grab the chain again. She tugged on the iron knot, shaking, twisting, pulling. Through burning fingers, she felt a link slip and the chain loosen. She stole a quick glance. Dreffen was still struggling to breathe, but he had straightened his legs. He put his arms at his sides. What was he doing? Kalin felt a link pull past resistance. She wiggled the chain to loosen the knot to give it more room to come undone. Another link slipped free. The chain loosened further. She tugged at it, refusing to let go, even though the hot iron was burning her fingers. Dreffen's breathing was evening out. He was laying perfectly still. What was he doing? Kaylin cried out with joy when the chain rattled off the side of the pot. With her back to Kara, Kaylin hooked her fingers under the rim of the scalding pot and heaved it up and back, flipping it off Kara. Bloody rats tumbled to the floor, squirming and wriggling, trying to get their feet as they scurried away. Kaylin was near tears with joy. I got them off, Kara. I got them off you. Kara's head lolled from side to side. Her eyes rolled. She mumbled incoherently. When she looked over her shoulder and saw Kara's stomach, Kaylin had to look away or be sick. She scooted up toward Kara's hands. With frenzied effort, Kaylin dug at the knot of rope, but the knots were pulled impossibly tight from Kara's thrashing. Kaylin couldn't budge them. She wasn't going to be able to untie them. She would have to cut them. Dreffen's knife lay on the floor near him. He was lying there perfectly still. She had to hurry. She had to get the knife and cut Kara's ropes. She had to cut her own before he recovered. Kaylin dug in her heels and scooted toward the knife. She turned around, feeling for it with her fingers. Dreffen rose up and seized her. Holding her around the middle, he lifted her as if she weighed nothing. 
He brought the knife around in front of her face. Nasty stuff, powdered cayenne pepper. Lucky for me, I know how to use my auras to overcome it. Now, my whore of a wife, it's time you paid the price for your perversion. Chapter 67 Richard staggered toward the Sliff's room. From a room not far away where Kara and Berdine had put him, he had heard the screams. He had no idea how long he had been insensate, no idea how long it had been since they had taken him there, but the screams had brought him awake. Someone needed help, and the last scream he knew, Kalen. His head pounded in violent pain. He hurt everywhere. He hadn't thought he would be able to stand, but he did. He hadn't thought he would be able to walk, but he did. He had to. He was barefooted and without a shirt. He had on only his pants. He knew that the lower keep was cool, but he was covered in a sheen of sweat, hardly able to breathe through the heat he felt. He used all his willpower to force himself to move. He straightened, put a hand to the side of the door into the Sliff's room, and walked in. Dreffen looked up. He had his arm around Kalen's middle. He had a knife in his other hand. To the side, Kara was lying on the floor, tied in ropes. Her middle was ripped open. She was still alive, but shivering in agony. Richard couldn't make sense of it. What in the name of all that's good is going on, Dreffen? Richard, he sneered. Just the man I'm looking for. Well, now I'm here. Let Kalen go. Oh, I will, dear brother. Soon. It is you I need. Why? Dreffen's eyebrows lifted. So that I can be reinstated as Lord Rall. It's my rightful place. The voices told me. My father told me, I am to be Lord Rall. I was born to it. The plague was a far distant drone in Richard's mind and body, yet this all seemed a dream too. Drop the knife, Dreffen, and give up. It's over. Let Kalen go. Dreffen laughed. He threw his head back and roared with laughter. When it died out, Dreffen's eyes narrowed with frightening resolve. She wants me. She begs for it. You know the truth of that, my dear brother. You saw what she is. She is a whore. She is just like all the others. Just like Nadine. Just like my mother. She must die like all the rest. Richard looked into Kalen's eyes. What was going on? Dear spirits, how was he going to get her away from Dreffen? You're wrong, Dreffen. Your mother loved you. She took you to a place where you would be safe from Dark and Rall. She loved you. Please let Kalen go. I'm begging you. She is mine. My wife. I will do with her what I will. Dreffen slammed the knife into Kalen's lower back. Richard flinched at hearing it hit bone. Kalen grunted with the impact, her eyes going wide in shock. Dreffen released her. She dropped to her knees and crumpled to her side. Richard tried with all his might to make sense of this. He couldn't decide if this was real or a dream. He had been having so many dreams, so many nightmares. This seemed like all the rest, but different. He didn't even know if he was alive anymore. The whole room swam before him. Dreffen drew the Sword of Truth. The ring of steel that Richard knew so well echoed around the stone room, a chime that seemed to awaken him into a nightmare. Richard could see the rage from the sword, the magic, take Dreffen's eyes. I'm all right, Richard, Kaylin panted as she stared up at him. You don't have a weapon. Get out of here. Get away. I love you. Please, for me, run. The rage in Dreffen's eyes was nothing to match the rage thundering into Richard's heart. Drop the sword, Dreffen, now, or I will kill you. Dreffen swept the sword around. How? With your bare hands? Richard vividly remembered what Zed had told him when first giving him the sword of truth. The sword was only a tool. The seeker was the weapon. A true seeker didn't need the sword. Richard started forward. And with hate in my heart. I will enjoy killing you at last, Richard, even if you don't have a weapon. I am the weapon. Richard was running. The distance between them shrank at an alarming rate. Kalen screamed for him to get away. He hardly heard her. Richard was committed. Dreffen lifted the sword overhead, pulling a breath in preparation to cleave Richard. 
That was the opening. Richard knew that a thrust was faster than a cut. He was in the iron grip of deadly determination. Richard was lost in the dance with death. Drefin bellowed in rage as the sword started down. Richard dropped to his left knee through the opening, using his forward momentum and a twist of his torso to add force to his strike. Fingers straight and stiff, he drove his arm ahead with all his might. Before the sword could touch him, Richard struck like lightning, driving his hand through Drefin's soft middle. In the blink of an eye, he had seized Drefin's spinal column and yanked it back out, ripping it apart. Drefin pitched backward, crashing against the sliff's well, slumping down in a spreading crimson flood. Richard bent to Kaelin, cupping her face with his left hand. He didn't want to touch her with Drefin's blood. She was panting in pain. From the corner of his eye, Richard could see Drefin's arm move. I can't feel my legs. Richard, I can't feel my legs. Dear spirits, what did he do to me? Her voice quivered with panic. I can't make them move. Richard was already lost in need. He had forgotten how to use his power as the price of returning from the Temple of the Winds, but he had used it before. He had healed before. He was a wizard. He ignored his dizzy head, his sick stomach. He couldn't allow that to stop him. From Nathan, Richard had learned that his power was called through need, if the need was great enough, or through anger, if the anger was great enough. He had never had more need than he had at that moment, nor more anger. Richard, oh, Richard, I love you. I want you to know if we, if we... Hush, he said in a gentle voice. Her face was cut and bloody. It made him ache to see her pain, her panic. I will heal you. Lie still and I will make you whole again. Oh, Richard, I had the book. I lost it. Oh, Richard, I'm so sorry. I had it. I had it, but it's gone. With a sinking feeling, he grasped what she was saying. He was going to die. There was nothing to be done now. He was lost. Richard, please heal Kara. No. I don't think I have enough strength to heal both of you. To heal, he had to take the pain from the one injured. Killing Drefin had taken nearly all the strength he had. I must heal you. Kaylin shook her head. Please, Richard, if you love me, do as I ask. Heal Kara. It's my fault what he did to her. My fault. A tear ran down her cheek. I lost the book. I can't save you. Heal Kara. She stifled a cry. We will be together soon for all time then. He understood. They were both to die. They would be together in the spirit world. She didn't want to live without him. Richard kissed her brow. Hold on. Don't give up. Please, Kalen, I love you. Don't give up. Richard turned to Kara. He already felt so sick that the sight didn't affect him the way it normally would have. Her suffering, though, bent him with pain for her. He laid his hands across Kara's bloody, torn middle. Kara, I'm here. Hold on. For me, hold on so I can help you. She didn't seem to hear his words as she mumbled, her head lolling from side to side. Richard closed his eyes and opened his heart, his need, his soul. He released himself into the current of empathy. He wanted nothing but to make Kara whole again. She had given her all for them. He didn't know if he had strength enough, but he gave all of himself over to it. He descended into the swirl of her agony. He felt everything she felt, suffered with her. He gritted his teeth, held his breath, and pulled her pain into himself, onward, ever onward, without sparing anything to protect himself. He shook with the suffering, and his mind wailed with it. He absorbed it into himself, and then asked for more. He asked for all of it. He demanded it. The world was liquid, twisting, coursing pain. He was swept away in a molten river of it. Its fiery heat consumed his being. Time lost all meaning. There was only the pain. When he felt it all gathered into himself, he let flow his empathy, his power, healing strength, healing heart. He didn't know how to direct it. He just let it flow into her. It felt as if his whole self drained away into her need. She was baked, barren earth soaking in life-giving rain. When at last he opened his eyes and lifted his head, his arms were lying across the smooth skin of her midriff. She was whole again, though she seemed still unaware of it. She was whole. 
Richard turned. Kaylin was lying on her side, her breath coming in short, sharp pants. Her face was ashen and covered with sweat and blood, her eyes half closed. Richard, she whispered when he bent to her. Free my hands. I want to be hugging you when... When she died, that was what she was going to say. Richard snatched up a knife lying nearby and sliced through the ropes. The anger was back, but only as a distant glow now. He could hardly see the room anymore, hardly hear her, hardly see her. Her wrists finally free, she threw an arm over his neck and drew him to her. Richard struggled to keep from falling on her. Richard, 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 she whispered. I love you. Richard went to embrace her and saw the pool of blood spreading under her. His rage ignited anew, his need ignited anew. He took her up in his arms, begging the spirits to spare her. Please give me the strength to heal this loved one, he whispered in choking tears. I have done everything required of me. I have sacrificed everything. Please, losing this loved one should not be part of it. I'm dying. Give me the time. Help me. It was all he wanted, all he needed, as he held her to him. He wanted her to live, to be well, to be whole. Holding her in his arms, he once again released himself into the torrent. He pulled the pain onward, heedless of it, welcoming it, drawing it with all his might. At the same time, he let flow his love, his warmth, his compassion. Kalen gasped. Richard could see that his arms were glowing as if a spirit were sharing his body with him. Perhaps he was already a spirit, but he didn't care. He cared only that he would heal her and cared not at what cost. He would pay any price. Kaylin gasped with the feel of it, the feel of the power surging into her. Her legs began to tingle. It was the first time she had felt anything in them since Treffen had stabbed her. Richard seemed to glow around her as he hugged her in his arms, held her in his warm, loving embrace. The rapture of the sliff by comparison was torture. This was beyond anything she had ever felt in her life. She could feel his warm, healing magic coursing through every fiber of her. It was like being born anew. Life and vitality welled up in her. Tears of bliss flooded from her eyes as she hung in Richard's arms, his magic completely overwhelming her. When at last he parted from her, she moved without pain. Her legs moved. She felt whole. She was healed. Richard wiped the blood from her lips as he gazed into her eyes. Kneeling on the floor together, Kaylin kissed him, tasting their salty tears. She parted, gripping his arms, looking into his eyes, seeing him as if in a new light. She had just shared something with him that was beyond words, beyond comprehension. Kaylin stood, holding out her hand to help him up. Richard lifted his hand toward hers, and then he toppled over onto his face. Richard! She dropped down, rolling him over onto his back. He was hardly breathing. Richard, please, Richard, don't leave me. Please don't leave me. She clutched at his shoulders. He was burning with fever. His eyes were closed. He struggled for each shallow breath. Oh, Richard, I'm so sorry I lost the book. Please, Richard, I love you. Don't die and leave me alone. Here came a voice that echoed around the room. Kalin's head came up. The voice seemed unreal. She couldn't understand it. Then realization hit her. Kaylin spun around and saw the quicksilver face of the sliff looking down at her. A liquid silver arm held out the black book. Master needs this, the sliff said. Take it. Kaylin snatched the book. Thank you. Thank you, sliff. Kaylin dropped down to get the sorcerer's sand that Richard carried in the leather packs, but he wasn't wearing his big overbelt. She rushed to Kara, still tied in the ropes. Kara's head rolled from side to side as she mumbled, as if she didn't know that Richard had healed her. She was still lost in a prison of her own private terror. Zed had told Kalen that the gift couldn't heal maladies of the mind. Kara! Kara, where were you keeping Richard? Where are his things? Kara didn't respond. Kalen snatched the knife off the floor and sliced through the ropes. Kara just lay there. Kaylin pressed her hands to Kara's face, making the woman look at her. Kara, it's all right now. The rats are gone. They're gone. You're safe. Richard healed you. You're all right. Rats, Kara mumbled. 
Get them off me, please, please. Kaylin hugged her. Kara, they're gone. I'm your sister of the Aegeal. I need you. Please, Kara, come back to me, please. Kara only mumbled. Kara, Kaylin wept. Richard will die if you don't help me. There are thousands of rooms in the keep. I need to know where you kept him. Please, Kara, Richard helped you. Now he needs your help, or he will die. There's no time. Richard needs you. Kara's eyes focused, as if she were coming awake. Richard? Kaylin wiped the tears from her face. Yes, Richard. Hurry, Kara. I need the belt Richard wears. I need it or he will die. Kara brought her hands down, rubbing her wrists, now smooth where they had been cut before. She felt her stomach. Even the old scars were gone. I am healed, she whispered. Lord Rall healed me. Yes. Kara, please. Richard is dying. I have the book, but I need the things he keeps in his belt. Kara abruptly sat up, pulling the red leather across her chest. She buttoned two of the buttons to hold it closed. His belt, yes. You stay with Lord Rall. I will get it. Hurry! Kara stood, swaying for a moment as she steadied herself, and then she dashed from the room. Kaylin hugged the inky black book to herself. She bent over Richard. He was hardly breathing. She knew that any one of those breaths could be his last. He had given them, Kara and Kaylin, the rest of his strength. Dear spirits, help him. Give him just a little more time, please. He has suffered so much. Please just give him a little time until I can destroy this vile book. Kalen bent over him and kissed his lips. Hold on, Richard. Hold on for me, please. If you can hear me, we have the book. I know how to destroy it. Please just hold on. Kalen knelt down on a clear spot closer to the door and laid open the book to the third page so she would be ready when Kara returned. She gazed into a vision of a wasteland. There was sand blown into dunes, stretching into the distance of the phantasm emanating from the book. Kalen stared into that barren place and saw runes on the sand, lines drawn in geometric patterns. Her sight was drawn into the pattern of lines that swirled and twisted around. There in the runes was light. It flared forth, every color shining out toward her, calling to her. Mother Confessor, Kara yelled, shaking Kalen's shoulders. Didn't you hear me? I have Lord Rall's belt. Kalen blinked, shaking her head, trying to clear her mind. She snatched the belt and undid the bone holder on the flap of the pack where Richard kept the sorcerer's sand. Inside, she found the leather pouch of white sand. With Kara standing behind her, touching her shoulder, Kalen cast a pinch of the white sand into the book. The color boiled and twisted, tumbled and turned. Kaylin pulled her eyes away and stabbed her hand back into the pack, pulling out the other leather pouch, the one with the black sorcerer's sand. With two fingers, she carefully pulled the top open. Inside, she could see the inky black sand. Troubled, Kaylin paused. There was something else, something tickling at the back of her mind. The words... Nathan said to say the words, the three chimes, before using the black sand. Three words, what were they? She couldn't remember them. Her mind raced after them, but they kept going around dark corners, and when she turned, they were gone again. Her thoughts mired in staggering fright. She ached in desperate thought, but the words wouldn't come to her. Richard had them written in the palm of his hand. Kalen turned to go to read them from his palm and froze. Dreffen... Leaning up against the well of the sliff where he had fallen, somehow still hanging to a thread of life, was holding up the sword. Richard was lying right there on the floor within reach. Dreffen was going to kill him. No! Kalen screamed. But the sword was already sweeping down. Faint, maniacal laughter drifted on the air. Kalen threw her fist up, calling the blue lightning to protect Richard. It didn't come. She was blocked from her power. Kara was already diving toward Dreffen, but she was too far away. She wasn't going to make it. The sword was halfway there. A silver arm swept down and seized Dreffen's arm, holding it tight. Kalen held her breath. Another liquid silver arm enveloped Dreffen's head. Breathe, the sliff cooed, a voice promising the sating of bestial lust, a voice promising rapture. I wish you to please me. Breathe. 
Dreffen's chest rose as he inhaled the sliff. He went still, holding the sliff in his lungs. The sliff freed him and he slumped to the side. His breath left him, releasing the sliff he had inhaled. It drained from his mouth and nose, not silver, but red. Kalin felt something inside her part, a profound unraveling, and all at once she joined with her power, a sweet reclaiming that brought a gasp of euphoric inner union. Dreffen was dead. As long as they both live, those were the words. Her oath was ended. The winds had returned her power. Kaylin was brought out of her daze when she heard Richard gasp for a breath. With renewed panic, she scrambled across the floor and scooped up his right hand where Richard had written the message. She pried open his fingers. The words were gone. The act of stopping Dreffen and his blood had scoured away the writing. Kaylin screamed in frustrated rage. She scrambled back to the open book. She couldn't remember the words. Her mind ached with frustration. She couldn't make the words come. What was she going to do? Maybe if she just threw in the grain of black sand anyway. No, she knew better than to disregard what a wizard like Nathan said to do. She squeezed her head between the heels of her hands as if trying to press the words out. Kara knelt down, grasping her by her shoulders. Mother Confessor, what's wrong? You must hurry. Lord Rall is hardly breathing. Hurry! Tears ran down her face. I can't remember the words. Oh, Kara, I can't remember them. Nathan told me, but I can't remember them. Kalen clambered back across the floor to Richard. She smoothed a hand down his face. Richard, please wake up. I need to know the words. Please, Richard, what are the words? The three words. He struggled to draw a breath, gasping with the effort. He wasn't going to wake. He wasn't going to live. Kaylin rushed back to the book. She snatched up the leather pouch of black sand. She would have to do it without the words. Maybe it would work. It would work. It had to work. She couldn't make her hands move. She knew better. It wouldn't work unless she said the words. She knew it wouldn't. She had grown up around wizards and magic. She knew better than to disregard what Nathan had told her. Without the words, it wouldn't work. She fell forward with a wail, beating her fists against the stone floor. I can't remember the words. I can't. Kara put an arm around Kaylin, making her sit up, holding her in a gentle embrace. Calm down. Take a breath. Good. Let it go. Take another. Now picture in your mind this man, Nathan. Picture him telling you the words and how happy you were that you could save Richard's life. Kaylin tried. She tried so hard she wanted to scream. I can't remember them, she wept. Richard's going to die because I can't remember three stupid words. I can't remember the three chimes. The three chimes? Kara asked. You mean the Richani, Sintrosi, Vasi? Those three chimes? Kalin stared in disbelief. That's them. The three chimes. Richani, Sintrosi, Vasi. Richani, Sintrosi, Vasi. I remember. Thank you, Kara. I remember. Kalin pulled out a grain of black sorcerer's sand between her thumb and finger. Richani, Sintrosi, Vasi, she said again for good measure. She tossed the grain of black sand into the book. She and Kara both held their breath. A hum slowly built in the room. The air seemed to dance and vibrate. Light of every color flared forth, twisting and tumbling, pulsing and throbbing. It grew with the hum until Kaylin had to turn her eyes away. Rays of light swept across the stone walls. Kara put a hand up before her face. Kaylin did the same. So bright was the light that just turning away was not enough. And then darkness began gathering like the inky black of a nightstone, or of the book's cover itself, pulling the light and color back into the book. It drew all the light from the room until all fell into darkness. In that depth of sightless obscurity, there came such terrible moans that Kaylin was thankful she couldn't see their source. The wails of souls filled the room, scattering about in a blind, mad frenzy, swirling through the air, lost, frantic, wild. The sound of distant laughter that Kalen knew all too well 
died into a wail that stretched into eternity. When the light of the candles returned, the book was gone, only a stain of ash to show where it had been. Kalin and Kara rushed to Richard. He opened his eyes. He still didn't look well, but he looked more alert. His breathing was stronger and even. What happened? he asked. I can breathe. My head isn't pounding. The mother confessor saved you, Kara announced. As I have told you so often, women are stronger than men. Kara, Kalin whispered. How did you know the three chimes? Kara shrugged. The legged Rishi knew the words with the message from the winds. When you said the three chimes, they just came to me through his magic, as the other messages from the winds came to me. Kalin pressed her forehead to Kara's shoulder in relief, in wordless gratitude. With equally silent empathy, Kara stroked Kalin's back. Richard blinked and scrunched his eyes as if clearing his head. When he sat up, Kalin leaned to hug him, but Kara held her back. Please, Mother Confessor, may I be first? I fear that once you start, I may never again get a chance. Kalin grinned. You're right about that. Take all you want. As Kara threw her arms around Richard and squeezed for all she was worth, whispering private heartfelt words in his ear, Kalin stood and faced the Sliff. I can't thank you enough, Sliff. You saved Richard. You are a friend, and I will honor you as long as I live. The silver face warped into a satisfied smile. She looked down at Refn's body. He had no magic, but he was using his talent to stop the flow of blood so that he might live long enough to kill Master. It is death to breathe me if you have no magic. I am pleased I could take him on a journey, a journey to the world of the dead. Richard stood on wobbly legs and slipped an arm around Kalin's waist. Sliff, you have my gratitude too. I don't know what it is I could ever do for you, but if it is within my power, it's yours for the asking. The Sliff smiled. Thank you, Master. I would be pleased to have you travel with me. You will be pleased. Even though he was unsteady on his feet, Richard's eyes had the sparkle back. Yes, we would like to travel. I need to rest for a time first, to finish recovering and get my strength back, and then we will travel. I promise you. Kalin took up Kara's hand. Are you all right? I mean, are you really all right, everything? Kara nodded with a haunted look in her eyes. I still have the ghosts of the past with me, but I am all right. Thank you, sister, for helping me. It is not often that a moored Sith can depend on anyone else for help, but with Richard as Lord Rao and you as Mother Confessor, all things seem possible. Kara glanced to Richard. When you healed the Mother Confessor, you seemed to glow as if a spirit was with you. I believe the good spirits helped me. I do indeed. I recognized the spirit. It was Raina. Richard nodded. It felt like Raina. When I was in the spirit world, Dena told me that Raina was at peace and knows that we love her. I think we should tell this to Berdine, Kara said. Richard slipped his other arm around Kara's waist and started them all toward the door. I think we should, too. Chapter 68 Several days later, when Richard was almost fully recovered, Tristan Bashkar's uncle, King Jaren Bashkar, the King of Jara, rode into Adendril at the head of his company of King's Lancers. On the point of each of the hundred lances was a head. Kalin watched from a window as the lances, under the watchful eye of Daharan soldiers, were deployed in an arrow-straight double row along the entrance to the Confessor's palace. Flags of state flew from poles held by the first opposing pair of Jarian soldiers. Jaran Bashkar, with his star guide Javas Kadar behind him, waited until the lancers were lined up perfectly, their armor gleaming in the sun, before he strode regally between the row of heads toward the entrance. As she peered out the window, Kalin touched Kara's arm. Go get Richard. Have him meet me in the council chambers. Kara was out the door and on her way before Kalin could turn to be on her way too. Kalin Amnel, Mother Confessor, sitting in the first chair under the figures of Magda Cirrus, the first Mother Confessor and her wizard Merit, painted across the expanse of the dome above the council chambers, 
waited for her wizard. Her heart lifted when she saw him sweep into the room, golden cloak billowing out behind, dressed in the gold-trimmed black outfit of a war wizard, the gold and ruby amulet on his chest gleaming in the streamers of sunlight through which he strode, his silver wristbands burnished and bright. The sword of truth at his hip caught the light, sending out a starburst of sunlight to glitter across the polished marble. Good morning, my queen, he called out, his voice echoing around the huge room. How do you fare this, your last day of freedom? Kalin rarely laughed in the council chambers. It had always seemed improper. She laughed now, the lilting sound echoing around the cavernous room, bringing a smile to the guards. I fare well, Lord Rall, she said as he ascended the dais. Kara and Verdine followed in his shadow, along with Ulick and Egan, taking up places to either side. What's going on, he asked more seriously. I heard that some king just rode in with a hundred heads on pikes. The king of Jara, remember? You sent him Tristan's head, demanding his surrender? Oh, that king. Richard slid down into a chair beside her. Whose heads are they? I guess we're about to find out. The guards pulled open the double doors. Light stabbed in through the doorway, silhouetting the two figures as they approached. Once before the dais, the king spread his violet cape, trimmed in spotted white fox, and went to one knee in a deep bow. Behind him, the star guide went to both knees in his bow. Rise, my children, Kalin said in formal response to the bow. Mother confessor, King Joran said, how good to see you again. His trim figure, his graying hair meticulously cut so that it swept back as if he were facing the wind, his elegant scabbard and sword, his ribbons, his sash, his red and blue and gold embroidered coat, and his jeweled pins made him look one of the most grand of kings, Kalin had always thought. And you, King Joran, Kalin lifted an introductory hand. This is Lord Rao, master of the Daharan Empire and my husband-to-be. The king lifted an eyebrow. As I have heard it told, my congratulations. Richard leaned forward. I sent you a message. What is your reply? Kalin thought that she had a lot of work to do, teaching Richard proper diplomatic decorum. The king let out a belly laugh. It will be a pleasure being part of an empire led by a man who doesn't jibber-jabber me to death. He lifted a thumb, indicating the star guide behind him. Like some people? And does that mean that you surrender? Richard pressed. It does indeed, Lord Rall, Mother Confessor. A large delegation from the Imperial Order came to Sandalar and invited us to join the Imperial Order. We had been waiting for a sign, as requested by Javis Kadar here. Tristan thought to take matters into his own hands and try to strike a favorable deal with the Order. When the plague came, we thought it showed the power of the Order, and we feared that, I must admit. But when you swept the plague from the land, that was sign enough for me. Javis here will no doubt soon find the appropriate sign in the sky to confirm my decision. If not, there are other star guides. A red-faced Javis Kadar bowed. As I told you, Your Highness, as your star guide, I will be able to confirm your decision without difficulty. The king scowled over his shoulder. Good. And the heads, Richard asked. The delegation from the Imperial Order. I brought you their heads to show you my sincerity. I wanted you to see that this is a choice I make with conviction. I thought it a fitting answer to the likes of people who would cast a plague into the land to kill indiscriminately. It shows their true nature, putting the lie to all the things they say. Richard bowed his head to the king. Thank you, King Joran. Who ordered the beheading of my nephew, Tristan? I did, Richard said. As I stood on a balcony watching with the Mother Confessor at my side, Tristan entered the Mother Confessor's bedroom and stabbed a nightdress stuffed with tow that we had placed there. He thought he was killing her. The king shrugged. Justice befits all, no matter his station. I bear no grudge. Tristan did not serve our people well, either. I look forward to the day we can be rid of the threat from the Order. As do we, Richard said. With your help, we are that much closer to that day. As the king went to see to the signing of papers and to discuss logistics with the Daharan command, 
Richard and Kalin rose to leave, but were interrupted by a guard. What is it? Kalin asked. There are three men asking to see Lord Rall. Three men? Who are they? They did not give their names, Mother Confessor, but they said they were Rog Moss. Richard sat back down. Send them in. Under the desk, Kalin reached over and curled her fingers around his hand, giving him a reassuring squeeze as three figures in flaxen cloaks with broad hoods pulled up onto their heads and with their hands folded before them, glided up to the dais. I am Lord Rall, Richard said. Yes, the one in front said. We feel the bond. He lifted a hand out to his side. This is Brother Kerloff, and this is Brother Hulk. He pushed his hood back to reveal a heavily creased face and a head of thinning gray hair. I am Marsden Tabur. Richard warily eyed the three men. Welcome to Aidendrill. I hear you wanted to see me. What is it I can do for you? We are searching for Drefen Rall, Marsden Tabur said. Richard rubbed his thumb along the edge of the desk as he watched the three men. I'm sorry, but your high priest is dead. The two in back shared a look. Marsden Tabur's expression darkened. High priest? I am the high priest of the Rog Moss, and have been since before Drefen was born. Richard frowned. Drefen told us he was the high priest. Marsden Tabor stroked his temple as he searched for words. Lord Rall, I'm afraid that your brother was given to delusion. If he told you that he was the high priest of the Rog Moss, then he was deceiving you for reasons I fear to imagine. He was left with us by his mother when he was a young boy. We raised him knowing what his father would do should he come to discover a son without the gift. Drefen could be dangerous. Once we realized this, we kept him confined within our community to prevent him from hurting anyone. He was talented at healing, and we always hoped that he would come to be at peace with himself. We hoped that through healing he could find a way to prove his worth in his own right. A while back he vanished. Several of our healers were found dead. They had been killed in a most unpleasant fashion. Torture. We have been searching for Drefen since. We have been to several places where he had been, and found women who had been murdered in a similar way. Drefen had an unsavory attitude toward women. His father, too, was not inclined to be kind toward women. Though he escaped his father in body, I think he failed to escape him in spirit. I pray he has not caused harm to anyone here. Richard was silent for a time before he spoke. We had a plague, a terrible plague. Thousands died. Without regard for himself, Drefen, upholding the noble ideals of the Rog Moss, worked to help those stricken. He shared his knowledge, and in that way may have prevented yet more from dying. My brother in his own way helped stop the plague, and in so doing he died. Marsden Tabor folded his hands before him again as he studied Richard's eyes. Is this the way you wish it remembered? He was my brother. Partly because of his being here, I learned the power of forgiveness. Kalin squeezed Richard's hand under the table. Thank you for seeing me, Lord Rall. Marsden Tabor bowed. In your light we thrive. Thank you, Richard whispered. The three healers started away, but Marsden Tabor turned back. I knew your father. You do not take after him. Drefen did. Not many will mourn the passing of your father or your brother. I can see in your eyes, Lord Rall, a healer, a true healer, besides a warrior. A wizard as a healer must be in balance or he is lost. Tahara is well served at long last. Call on us if you have need. Ulick let out a sigh when the doors closed. Lord Rall, there are other representatives also wishing to see you. If you are well enough, Kara added. Someone always wants to see us. Richard stood and held out his hand to Kalin. General Curzon can see them. Don't we have something more important to do? Are you sure you are well enough? Kalin asked. I've never felt better. You haven't had a change of mind, have you? Kalin smiled as she took his hand and stood. Never. If Lord Rall is fully recovered, what are we waiting for? My things are ready. About time, Verdine muttered.
As they waited for Richard to return, Kaylin put a reassuring hand on Kara's back. She wouldn't lie to us, Kara. If the Sliff says you can travel, you can travel. The Sliff had tested Kara, Berdine, Ulick, and Egan, all of them thinking that as guards they should go along to protect Richard and Kaylin. Only Kara had passed the Sliff's test. Richard guessed that it was because Kara had linked with the Andolian leader, Legat Rishi, and he must have an element of both sides of the magic. Kara didn't like anything to do with magic, and the sliff was definitely magic enough to give her pause. Kalen leaned close and whispered in Kara's ear, You have passed bigger tests than this in this room. I am a sister of the Aegeal. I will hold your hand the whole way. Kara eyed Kalen and then the sliff. You have to do it, Kara, Berdine pleaded. You will be the only Mord Sith at the wedding of our Lord Rall and Mother Confessor. Kara's brow twitched as she leaned toward Berdine. Lord Rall healed you one time, Berdine nodded. Since then, have you felt a special bond with him? Berdine smiled. Yes, that is why I want you to go. I'll be all right. I know Raina would want you to go, too. She gave Ulick a backhanded slap on his stomach. Besides, someone has to stay here and keep Ulick and Egan in line. Ulick and Egan together rolled their eyes. Kara put a hand on Kalen's arm as she leaned close and whispered, Since Lord Rall healed you, have you felt... Have you felt it too? Kalen smiled. I felt it before he healed me. It is called love, Kara. Truly caring about someone else. Not only because you are bonded to them, but because you share something in your heart. When he healed you, you felt his love for you. But I knew before that, Kalen shrugged. Maybe it was just a more vivid way of feeling it. Kara lifted her Aegeal, rolling it in her fingers. Maybe he is a brother of the Aegeal, Kalen smiled. With all we've been through together, I guess we are all as close as family. Richard strode into the room. I'm ready. Shall we travel? Richard couldn't take the Sword of Truth into the Sliff. Its magic was incompatible with life being sustained while traveling. He had gone up to leave his sword in the first wizard's enclave where it would be safe, where no one but he could get to it. Except Zed, of course. But Zed was no longer living. At least Kalen didn't think he was alive. Richard refused to doubt that he was. Richard rubbed his hands together. So, Kara, are you going or not? I would really like you to be there. It would mean a lot to us. Kara smiled. I must go. You are incapable of protecting yourself. Without a Mord Sith, you would be helpless. Richard turned to the silver face, watching them. Sliff, I know that I put you to sleep before, but you didn't stay asleep. Why? You did not put me into the deep sleep from which only one such as yourself can call me. You put me at rest. Others can call me if I am only at rest. But we can't allow those others to use you. Can't you refuse? Can't you just not go to them if they call? We can't have you taking Jagang's wizards and such all over creation to cause trouble. The Sliff regarded him with a thoughtful expression. Those who made me the Sliff made me this way. I must travel with those who ask if they have the price of power required. She moved to the edge of her well, closer to him. But if I was asleep, only you have the power to call me, Master. And then the others could not use me. But I tried to put you to sleep before, and it didn't work. The Sliff's smile returned. You did not have the silver required before. Silver? The Sliff reached out and touched his wristbands. Silver. You mean when I crossed my wrists to put you to sleep before, it didn't work because I didn't have these? And now if I put you to sleep, it will work? Yes, Master. Richard thought a moment. Does it... Hurt or anything when you are put into this sleep? No, it is rapture for me when I sleep, because I am with the rest of my soul. Richard's eyes widened. When you sleep, you go to the world of souls? Yes, Master. I am not to tell anyone how it is that they can put me into the sleep, but you are the only Master. And since you wish to know, you will not be angry that I tell you. Richard sighed with relief. Thank you, Sliff. You have given us a way to prevent the wrong people from using you. I'm glad to know that you will be pleased to go into your sleep. 
Richard hugged Verdine. Take care of everything until we get back. I am to be in charge then? Verdine asked. Richard frowned suspiciously. All three of you are in charge. Are you sure you heard that, Mistress Verdine? Ulick asked. I don't want you to later say that you heard no such orders. Verdine made a face at him as Richard helped Kalen up onto the well. I heard. All three of us are to take care of things. Kaylin adjusted the bone knife on her arm and the pack on her back. She took Kara's hand as she climbed up. Sliff, Richard said with a big grin, we wish to travel. Chapter 69 Breathe. Kaylin let go the silken rapture and drew in a breath and the world. As they sat up on the edge of the Sliff stone wall, Kaylin smacked Kara on the back. Breathe, Kara. Come on, let it go. Let out the sliff and breathe. Kara finally bent forward and released the sliff from her lungs, reluctantly pulling a breath. Kalen remembered how hard it was the first time, not only to breathe the sliff, but to then breathe the air again. Kara had held on tightly to Richard and Kalen's hands the whole time they traveled. Kara looked up with a silly grin. That was wonderful. Richard gave them both a hand down. Kaylin adjusted the bone knife on her arm and the small pack on her back. It felt good to be in her traveling clothes again. Kara thought that Kaylin looked odd in pants. This is where you wish to travel, the slip said. The Jokopo treasure. Richard looked around the cave, having to duck down because the ceiling was so low. I don't see any treasure. It's in the next room, Kaylin told him. Someone must be expecting us. They left a torch burning. Are you ready to sleep? Richard asked the sliff. Yes, master. I look forward to being with my soul. The thought of what the sliff was, what the wizards had made her into, gave Kalin shivers. Will it make you unhappy when I need to wake you again? No, master. I am always ready to please. Richard nodded. Thank you for your help. We all are in your debt. Have a good sleep. The sliff smiled at him as Richard crossed his wrists, closing his eyes, calling the magic. The shiny silver face, reflecting the dancing torchlight, softened, melting back into the pool of quicksilver. Richard's fists began to glow. The silver wristbands he wore brightened to such intensity that Kalen could see the other side of them through his flesh and bone, and the way they touched, they formed into endless twin loops, the symbol for infinity. The pool of sparkling silver took on the glow as the sliff sank down into her well, slowly at first, and then with gathering speed, until she vanished into the far darkness below. Richard took the reed torch, and the three of them moved out through a wide, low passageway, following the twisting, turning route through dark brown rock, until they came at last to an expansive room. Kalen gestured around the room. The Jokopo treasure. Richard held the torch up. Torchlight reflected back in thousands of golden sparkles from the room, filled with gold in nearly every form, from nuggets and crude ingots to gold statues. Well, it isn't hard to see why it's called the Jokopo treasure, Richard said. He pointed toward the shelves. Looks like something is missing. Kalen saw what he meant. When I was here before, those shelves were packed full of rolled vellum scrolls. She sniffed the air. Something else is missing, too. This room was filled with foul air before. It's gone now. She remembered how it made her gag and cough and her head spin, having to breathe the stench. On the floor of the cave was a smoldering heap of ash. Kalen swiped the toe of her boot across the ash. I wonder what happened here. The flame of the torch whipped and fluttered as they followed the twisting tunnel up and out into a golden dawn. Thin bands of violet clouds drifted across the sunrise. Luminous gold, more stunning than the Jacopo treasure, edged the clouds. Verdant grasslands spread out before them, smelling clean and fresh. It looks like the Azrith plains in spring, Kara said, before the high heat of summer bakes it barren. Broad swaths of wildflowers at their feet led in the general direction of the mud people. Kalen took Richard's hand. It was a beautiful morning for a walk through the spring grasslands of the wilds. It was a beautiful day to be married. 
Long before they reached the mud people's village, they could hear the sound of drums drifting out onto the plains. Laughter and song filled the morning air. Sounds like the mud people are having a banquet, Richard said. What do you think that's about? His voice sounded uneasy. She felt the same. Banquets were usually held to call the spirit ancestors in preparation for a gathering. Chandalin met them not far from the village. He was wearing the coyote hide of an elder. His hair was slicked down with sticky mud. He was bare-chested and had on his ceremonial dress of buckskin pants and his finest knife, and he carried his best spear. Grim-faced, Chandalin strode forward and slapped Kalin. Strength to confessor Kalin. Richard caught Kara by the wrist. Easy, he whispered. We told you about this. It's the way they greet people. Kalin returned the slap, a show of respect for a person's strength. Strength to Chandalin and the mud people. It is good to be home. She fingered the coyote hide. You are an elder now? He nodded. Elder Bregandaren died of the fever. I was named Elder. Kalin smiled. A wise choice, them picking you. Chandalin stood before Richard, appraising him a moment. The two men had once been foes. Chandalin finally slapped Richard, harder than he had Kalin. Strength to Richard with the temper. It is good to see you again, too. I am happy that you are to marry the mother confessor, so that she will not pick Chandalin. Richard returned the slap in kind. Strength to Chandalin. You have my gratitude for protecting Kalin on your journey together. He lifted a hand. This is our friend and protector, Kara. Chandalin was a protector of his people, and the term had special meaning to him. He lifted his chin as he looked into her eyes. He slapped her harder than he had slapped either Richard or Kalin. Strength to protect her, Kara. It was fortunate that Kara wasn't wearing her armored gloves. As hard as she punched him, she would have broken his jaw. Chandalin grinned when he straightened his neck. Strength to Chandalin, she said to him, and then to Richard. I like this custom. Kara reached out and ran a finger over a few of Chandalin's scars. Very nice. This one here is excellent. The pain must have been exquisite. Chandalin frowned at Kalin and spoke in his language. What does that last word mean? It means that it must have been intense pain, Kalin told him. She had taught Chandalin her language, and he did very well, but he still had some to learn. Chandalin grinned with pride. Yes, it was very painful. I wept for my mother. Kara lifted an eyebrow to Kalin. I like him. Chandalin looked Kara up and down, taking in the red leather and the shape of her. You have fine breasts. Her aegeal flicked up into her fist. Kalin put a restraining hand on Kara's arm. The mud people have different customs, she whispered. To them, it means that you look like a healthy, strong woman able to bear children and raise them to be healthy. To them, this is a strictly proper compliment. She leaned closer, lowering her voice so that Chandalin couldn't hear. Just don't tell him that you would like to see him with the mud washed out of his hair, or you will be inviting him to give you those children. Kara took in all this, considering Kalin's words with care. Finally, she turned and, bending over a little, lifted her red leather to expose a nasty scar. This one was very painful, like the one you have. Chandalin grunted with knowing appreciation. I had more on my front, but Lord Rall made them disappear. It is a shame. Some were quite remarkable. Richard and Kalin followed behind Chandalin and Kara as he showed her his weapons, and they discussed the worst place to be wounded. She was impressed with his knowledge. Chandalin, Kalin asked, what's going on? Why has a banquet been called? He looked over his shoulder as if she were deranged. It is a wedding banquet, for your wedding. Kalin and Richard shared a look. But how did you know we were coming to be married? Chandalin shrugged. The birdman told me. As they entered the village, they were surrounded by a flood of people. Children swept in around them, touching the wandering mud people as they called Richard and Kalin. People they knew came to give them gentle slaps in greeting. Savidlin was there, clapping Richard on the back, and his wife, Wesselon, was hugging and kissing them both. Their son, Sidon, threw his arms around Kalin's leg, jabbering up at them in his language. It felt so good to ruffle his hair again. Richard and Kara didn't understand any of it. Only Chandalin spoke their language. 
We have come to be married, Kalin told Wesselon. I brought the beautiful dress you made for me. I hope you remember that I asked you to stand with me. Wesselon beamed. I remember. Kalin saw a man with long silver hair dressed in buckskin pants and tunic approaching. She leaned toward Kara. This is their leader. The bird man greeted them with the gentle slaps customary in the village proper. He embraced Kalin in a fatherly hug. The fever is over. Our ancestor's spirit must have been a help to you. Kalin nodded. I am glad you are home. It will be good to wed you and Richard with the temper. Everything is prepared. What did he say? Richard asked. Everything is prepared for our wedding. Richard scowled. It makes me nervous when people know things that we haven't told them. Richard with the temper is upset. He is not happy with our preparations. No, it's not that, Kalin said. Everything is wonderful. It's just that we don't understand how you could know we would be here to be married. We're puzzled. We didn't know ourselves until just a couple of days ago. The bird man pointed to one of the open pole structures shaded under a grass roof. That man over there told us. Really, Richard said after Kalin translated, his scowl growing. Well, I think it's about time we go see this man who seems to know more about us than we do. As they turned away, Kalin caught the birdman scratching a cheek to screen a smile. They had to work at making their way through the throng. The entire village was out in the open area celebrating, musicians and dancers, entranced children and adults alike. People paused to talk to Richard and Kalin as they passed. Young people, especially young girls, who were always painfully shy in the past, now boldly offered congratulations. It was as festive an event as Kalin had ever seen. At various open pole structures where food was being prepared, people beguiled by the different aromas crowded around to sample the fare. A contingent of young women carried bowls and platters and passed around food. Kalin saw special women at one of the cook fires preparing a singular offering served only at gatherings. No one congregated to sample it. This dish was presented only by those women according to strict protocol and by invitation only. Kara didn't like how close people crowded in around her charges, but she did her best to remain tolerant while at the same time watchful and prepared to react. She wasn't gripping her aegeal, but Kayla knew that it was never more than a flick away. Young women were carrying platters of the more traditional food to and from the pole building where the birdman had pointed them. Richard, holding Kalin by the hand, pushed his way through the crowd around the platform. They finally made it to the head of the crowd at the platform. Richard and Kalin froze in shock. Zed, Richard whispered. Reposing in his splendid violet and black robes, the regal effect somewhat diminished by the way his wavy white hair stuck out in its typical disarray, was Richard's grandfather. The raw-boned old wizard glanced up from the platform as young women offered him platters of food to sample. A squat woman in a dark dress and cloak sat cross-legged beside him. Zed! Richard bounded onto the platform. Zed smiled and waved. Oh, there you are, my boy. You're alive. I knew you were alive. Well, of course I'm... That was all he got out before Richard scooped him up, squeezing so hard that Zed lost his wind with a whoosh. Zed's fists beat on Richard's shoulders. Richard, he squeaked. Bags, Richard, you're going to crush me. Leave go. Richard set him down, only to have Kalin rush to embrace him. Richard kept saying you were alive, but I didn't believe him. The woman rose up. Good to see you, Richard. Anne, you're alive too, she smiled. No thanks to your fool grandfather. Her knowing eyes turned to Kalin. And this could be none other than the mother confessor herself. Richard hugged her before the introductions. Zed took a bite of a rice cake while he watched. Richard brought Kara forward. She spoke before he had a chance. I am Lord Rawl's bodyguard. Richard looked to her eyes. This is Kara, and she is more than a guard. She is our friend. Kara, this is my grandfather, Zed and Annalina Aldurin, prelate of the Sisters of the Light. Retired, prelate, Anne said. Pleased to meet a friend of Richard. Richard turned back to Zed. I can't believe you're here. This is the best surprise we could possibly have. But what's this about you knowing we were coming to get married? Zed spoke with his mouth full. Read it. Read all about it. 
Read it? Where? In the Jocopo treasure. Kalin leaned in. There's writing on all that gold? Zed waved the rice cake. No, no, not the gold. The Jocopo treasure, the prophecies. All those scrolls, they were the Jocopo treasure. We burned them to keep them out of the hands of the Imperial Order. I read a few before I destroyed them. That's what I read the prophecy about you two being married and figured out the day. She's quite knowledgeable about prophecy. Well, it wasn't a difficult prophecy, Anne said. None of them were. That was why they were so dangerous if Jagang had captured them. He nearly did. So you two came to destroy the prophecies, Richard asked. Yes. Zed threw up his hands with a huff. Oh, but a terrible time of it we've had, though. Yes, just terrible, Anne confirmed. Zed shook a stick-like finger at Richard. While you've been larking about in Aiden Drill, we've had real trouble. Trouble? What sort of trouble? Awful trouble, Anne said. Yes, Zed agreed. We were captured and held in the most horrid of conditions. It was awful, simply awful. We barely got away with our lives. Who captured you? The Nang Tong. Kalen cleared her throat. The Nang Tong? Why would the Nang Tong capture you? Zed tugged his robe straight. They were going to sacrifice us. Human sacrifices we almost were. We were in mortal danger the entire time. Kalin squinted skeptically. The Nang Tong are daring to engage in their forbidden rites? Something about red moons, Zed offered. They feared the worst and were only trying to protect themselves. Kalin cocked her head. Nonetheless, I will have to pay them a visit and see to this. You could have been killed, Richard said. Piffle! A wizard and a sorceress are smarter than a wandering band of Nang Tong, aren't we, Anne? Anne blinked. Well, well, yes, as Anne says, it was more complicated than that. Zed turned away from her. But it was just awful, I can assure you. And then we were sold into slavery. Richard's brow lifted. Slavery? Indeed, to the sea dock. We were forced to labor as slaves, but the sea dock didn't like us for some reason. Something about Anne being unsatisfactory, and they decided to sell us to cannibals. Richard's jaw dropped. Cannibals? Zed grinned. Fortunately, the cannibals turned out to be the mud people. Chandelin was the one they approached. He knew me, of course, from when we were together before, so he played along and bought us to get us away from our bondage to the sea dock. And why couldn't you get away from the sea dock? Kalen asked. You're a wizard, and as a sorceress. Zed pointed at his bare wrists. They put magic wristbands on us. We were helpless, he looked up. Quite helpless. It was terrible. We were helpless slaves under the lash. That sounds dreadful, Richard said. Then how did you get the bands off? Zed threw his arms up. We couldn't. Richard pressed one hand to his forehead and held the other up. Well, they're off now. Zed scratched his chin. Well, now they are. The bands are held on with magic. I, we, were smart enough to know better than to try to use magic. That would have bound them on even harder. We just had to wait without using magic until they lost their power. Once we were away from the sea, Dulk, and were burning the scrolls, they came undone and fell off. So that was your plan all along? Of course it was, Anne nodded. Trust in the Creator to reveal his plan. Zed shook a finger up at Richard. Magic is dangerous, Richard. As you will learn someday, the hardest part of being a wizard is knowing when not to use magic. This was one of those times. We had to find the Jacopo treasure. With all the currents of trouble about, I knew our best chance would be to do it without magic. He folded his arms. And it worked, too, thus proving my point. Chandelin stepped forward. Many soldiers came toward us, he pointed off toward the southeast. A large scouting party of men came to get these things that Zed burned. While he and Anne were burning them, my men and I fought off the enemy. A great battle was fought to the west against the main force of the enemy. This army of the order was destroyed. I went and spoke with a man named Rybish, and he said that one named Nathan had sent him to destroy our enemy. Richard shook his head. This is all very confusing. Zed flicked a hand. Ah, well, you'll learn someday, Richard. This wizard business is very complicated. Someday, when you decide to do something with your gift other than sit around with your intended while I'm out risking my neck, then you will see. 
By the way, what have you been up to while all the important work has been going on? What have I been up to? Kalen smiled as she put a hand on his shoulder while Richard tried to think how to begin. Ah, well, I'm the Lord Rawl now and all. Zed grunted and flopped down on the wooden platform. Lord Rawl indeed, he scooped up a roasted pepper. The paperwork must be grueling. Richard scratched his head while Anne sat down. Zed, can you answer something for me? Why are the books in the first wizard's private enclave stacked up in wobbly columns? It's a telltale of sorts. I remember how they're stacked, so that if anyone has touched them, I'll know it. Zed's hazel eyes opened wide. What? Bags, Richard! What were you doing in there? That's a dangerous place. And how did you get in there? Zed pointed at Richard's chest. That amulet! It's from in there! How did you get in there? Bags, Richard! Where's the Sword of Truth? I entrusted the sword to you. You weren't foolish enough to give it to someone. Uh, well... I couldn't travel in the Slith with it, so I had to leave it in the first wizard's enclave so no one could get at it. Slith? What's a Slith? Richard, you're the seeker. You have to have your sword. It's your weapon. You can't just leave it lying about places. When you gave it to me, you told me that the sword was just a tool and that it is the seeker that is the true weapon. So I did, but I didn't think you were listening. Zed peered up at him. You didn't mess with the books, I hope. You don't know enough to be allowed to read any of them. Just one. Tagenricht ost fuermost, velaschendrich nicht grechlichten. That's Heideharen, Zed dismissed the matter with a wave. No one knows Heideharen anymore. At least you can't get into trouble with a book you can't read. Zed shook his finger. And you still haven't said how you got in there. It wasn't all that hard to get in. The mirth melted from Richard's face. It was a lot easier than it was getting into the Temple of the Winds. Both Zed and Anne shot to their feet. The Temple of the Winds, they said as one. Temple of the Winds, Inquisition and Trial. That's what the book was. I've kind of had to learn Hydaharan. Richard put his arm around Kalin's shoulders. Jagang sent Sister Amelia there. She entered through something called Betrayer's Hall. She betrayed the Keeper to get in. She came back with magic and started a plague. It killed thousands of people. She started it among children at Jagang's instruction. We watched helpless while children and friends died. There was no other way. I had to go there to stop the plague or it would have been a firestorm that would have consumed nearly everyone. One of the women who prepared the special meat approached, carrying a tray of neatly arranged dried strips. She offered the tray to Chandelin first. He was an elder now. Chandelin tore off a bite as he looked up at Richard. Richard knew what the meat was. He took a big piece. Kaylin had always refused to eat this dish in the past. This time when offered, she took a piece. Chandelin watched her pull off a bite. Zed took a piece, and then the tray was offered to Anne. Kaylin was going to say something, but Zed shot her a silencing glance. They ate in silence a moment before Richard asked, Who is it? The commander of the men of the order who came here and attacked us to get the Jokopo treasure that Zed burned. Anne's eyes came up. You mean... We fight a battle for our existence, Richard said. If we lose, we all die, and the man who started a plague among children will rule those still alive. All magic will be eliminated. Those left will be his slaves. The mud people do this so that they might know the hearts of their enemy and save their families. Richard glared at her. Eat it so that you too may know the enemy better. It was not Richard, but Lord Rawl who had spoken. Anne watched his eyes for a moment and then started chewing. They all ate the strip of their enemy's flesh to know him better. Sister Amelia, Anne finally whispered, if she has been to the Temple of the Winds, she will be beyond dangerous. She's dead, Kalin said, haunted by the memory of it all. When Anne's questioning eyes looked at her, Kalin added, yes, I am sure I put a sword through her heart. She had a dakra in Nathan's leg. She was going to kill him. Nathan, Anne said. We must soon be off to find him. Where was this? Where is he? Zed scowled over at Anne. We? It was in Tanamura, in the old world, just after Richard came back from the Temple of the Winds. Nathan helped me save Richard's life by telling me the three chimes. Zed and Anne's eyes widened. They looked as if they had stopped breathing. They finally glanced to each other. The three chimes, 
Anne said in a cautious voice. You mean he just mentioned the three chimes? He didn't actually tell them to you? He didn't speak them to you? Kalin nodded. Rechon, Zed and Anne threw their hands up. No! They yelled together. Didn't Nathan tell you that no one without the gift may speak the three chimes aloud? Anne's face had gone red. Didn't that crazy old man tell you that? Kalin scowled back. Nathan is not a crazy old man. He helped me save Richard's life. Without the three chimes, Richard would have died when he came back from the Temple of the Winds. I owe Nathan a great debt. We all do. I owe him a collar around his neck, Anne muttered. Before he causes who knows what catastrophe. Zed, we must find him, and soon. She lowered her voice to a private whisper. And we must do something about this business. Zed's eyes turned to Kalen. You said them silently when you did this. You said the three chimes silently. You didn't actually say them aloud. Tell me that you didn't say them aloud. I had to. Kara remembered them and said them. Then I said them aloud a couple of times. Zed winced. More than once? Zed, Anne murmured. What are we going to do about this? Why? Richard asked. What's the problem? Nothing you need be concerned about. Just don't say them aloud again, any of you. Zed, Anne whispered under her breath. If she has freed... Zed lifted a hand out to the side, touching her, silencing her. What was I supposed to do? Kalen asked defensively. Richard had absorbed the magic from the book Sister Amelia brought back from the winds. He had the plague. He was a breath or two away from death. He would have died within minutes at the most. Would you have had me let him die instead? Of course not, dear one. You did the right thing. Zed lifted an eyebrow to Anne as he leaned close. We will discuss this later. Anne folded her hands. Of course. You did the only thing you could. We are all grateful, Kalen. You did well. Zed was looking more serious by the moment. Bags, Richard, the Temple of the Winds is in the underworld. How did you get in? Richard looked out over the celebration. We need to tell you both the story, some of it anyway. But this is the day Kalen and I are to be married. Richard smiled. Kalen thought it looked forced. It's a hard story to tell. I'd rather tell you about it on another day. I can't just now. Zed stroked a thumb down his smooth jaw. Of course, Richard, I understand, and you are quite right, another day. But the Temple of the Winds! He lifted a finger, unable to resist asking a question. Richard, what did you have to leave at the Temple of the Winds in order to return? Richard shared a long look with his grandfather. Knowledge. And what did you take away with you? Understanding. Zed encircled a protective arm around both Richard and Kalen. Good for you, Richard. Good for you. Good for both of you. You two have earned this day. Let's put this other business aside for now and let us celebrate the joy of your marriage. Chapter 70 They enjoyed the company of friends and loved ones the whole day, talking and laughing, celebrating together with the mud people. Kaylin did her best to try to ignore the way her low-cut blue wedding dress displayed her breasts. It was hard with the way people kept coming up to her and telling her that she had fine breasts. Richard wanted to know what they were saying all the time. She thought it best to lie. She told him that they were saying that her dress was beautiful. As the sun turned the sky golden, it was at last time. Page 522. Kaylin gripped Richard's hand as if it were the only thing holding her on the ground. Richard had trouble keeping his eyes off her in her blue wedding dress. 
Every time he looked at her, a helpless smile took him. Kaylin's heart swelled with joy seeing how much he liked the dress Wesselon had made for her. She had for so long dreamed of wearing it, dreamed of this moment. She had hoped so often with all her heart that this day would come. She had feared so often that it never would. So many times something had happened, delaying this moment. Now it was happening. Richard mimicked the mud people's words, not realizing that he was saying how fine he thought her breasts looked. He thought he was telling her how beautiful her dress looked. Everyone grinned with satisfaction when he spoke the words in their language, happy that he agreed with them. Kaylin could feel her face turning red. Richard looked magnificent in his black and gold war wizard's uniform. Every time Kaylin looked at him, a smile took her. She was marrying Richard at last. Her knees trembled under the blue dress. Kara, standing behind, gave her a reassuring touch. Wesselon, at Kalin's side, beamed with pride. Savidlin stood to the far side of Richard, beaming just as much. Zed and Anne stood behind. Zed was eating something. Kalin silently prayed to the good spirits that this time nothing would go wrong and that it would at last happen. She couldn't help worrying that it would be taken from her yet again. The birdman straightened before them, clasping his hands. Behind him, the entire mud people village spread out before the wedding party to hear the vows. When all had fallen silent, the bird man began, and Kaylin's fear began to melt away to be replaced with joyous anticipation. As the bird man spoke, Chandelin at his side said the words in the language Richard and some of the others could understand. These two people have not been born mud people, but they have proven themselves to be one of us in their strength and in their hearts. They have bound themselves to us and us to them. They have been our friends and our protectors. That they would wish to be wedded as mud people proves their hearts. As members of our people, these two have chosen not only to be wedded before those of this world, but before the next, and in so doing have called the spirits of our ancestors to be with us on this day to smile on this joining. We welcome our ancestors into our hearts to share our joy. Richard's hand tightened around hers, and she realized that he was sharing her thoughts. It was real, at last, and it was as they both had always dreamed, except it was better than she could ever have imagined. Both of you are mud people, and are bound not only by your words before your people, but by your own hearts. These are simple words, but in simple things there is great power. He met Richard's eyes. Richard, will you have this woman as your wife, and will you love and honor her in all ways for all time? I will, he said in a clear voice that rang out over the gathering. The bird man looked into Kaylin's eyes, and she had the most profound sense that he was speaking not only as a representative of his people, but for the spirits, too. She could almost hear their voices echoing in his. Kaylin, Will you have this man as your husband, and will you love and honor him in all ways for all time? I will, she said, a clear chime matching Richard's. Then before your people, and before the spirits, you are now wedded for all time. All the gathered people were dead silent, until Richard took her in his arms and kissed her, and then they went wild. Kalin hardly heard them. It seemed a dream. A dream she had dreamed so often that it had finally come to life. To be in Richard's arms, to have him, to be his wife and he her husband for all time. And then everyone was hugging them, Zed and Anne, the Birdman and the elders, Wesselon and the other wives. Kara, with tears in her eyes, hugged Kalin. Thank you both for wearing an Aegeel at your wedding. Hali, Raina and Dena are all watching because of that. Thank you for honoring the sacrifice of Mord Sith. With a thumb, Kalin wiped the tear from Kara's cheek. Thank you for braving the magic of the Slith to be with us, my sister. Everyone in the village crowded in to greet the new couple. Kalin thought they might be crushed. People brought food and flowers and sincere, simple offerings of every sort. The celebration resumed around the wedding platform. Kalin tried to talk to everyone and to thank everyone, as did Richard, until, as Richard was asking some of Chandelin's hunters about the battle that they had witnessed, his golden cloak billowed out. There was no wind. Richard straightened. 
His raptor gaze swept out over the heads of the people gathered before the wedding platform. He instinctively reached for his sword. It wasn't there. The crowd in the back fell silent. Zed and Anne both stepped up beside Richard and Kalin. Kara had her Aegeel in her fist as she pushed between them to get in front. Richard gently pushed her behind. The entire village fell silent, the people parting for two approaching figures. Some people grabbed their children and moved farther back as worried whispers rippled through the crowd. As the two solitary figures, one tall and one short, came closer, Kaylin saw that it was Shota and her companion, Samuel. The witch woman, looking as stunning as ever, strode up onto the platform, her ageless almond eyes staying on Kaylin the whole time. Shota took up Kaylin's hand. She kissed Kaylin's cheek. I have come to congratulate you, Mother Confessor, on your accomplishment and on your marriage. Throwing caution to the winds, Kaylin hugged the witch woman. Thank you for coming, Shota. Shota smiled, staring into Richard's eyes as she ran a lacquered nail along his jaw. Hard fought, Richard. Hard fought. And well earned. Kaylin turned to the silent gathering. She knew that the mud people feared the witch woman so much that they wouldn't even speak her name. Kaylin could understand. She had felt nearly the same way herself. Shota has come to offer her best wishes to us on our wedding day. She has helped us in our struggle. She is a friend, and I hope you will welcome her to this celebration, for she deserves to be here, and I wish her to be here. Kaylin turned to Shota. I told them that, smiling, Shota held up a hand. I know what you told them, Mother Confessor. The bird man stepped forward. Welcome to our home, Shota. Thank you, bird man. You have my word that we will bring no harm this day. Shota glanced to Zed. A truce for a day. Zed smiled a sly smile. A truce. Samuel's long arm reached up, grabbing for the birdman's carved bone whistle he wore around his neck. Mine! Gimme! Shota thunked him on the head. Samuel, behave yourself. The birdman smiled. He pulled the thong and whistle over his head and held it out to Samuel. A gift for a friend to the mud people. Samuel gently took the whistle. A grin split his face, showing his wickedly sharp teeth. Thank you, birdman, Shota said. Samuel blew the silent whistle. He seemed able to hear the sound and was pleased by it. People began chuckling and talking again. Kalin was relieved that vultures didn't appear in response to the silent whistle. Fortunately, Samuel didn't know how to call specific birds. Samuel grinned at his gift and hung it around his neck. He took up Shota's hand again. Shota's arresting gaze took in Richard and Kalin. In that moment, there was no one else there. The three of them were as good as alone in that gaze. Do not think, either of you, that just because I congratulate you, I will forget my promise to you. Kalin swallowed. Shota. Shota's eyes were both beautiful and frightening as she held up a silencing finger. You both have earned this joyous wedding. I am happy for you both. I will honor your vows and protect you in any way I can out of respect for all you have done for me as long as you remember what I have warned you about. I will not allow a male child of this union to live. Do not doubt my word in this. Richard's gaze was heating. Shota, I'll not be threatened. Again, the finger rose, silencing Richard this time. I do not make a threat. I deliver you a promise. I do not do it out of animosity for either of you, but out of concern for everyone else in the world. There is a long struggle ahead of us all. I will not allow any chance at victory to be clouded by what you two would bring upon the world. Jagang is worry enough. For some reason, Kalin's voice wouldn't work. Richard didn't seem to have words either. Kalin believed Shota. She wasn't doing this out of malice. Shota lifted Kalin's hand and placed something in it. This is my gift to you both. I do this out of love for you both and for everyone else. She smiled a strange smile. An odd thing for a witch woman to say? No, Shota, Kalin said. I don't know that I believe what you tell us about a son, but I know that it is not said in hate. Good. Wear the gift always, 
and all will be well. Mark my words well. Never take this off when you are together, and you will always be happy. Disregard my request, and suffer the consequences of my vow. She looked into Richard's eyes. Better you battle the keeper himself than me. Kaylin opened her hand and saw a delicate necklace. A small dark stone hung from the gold chain. Why? What is this? Shota put a finger under Kaylin's chin as she stared into her eyes. As long as you wear it, you will bear no children. Richard's voice, strangely, seemed gentle. But what if we... Again, Shota's raised finger silenced him. You love each other. Have joy in that love and in each other. You have struggled hard to be together. Celebrate your union and your love. You have each other now, as you always wanted. Don't throw it away. Richard and Kalen both nodded. Somehow, Kalen didn't feel any anger. She felt nothing other than relief that Shota wasn't going to do anything to harm their marriage. It had a dreamlike quality, like a formal settlement over an obscure, remote tract of ground claimed by two lands, like agreements in the council chambers over which she had so often presided. There seemed no emotion to it, a simple settlement. Shota turned to go. Shota, Richard said. She turned back. Won't you stay? You've come a long way. Yes, Kalin said. We really would like it if you stayed. Shota smiled a witch-woman's smile as she watched Kalin fasten the chain around her neck. That you would ask is pleasure enough, but it is a long journey and we must be on our way. Kalin ran down the steps and scooped up a pile of tava bread. She wrapped it in a square of cloth from the table. She met Shota at the bottom of the steps. Take this for your journey, as our thanks for coming and for the gift. Shota kissed Kalin's cheek and then took the bundle. Samuel didn't try to grab it. He seemed content. Richard was suddenly there beside Kalin. Shota smiled a small smile and kissed his cheek too. She had a strange, wistful look. Thank you, both of you. And then she was gone. Simply gone. Zed and Anne were still up on the platform, along with Kara and the rest of the people. Zed turned to Richard and Kalin. What happened to Shota? We make a truce and then she just leaves without a word? Kalin's brow tightened. She spoke to us. Zed glanced about. When? She was gone before she had a chance to say anything. I had intended to speak with her too, Anne said. Kalin looked up at Richard. He looked back at Zed. She said some nice things to us. Maybe she just didn't want you to hear her saying nice things. Zed grunted a laugh. No doubt. Kalin touched the dark stone on the necklace. She put an arm around Richard's waist and pulled him close. What do you think, she whispered. Richard stared out in the direction Shota had gone. For now, she's right. We're together. That's what we wanted. I think that for now we should be happy that our dream has at last come true and we can be together. I'm so tired of trouble. And there is still Jagang to worry about. I'd just like to be with you for now and love you. Kaylin put her head against him. I think you're right. For now, let's not complicate matters. We can worry about this another time, he grinned at her. Right? Kaylin forgot all about Shota and the future and grinned back, thinking about the now. Right. The celebration went on until well after nightfall. Kaylin knew it would likely go on all night. She whispered to Richard that she would be happy not to have to remain for the whole thing. Richard kissed her cheek and then asked the birdman if they could be excused. They wanted to go to the spirit house. The spirit house had special meaning to both of them. The birdman smiled. It has been a long day. Sleep well. Richard and Kalin said their thanks to everyone, and then, in the quiet of the spirit house, in the soft glow of the low fire that always burned there, they were at long last alone. As they stared into each other's eyes, words were too small. Verdine stood tall and straight as she watched the double doors burst open. Like a gout of flame, they stormed into the confessor's palace, a dozen moored Sith in red leather. Soldiers scrambled across the slick marble, falling back out of the way, while at the same time trying not to look hurried. They quickly established new guard positions at a safe distance. 
The twelve women paid them no attention. The existence of Daharan soldiers hardly registered on the mind of a moored Sith, unless they gave her trouble. The group came to a halt. Silence once again settled in the entrance hall. Berdine, how good to see you. Berdine let a small smile touch her lips. Welcome, Rika. But what are you doing here? Lord Rahl left you at the People's Palace awaiting his return. Rika's eyes swept the area before her steady gaze settled on Berdine. We heard that he is here now, and we decided that we should be closer so that we could protect him. We left the others at the palace, should he return unexpectedly. We will return with him when he goes home. Berdine shrugged. He sort of considers this home now. Whatever he wishes, we are here now. Where is he so that we may announce ourselves and protect him? He has gone to be married, some distance to the south. Rika's brows drew together. Why are you not with him? He ordered me to stay here and to see to things in his absence. Kara is with him. Kara, good. Kara will not let anything happen to him. Rika considered a moment, her dark frown returning. Lord Rall is getting married? Berdine nodded. He is in love. The other women glanced at one another as Rika put her fists on her hips. In love? A Lord Rall in love? Somehow I can't picture it, she huffed. He is up to something. Well, never mind, we will figure it out. What of the others? Halley was killed a while back, in battle, protecting Lord Rall. A noble death. What of Raina? Berdine swallowed and forced her voice to stay level. Raina died a short time ago, killed by the enemy. Rika searched Berdine's eyes. I'm sorry, Berdine. Berdine nodded. Lord Rall wept for her, as he did for Halley. Silence echoed around the entryway as all the other moored Sith stared at Berdine in disbelief. This man is going to be trouble, Rika muttered. Berdine smiled. I think he would say a similar thing of you. Kalin growled at the insistent knock. It appeared that ignoring it would not make it go away. She kissed Richard and wrapped a blanket around herself. Don't move, Lord Rahl. I'll get rid of them. Barefoot, she crossed the dim, windowless room. She squinted at the sudden light when she opened the door. Zed, what is it? He was eating a piece of tava bread. He had a platter of it in his other hand. He offered her the tray. I thought you might be hungry. Yes, thank you, very thoughtful. He took a bite of tava bread as his gaze roamed over her hair. He pointed at it with the rolled up tava bread. You will never get those tangles out, dear one. Thank you for your fashion advice. She started to close the door. He put his hand against it. The elders are becoming concerned. They would like to know when they can have their spirit house back. Tell them that when I'm done with it, I'll let them know. Kara, scowling her best moored Sith scowl, stepped up behind him. I will see that he does not bother you again, Mother Confessor. Thank you, Kara. Kalin shut the door in his smiling face. She hurried across the floor back to Richard. She set the platter aside, laid down, and enfolded Richard in her blanket. A pesky in-law, she explained. I heard. Tava bread and tangled hair. Now, where were we? He kissed her, and she remembered. He was showing her some magic. End of Temple of the Winds, The Sword of Truth, Book 4, by Terry Goodkind. Read by Nick Sullivan.